Macmillan Audio presents A Flicker in the Dark by Stacey Willingham. Read for you by Carissa Vacker. Whoever fights monsters should see to it that, in the process, he does not become a monster. If you gaze long enough into an abyss, the abyss will gaze back into you. Friedrich Nietzsche Prologue I thought I knew what monsters were. As a little girl, I used to think of them as mysterious shadows lurking behind my hanging clothes, under my bed, in the woods. They were a presence I could physically feel behind me, moving in closer as I walked home from school in the glare of the setting sun. I didn't know how to describe the feeling, but I just knew they were there somehow. My body could sense them, sense danger, the way your skin seems to prickle just before a hand is placed on an unsuspecting shoulder. The moment you realize that unshakable feeling you had was a set of eyes burrowing into the back of your skull, lurking behind the branches of an overgrown shrub. But then you turn around and the eyes are gone. I remember the feeling of uneven ground twisting my skinny ankles as I walked faster and faster down the gravel roadway that led to my house, fumes from the retreating school bus billowing behind me. The shadows in the woods danced as the sun streamed through the tree branches, my own silhouette looming large like an animal prepared to pounce. I would take deep breaths, count to ten, close my eyes and squeeze my lids. And then, I would run. Every day, I would run down that stretch of isolated roadway, my house in the distance seeming to move farther and farther away instead of closer within my reach. My sneakers would kick up clumps of grass and pebbles and dust as I raced against something. Whatever was in there, watching waiting, waiting for me. I would trip on my shoelaces, scramble up my front steps, and slam into the warmth of my father's outstretched arms, his breath hot in my ear, whispering, I've got you, I've got you. His fingers would grab fistfuls of my hair, and my lungs would sting from the influx of air. My heart would crash hard against my chest as a single word formed in my mind. Safety. Or so I thought. Learning to fear should be a slow evolution, a gradual progression from the Santa Claus at a local strip mall to the boogeyman under the bed, from the R-rated movie A Babysitter Let You Watch to the man idling in a car behind tinted windows, staring at you for just a second too long as you make your way down the sidewalk at dusk, watching him inch closer in your peripheral vision, feeling your heartbeat rise from your chest to your neck to the backs of your eyes. It's a learning process, an ongoing progression from one perceived threat to the next, each subsequent thing more realistically dangerous than the last. Not for me, though. For me, the concept of fear came crashing down with a force my adolescent body had never experienced, a force so suffocating it hurt to breathe. And in that moment, the moment of the crash, it made me realize that monsters don't hide in the woods. They aren't shadows in the trees or invisible things lurking in darkened corners. No, the real monsters move in plain sight. I was 12 years old when those shadows started to form a shape, a face. Started to become less of an apparition and more concrete, more real. When I began to realize that maybe the monsters lived among us. And there was one monster in particular I learned to fear above all the rest. May 2019 Chapter 1 My throat tickles. It's subtle at first. The tip of a feather being trailed along the inside of my esophagus, top to bottom, I push my tongue back into my throat and attempt to scratch. It doesn't work. 
I hope I'm not getting sick. Have I been around a sick person lately? Someone with a cold? There's no way to be sure, really. I'm around people all day. None of them looked sick, but the common cold can be contagious before ever showing any symptoms. I try to scratch again. Or maybe it's allergies. Ragweed is higher than normal. Severe, actually. An 8 out of 10 on the allergy tracker. The little pinwheel on my weather app was solid red. I reach for my glass of water, take a sip, swish it around a bit before swallowing. It still doesn't work. I clear my throat. Yeah? I look up at the patient before me, stiff as a wooden plank strapped to my oversized leather recliner. Her fingers are clenched in her lap, thin, shiny slits barely visible against the otherwise perfect skin of her hands. I notice a bracelet on her wrist and attempt to cover the nastiest scar, a deep, jagged purple. Wooden beads with a silver charm in the shape of a cross, dangling like a rosary. I look back at the girl, taking in her expression, her eyes. No tears, but it's still early. I'm sorry, I say, glancing down at the notes before me. Lacey, I just have a little tickle in my throat. Please, continue. Oh, she says. Okay, well, anyway, like I was saying, I just get so mad sometimes, you know? And I really don't know why. It's like this anger just builds and builds, and then before I know it, I need to... She looks down at her arms, fans her hands. There are tiny cuts everywhere, like hairs of glass, hidden in the webby dips of skin between her fingers. It's a release, she says. It helps me calm down. I nod, trying to ignore the itch in my throat. It's getting worse. Maybe it's dust, I tell myself. It is dusty in here. I glance over to the windowsill, the bookshelf, the diplomas framed on my wall, all of them sporting a fine layer of gray glinting in the sunlight. Focus, Chloe. I turn back toward the girl. And why do you think that is, Lacey? I just told you, I don't know. If you had to speculate. She sighs, glances to the side, and stares intently at nothing in particular. She's avoiding eye contact. The tears are coming shortly. I mean, it probably has something to do with my dad, she says, her lower lip trembling slightly. She pushes her blonde hair back from her forehead. With him leaving and everything. When did your dad leave? Two years ago, she says. As if on cue, a single tear erupts from her tear duct and glides down her freckled cheek. She wipes it angrily. He didn't even say goodbye. He didn't even give us a fucking reason why. He just left. I nod, scribbling more notes. Do you think it's fair to say that you're still pretty angry with your dad over him leaving you like that? Her lip trembles again. And since he didn't say goodbye, you weren't able to tell him how his actions made you feel? She nods at the bookshelf in the corner, still avoiding me. Yeah, she says. I guess that's fair. Are you angry with anyone else? My mom, I guess. I don't really know why. I always figured that she drove him away. Okay, I say. Anybody else? She's quiet, her fingernail picking at a chunk of raised skin. Myself? She whispers, not bothering to wipe the puddle of tears pooling in the corners of her eyes. For not being good enough to make him want to stay. It's okay to be angry, I say. We're all angry. And now that you're comfortable verbalizing why you're angry, we can work together to help you manage it a little better. To help you manage it in a way that doesn't hurt you. Does that sound like a plan? It's so fucking stupid, she mutters. What is? Everything. Him. This. Being here. What about being here is stupid, Lacey? I shouldn't have to be here. She's shouting now. I lean back, casually, and lace my fingers together. I let her yell. Yeah, I'm angry, she says. So what? My dad fucking left me. He left me. Do you know what that feels like? Do you know what it feels like being a kid without a dad? 
Going to school and having everyone look at you, talk about you behind your back? I actually do, I say. I do know what that's like. It's not fun. She's quiet now, her hands shaking in her lap, the pads of her thumb and pointer finger rubbing the cross on her bracelet. Up and down, up and down. Did your dad leave you too? Something like that. How old were you? Twelve, I say. She nods. I'm fifteen. My brother was fifteen. So you get it then? This time I nod, smile. Establishing trust, the hardest part. I get it, I say, leaning forward again, closing the distance between us. She turns toward me now, her tear-soaked eyes boring into mine, pleading. I totally get it. Chapter Two My industry thrives on cliches. I know it does. But there's a reason cliches exist. It's because they're true. A 15-year-old girl taking a razor to her skin probably has something to do with feelings of inadequacy, of needing to feel physical pain to drown out the emotional pain burning inside her. An 18-year-old boy with anger management issues definitely has something to do with an unresolved parental dispute, feelings of abandonment, needing to prove himself, needing to seem strong when inside he's breaking. A 20-year-old college junior getting drunk and sleeping with every boy who buys her a $2 vodka tonic, then crying about it in the morning, reeks of low self-esteem, a yearning for attention because she had to fight for it at home. An inner conflict between the person she is and the person she thinks everyone wants her to be. Daddy issues, only child syndrome, a product of divorce. They're cliches, but they're true. And it's okay for me to say that because I'm a cliche too. I glance down at my smartwatch, the recording from today's session blinking on the screen. One hour, one minute, 52 seconds. I tap send to iPhone and watch the little timer fill from gray to green as the file shoots over to my phone, then simultaneously sinks to my laptop. Technology. When I was a girl, I remember each doctor grabbing my file, thumbing through page after page as I sat in some variation of the same weathered recliner, eyeing their file cabinets full of other people's problems. Full of people like me. Somehow it made me feel less lonely, more normal. Those four-drawer metal lockboxes symbolized the possibility of me somehow being able to express my pain one day, verbalize it, scream about it cry about it. Then, when the 60-minute timer ticked down to zero, we could simply flip the folder closed and put it back in the drawer, locking it tight and forgetting about its contents until another day. Five o'clock, closing time. I look at my computer screen, at the forest of icons my patients have been reduced to. Now there is no closing time. They always have a way to find me. Email, social media, at least before I finally gave in and deleted my profiles, tired of sifting through the panicked direct messages of clients in their lowest moments. I am always on, always ready, a 24-hour convenience store with a neon open sign flickering in the darkness, trying its hardest not to die. The recording notification pops up on my screen, and I click on it, labeling the file Lacey Deckler, Session 1, before glancing up from my computer and squinting at the dusty window cell, the dirtiness of this place even more obvious with the glare of the setting sun. I clear my throat again, cough a few times. I lean to the side and grab a wooden knob, yanking the bottom drawer of my desk open and rifling through my own personal in-office pharmacy. I glance down at the pill bottles, ranging from run-of-the-mill ibuprofen to more difficult-to-pronounce prescriptions. Alprazolam, chlordiazepoxide, diazepam. I push them aside and grab a box of emergency, dumping a packet into my water glass and stirring it with my finger. I take a few swigs and start composing an email. Shannon, happy Friday. Just had a great first session with Lacey Deckler. Thanks for the referral. Wanted to check in re-medication. I see you haven't prescribed anything. Based on our session today, I think she could benefit from starting a low dosage of Prozac. 
Thoughts? Concerns? Chloe. I hit send and lean back in my chair, downing the rest of my tangerine-flavored water. The emergency deposit trapped at the bottom of the glass goes down like glue, slow and heavy, coating my teeth and tongue in an orange grit. Within minutes, I get a response. Chloe, you're always welcome. Good with me? Feel free to call it in. P.S. Drink soon? Need to get details on the upcoming big day. Shannon Tack, MD. I pick up my office phone and dial into Lacey's Pharmacy, the same CVS I frequent, convenient, and I'm taken straight to voicemail. I leave a message. Hi, yes, this is Dr. Chloe Davis, C-H-L-O-E-D-A-V-I-S, calling in a prescription for Lacey Deckler, L-A-C-E-Y-D-E-C-K-L-E-R, date of birth January 16th, 2004. I've recommended the patient start on 10 milligrams of Prozac per day, eight weeks supply. No auto refills, please. I pause, tap my fingers on the desk. I'd also like to call in a refill for another patient, Daniel Briggs, D-A-N-I-E-L-B-R-I-G-G-S, date of birth May 2nd, 1982. Xanax, four milligrams daily. Again, this is Dr. Chloe Davis. Phone number 555-212-4524. Thank you so much. I hang up, eyeing the phone, now dead on the receiver. My eyes dart back over to the window, the setting sun turning my mahogany office a shade of orange not too dissimilar to the gluey residue sitting stagnant in the bottom of my glass. I glance at my watch, 7.30, and start to close my laptop, jumping when the phone screeches back to life. I glance at it. The office is closed now, and it's Friday. I continue packing up my things, ignoring the ringing, until I realize it may be the pharmacy with a question about the prescriptions I just called in. I let it ring one more time before I answer. Dr. Davis, I say. Chloe Davis? Dr. Chloe Davis, I correct. Yes, this is she. How can I help you? Man, are you a tough woman to get a hold of. The voice belongs to a man, and it laughs an exasperated kind of laugh, as if I've annoyed it somehow. I'm sorry, are you a patient? I'm not a patient, the voice says. But I've been calling all day. All day. Your receptionist refused to put me through, so I thought I'd try after hours. See if I could be directed straight to your voicemail. I wasn't expecting you to pick up. I frown. Well, this is my office. I don't take personal calls here. Melissa only forwards my patients. I stop, confused as to why I'm explaining myself and the inner workings of my business to a stranger. I harden my voice. Can I ask why you're calling? Who is this? My name is Aaron Jansen, he says. I'm a reporter for the New York Times. My breath catches in my throat. I cough, though it comes out more like a choke. Are you okay? He asks. Yes, fine, I say. I'm getting over a throat thing. I'm sorry, New York Times? I hate myself as soon as the question comes out. I know why this man is calling. To be honest, I had been expecting it. Expecting something. Maybe not the Times, but something. You know, he hesitates. The newspaper? Yeah, I know who you are. I'm writing a story about your father, and I'd love to sit down and talk. Can I buy you a coffee? I'm sorry. I say again, cutting him off. Fuck, why do I keep apologizing? I take a deep breath and try again. I have nothing to say about that. Chloe, he says. Dr. Davis. Dr. Davis, he repeats, sighing. The anniversary is coming up. 20 years, I'm sure you know that. Of course I know that, I snap back. It's been 20 years and nothing has changed. Those girls are still dead and my father is still in prison. Why are you still interested? Aaron is silent on the other end. I've already given him too much, I know. I've already satisfied that sick journalistic urge that feeds on ripping open the wounds of others just before they're about to heal. I've satisfied it just enough for him to taste metallic and thirst for more, a shark gravitating toward blood and water. But you've changed, he says. You and your brother. The public would love to know how you're doing, how you're coping. I roll my eyes. And your father, he continues. 
Maybe he's changed. Have you talked to him? I have nothing to say to my father, I tell him. And I have nothing to say to you. Please don't call here again. I hang up, slamming the phone back into its base harder than I intend to. I look down and notice my fingers are shaking. I tuck my hair behind my ear in an attempt to busy them and glance back at the window. The sky morphing into a deep, inky blue. The sun a bubble on top of the horizon now, ready to burst. Then I turn back to my desk and grab my bag, pushing my chair back as I stand. I glance at my desk lamp, exhaling slowly before clicking it off and taking a shaky step into the dark. Chapter three. There are so many subtle ways we women subconsciously protect ourselves throughout the day. Protect ourselves from shadows, from unseen predators, from cautionary tales and urban legends. So subtle, in fact, that we hardly even realize we're doing them. Leave work before dark. Clutch our purses to our chest with one hand, hold our keys between our fingers in the other, like a weapon, as we shuffle toward our car, strategically parked beneath a streetlight in case we weren't able to leave work before dark. Approach our car, glance in the back seat before unlocking the front. Grip our phone tight, point our finger just to swipe away from 911. Step inside, lock it again. Do not idle, drive away quickly. I turn out of the parking lot adjacent to my office building and away from town. I stop at a red light and glance in my rearview mirror. Habit, I suppose, wincing at the reflection. I look rough. It's muggy outside, so muggy that my skin is slick with grease. My usually limp brown hair has a bit of curl at the tips, a frizziness that only the Louisiana summer can achieve. Louisiana summer. Such a loaded phrase. I grew up here. Well, not here, not in Baton Rouge. In Louisiana, though, a tiny little town called Bro Bridge, the crawfish capital of the world. It's a distinction we're proud of for some reason. The same way Cocker City, Kansas must be proud of their 5,000 pound ball of twine. It brings superficial meaning to an otherwise meaningless place. Bro Bridge also has a population of less than 10,000, which means that everybody knows everybody. And more specifically, everybody knows me. When I was young, I used to live for the summer. The swampy memories are so abundant. Spotting gators in Lake Martin, screaming when I caught a glimpse of their beady eyes lurking beneath a carpet of algae. My brother laughing as we sprinted in the opposite direction, screaming, see you later, alligator. Making wigs out of Spanish moss hanging in our multi-acre backyard, then picking chiggers out of my hair in the days that followed, dabbing clear nail polish on the itchy red welts, twisting the tail off a freshly boiled crawfish and sucking the head dry. But memories of summer also bring memories of fear. I was 12 when the girls started to go missing. Girls not much older than me. It was July of 1999, and it was shaping up to be just another hot, humid Louisiana summer. Until one day, it wasn't. I remember walking into the kitchen one morning, early, rubbing the sleep from my eyes, dragging my mint green blanket across the linoleum floor. I had slept with that blanket ever since I was a baby. Loved the edges raw. I remember twisting the fabric between my fingers, a nervous tick, when I saw my parents huddled in front of the TV, worried, whispering. What's going on? They turned around, their eyes wide at the sight of me, turning it off before I could see the screen. Before they thought I could see the screen. Oh, honey, my father said, walking toward me, holding me tighter than normal. It's nothing, sweetheart. But it wasn't nothing. Even then, I knew it wasn't nothing. The way my father was holding me, the way my mother's lip quivered as she turned toward the window, the same way Lacey's lip quivered this afternoon as she forced herself to process the realization she had known all along. The realization she had been trying to push out, trying to pretend wasn't true. My eyes had caught a glimpse of that bright red headline stamped across the bottom of the screen. It had already been seared into my psyche, 
a collection of words that would forever alter life as I knew it. Local bro bridge girl goes missing. At 12 years old, girl goes missing doesn't have the same sinister implications as it does when you're older. Your mind doesn't automatically flicker to all those horrible places. Kidnapping, rape, murder. I remember thinking, missing where? I thought maybe she had gotten lost. My family's home was situated on more than 10 acres of land. I had gotten lost plenty of times catching toads in the swamp or exploring uncharted patches of woods, scratching my name in the bark of an unmarked tree or constructing forts out of moss-soaked sticks. I had even gotten stuck in a small cave once, the home of some kind of animal, its puckered entrance somehow both frightening and enticing at the exact same time. I remember my brother tying a piece of old rope to my ankle as I lay flat on my belly, wriggling myself into the cold, dark void, holding a flashlight keychain tight between my lips, letting the darkness swallow me whole as I crawled deeper and deeper, and finally, the sheer terror that ensued once I realized that I couldn't pull myself back out. So when I saw clips of the search party scouring through overgrown foliage and wading through bogs, I couldn't help but wonder what would happen if I ever went missing myself, if people would come for me the same way they were coming for her. She'll turn up, I thought, and when she does, I bet she'll feel silly for causing such a fuss. But she didn't turn up, and three weeks later, another girl went missing. Four weeks after that, another by the end of the summer, six girls had disappeared. One day they were there, and the next, gone, vanished without a trace. Now, six missing girls will always be six too many, but in a town like Bro Bridge, a town so tiny that there's a noticeable gap in a classroom when one child drops out, or a quietness to a neighborhood when a single family moves away— Six girls was a weight almost too heavy to bear. Their goneness was impossible to ignore. It was an evil that had settled over the sky the way an impending storm can make your bones throb. You could feel it, taste it, see it in the eyes of every person you met. An inherent distrust had captivated a town that was once so trusting. A suspicion had taken hold that was impossible to shake. One single, unspoken question lingered among us all. Who's next? Curfews were put into place. Stores and restaurants closed at dusk. I, like every other girl in town, was forbidden to be outside after dark. Even in the daytime, I felt the evil lurking just behind every corner. The anticipation that it would be me, that I would be next, was always there, always present, always suffocating. You'll be fine, Chloe. You don't have anything to worry about. I remember my brother hoisting on his backpack one morning before summer camp. I was crying, again, too afraid to leave the house. She does have something to worry about, Cooper. This is serious. She's too young, he said. She's only 12. He likes teenagers, remember? Cooper, please. My mother crouched down to the floor, positioned herself at eye level, tucked a strand of hair behind my ear. This is serious, honey, but just be careful. Be vigilant. Don't get into a car with strangers, Cooper said, sighing. Don't walk down dark alleys alone. It's all pretty obvious, Chloe. Just don't be stupid. Those girls weren't stupid, my mother snapped, her voice quiet but sharp. They were unlucky, in the wrong place at the wrong time. I turn into the CVS parking lot now and pull through the pharmacy drive through There's a man standing behind the sliding glass window, busying himself with stapling various bottles into paper bags. He slides the window open and doesn't bother to look up. Name? Daniel Briggs. He glances at me, clearly not a Daniel. He taps a few keys on the computer before him and speaks again. Date of birth? May 2nd, 1982. He turns around, shuffles through the bee basket. I watch him grab a paper bag and walk toward me again, my hands gripped tightly on the wheel to stop them from fidgeting. He aims his scanner at the barcode, and I hear a beep. Do you have any questions about the prescription? Nope, 
I say, smiling. All good. He pushes the bag through his window and into mine. I snatch it, push it deep into my purse, and roll the window up again, pulling away without so much as a goodbye. I drive for a few more minutes, my purse on the passenger seat radiating from the mere presence of the pills inside. It used to baffle me how easy it was to pick up prescriptions for other people. As long as you know the birthday that matches the name on file, most pharmacists never even ask for a driver's license. And if they do, simple explanations usually work. Oh, shoot, it's in my other purse. I'm actually his fiance. Do you need me to provide the address on file? I turn into my garden district neighborhood and start the journey down a mile-long stretch of road that always leaves me disoriented, the way I imagine scuba divers feel when they find themselves completely enveloped in darkness, a darkness so dark even their own hand placed inches from their face would get lost. All sense of direction, gone. All sense of control, gone. Without any houses to illuminate the roadway or floodlights to reveal the twisting arms of the trees that line the street, when the sun goes down, this road gives the illusion of driving straight into a pool of ink, disappearing into a vast nothingness, falling endlessly into a bottomless hole. I hold my breath, push my foot down on the gas just a little bit harder. Finally, I can sense my turn approaching. I flick on my blinker, even though there's nobody behind me, just more black, and veer right into our cul-de-sac, releasing my breath when I pass the first streetlight revealing the road toward home. Home. That, too, is a loaded phrase. A home isn't just a house, a collection of bricks and boards held together by concrete and nails. It's more emotional than that. A home is safety, security, the place you go back to when the curfew clock strikes nine. But what if your home isn't safe, isn't secure? What if the outstretched arms you collapse into on your porch steps are the same arms you should be running from? The same arms that grabbed those girls, squeezed their necks, and buried their bodies before washing their own hands clean? What if your home is where it all started, the epicenter of the earthquake that shook your town to the core? The eye of the hurricane that ripped apart families, lives, you, everything you had ever known. What then? Chapter 4 My car idles in the driveway as I dig into my purse and fish out the pharmacy bag. I rip it open and pull the orange bottle from inside, twisting the cap and dumping a pill into my palm before crumpling the bag in a ball and shoving it and the bottle into my glove compartment. I look at the Xanax in my hand, inspecting the little white tablet. I think back to that phone call in my office. Aaron Jansen, 20 years. My chest constricts at the memory and I pop the pill into my mouth before I can think twice, swallowing it dry. I exhale, close my eyes. Already, I feel the grip in my chest loosening, my airways opening wide. A calmness settles over me, the same sense of calm that follows every time my tongue touches a pill. I don't really know how to describe it, this feeling, other than pure and simple relief. The same relief you would feel after flinging open your closet door to find nothing but clothes hiding inside, the slowing of the heart rate, the euphoric sense of giddiness that creeps into the brain when you realize that you're safe, that nothing's going to lunge at you from the shadows. I open my eyes. There's a hint of spice in the air as I step out of my car and slam the door, clicking the lock button twice on my key fob. I turn my nose toward the sky and sniff, trying to place the scent. Seafood, maybe. Something fishy. Maybe the neighbors are having a barbecue, and for a second, I'm offended that I'm not invited. I start the long walk up the cobblestones toward my front door, the darkness of the house looming before me. I make it halfway up the walkway before I stop and stare. Back when I bought this house, years ago, it was just that, a house. A shell of a thing, ready to have life blown into it like a saggy balloon. It was a house prepared to become a home, all eager and excited like a kid on the first day of school. But I had no idea how to make a home. 
The only home I had ever known could hardly be called a home at all. Not anymore, at least. Not in hindsight. I remember walking through the front door for the first time, keys in hand, my heels on the hard wood echoing through the vast emptiness, the bare white walls littered with nail marks from where pictures once hung, proof that it was possible, that memories could be formed here, a life could be made. I opened up my little toolkit, a tiny red craftsman that Cooper had bought, walking me around Home Depot as I held the lips open while he dropped wrenches and hammers and pliers inside, like he was filling up a bag of sweet and sour gummies at the local candy store. I didn't have anything to hang, no pictures, no decorations. So I hammered a single nail into the wall and hung the metal ring that held my house key. A single key and nothing more. It felt like progress. Now I look at all the things that I've done to it since to make it appear like I have my shit together from the outside. The superficial equivalent of slathering makeup over a marbling bruise or fastening a rosary on top of a scarred wrist. Why I care so much about the acceptance of my neighbors as they slink past my yard, leashes in hand, I don't really know. There's the swinging bench bolted to the porch ceiling, the always-present layer of buttery yellow pollen making it impossible to pretend that anybody ever actually sits there. The landscaping I had eagerly purchased and planted and then subsequently ignored to death. The skinny brown tendrils of my twin hanging ferns resembling the regurgitated bones of a small animal I once found while dissecting an owl in eighth grade biology. The scratchy brown welcome mat that says, Welcome. The bronze mailbox shaped like an oversized envelope bolted to the siding, maddeningly impractical, the slit too tiny to fit an entire hand, let alone more than a couple of postcards mailed to me by former classmates turned realtors after the promise of their degrees turned out to be not so promising. I start walking again, deciding in this moment that I'm going to throw away the stupid envelope and just use a regular mailbox like everybody else. It is also in this moment when I realize that my house looks dead. It's the only one on the block without lights illuminating the windows, the flicker of a television behind closed blinds, the only one without any evidence of life inside. I walk closer, the Xanax cloaking my mind into a forced calm. But still, something is nagging at me. Something is wrong. Something is different. I look around my yard, small but well-kept, a mown lawn and shrubs push against a raw wood fence, an oak tree's mangled limbs casting shadows against a garage I've never once pulled my car into. I glance up at the house, now mere feet before me. I think I catch a glimpse of movement behind a curtain from inside, but I shake my head, force myself to keep walking. Don't be ridiculous, Chloe, be real. My key is in the front door, already twisting, when I realize what's wrong, what's different. The porch light is off. The porch light I always, always leave on, even when I'm sleeping, ignoring the beam of light it casts straight across my pillow through the gap in the blinds, is turned off. I never turn the porch light off. I don't think I've ever even touched the switch. That's why the house looks so lifeless, I realize. I've never seen it so dark before, so completely devoid of light. Even with the street lamps, it is dark out here. Someone could come up behind me and I'd never even- Surprise! I let out a scream and plunge my arm into my purse, searching for my pepper spray. The lights from inside flick on and I'm staring at a crowd of people in my living room. Thirty, maybe forty, all staring back, smiling. My heart is slamming inside my chest now. I can barely speak. Oh, my, I stutter, look around. I'm searching for a reason, an explanation, but I can't find one. Oh my God, I'm instantly aware of my hand in my purse, clutching the pepper spray with a strength that startles me. A wave of relief washes over me as I release it, wiping the sweat on my palm against the interior fabric. What, what is this? What does it look like? A voice erupts to my left. I turn to the side and watch the crowd part as a man steps into the opening. It's a party. It's Daniel, dressed in dark wash jeans and a snug blue blazer. 
He's beaming at me, his teeth a blinding white against his tanned skin, his sandy hair pushed to the side. I feel my heart start to slow again. My hand moves from my chest to my cheek, and I can feel it growing hot. I crack an embarrassed smile as he pushes a glass of wine toward me. I take it with my free hand. A party for us, he says, squeezing me tight. I can smell his body wash, his spiced deodorant. An engagement party. Daniel, what, what are you doing here? Well, I live here. A wave of laughter erupts in the crowd, and Daniel squeezes my shoulder, smiling. You're supposed to be out of town, I say. I thought you weren't getting back until tomorrow. Yeah, about that. I lied, he says, eliciting more laughs. Are you surprised? I scan the sea of people fidgeting in their places. They're still looking at me, expectant. I wonder how loudly I screamed. Didn't I sound surprised? I throw my hands up and the crowd breaks into a laugh. Someone in the back starts to cheer and the rest follow, whistling and clapping as Daniel pulls me fully into his arms and kisses me on the mouth. Get a room, someone yells, and the crowd laughs again, this time dispersing into various parts of the house, refilling their drinks and mingling with the other guests, scooping heaps of food onto paper plates. The smell from outside finally registers. It's Old Bay. I glimpse a table of crawfish boil steaming on the picnic table on our back porch, and am instantly embarrassed about feeling left out from the fictional party I had invented next door. Daniel looks at me, grinning, holding back a laugh. I hit him on the shoulder. I hate you, I say, though I'm smiling back. You scared the shit out of me. He laughs now, that big, booming laugh that drew me in 12 months ago, still proving to hold a trance over me. I pull him back in and kiss him again, properly this time, without the watching eyes of all of our friends. I feel the warmth of his tongue in my mouth, savoring the way his presence physically calms my body down, slows my heart rate, my breathing, the same way the Xanax does. You didn't give me much choice, he says, sipping his wine. I had to do it this way. Oh, you did? I ask. And why is that? Because you refused to plan anything for yourself, he says. No bachelorette party, no bridal shower. I'm not in college, Daniel. I'm 32. Doesn't that seem a little juvenile? He looks at me, cocking his eyebrow. No, it doesn't seem juvenile. It seems fun. Well, you know, I don't really have anyone to help me plan that kind of stuff, I say, staring into my wine, swirling it against the glass. You know Cooper's not going to plan a shower, and my mom... I know, Chloe. I'm teasing. You deserve a party, so I threw a party. Simple as that. My chest surges with warmth, and I squeeze his hand. Thank you, I say. This is really something else. I almost had a heart attack. He laughs again, downing the rest of his wine. But it means a lot. I love you. I love you, too. Now, go mingle and drink your wine, he says, using his finger to tip the base of my untouched glass. Relax a little. I lift the glass to my lips and down it too, pushing myself into the crowd in the living room. Someone grabs my drink and offers to refill it, while another person shoves a plate of cheese and crackers in my direction. You must be starving. Do you always work so late? Of course she does. She's Chloe. Is Chardonnay okay, Chloe? I think you were drinking Pinot before, but really, what's the difference? Minutes pass, or maybe hours. Every time I wander into a new section of the house, someone else walks up with a congratulations and a fresh glass, a different combination of the same questions flowing faster than the bottles piling up in the corner. So, does this count as drink soon? I turn around and see Shannon standing behind me, smiling wide. She laughs and pulls me in for a hug, planting a kiss on my cheek the way she always does, her lips sticking to my skin. I think back to the email she sent me this afternoon. P.S. Drink soon? Need to get the details on the upcoming big day. You little liar, I say, trying to keep myself from wiping the lipstick residue I feel lingering on my cheek. Guilty, she says, smiling. I had to make sure you didn't suspect anything. Well, mission accomplished. How's the family?
They're good, Shannon says, twirling the ring on her finger. Bill is in the kitchen getting a refill, and Riley... She scans the room, her eyes flickering past the sea of bodies bobbing together like waves. She seems to find who she's looking for and smiles, shakes her head. Riley is in the corner, on her phone, shocking. I turn around and see a teenaged girl slumped in a chair, tapping furiously at her iPhone. She's wearing a short red sundress and white sneakers, her hair a mousy brown. She looks incredibly bored, and I can't help but laugh. Well, she is 15, Daniel says. I glance to my side, and Daniel is standing there, smiling. He slides up to me and snakes his arm around my waist, kissing my forehead. I've always marveled at the way he glides into every conversation with such ease, dropping a perfectly placed line as if he'd been standing there all along. Tell me about it, Shannon says. She's grounded at the moment, hence the reason we dragged her along. She's not too happy with us, forcing her to hang out with a bunch of old people. I smile, my eyes still glued to the girl, to the way she twirls her hair absentmindedly around her finger, the way she chews on the side of her lip as she analyzes whatever text just appeared on her phone. What's she grounded for? Sneaking out, Shannon says, rolling her eyes. We found her climbing out of her bedroom window at midnight, she did the whole rope made out of bed sheets thing, like you see in the freaking movies. Lucky she didn't break her neck. I laugh again, clasping my hand to my open mouth. I swear, when Bill and I were dating and he told me he had a 10-year-old girl, I didn't think much of it, Shannon says, her voice low, staring at her stepdaughter. Honestly, I thought I lucked out. A kid on demand, skipping right through the whole dirty diaper, screaming at all hours of the night part. She was such a sweetheart. But it is amazing how the second they become teenagers, it all changes. They turn into monsters. It won't be like this for long, Daniel says, smiling. One day they'll just be distant memories. God, I hope, Shannon laughs, taking another swig of her wine. He really is an angel, you know. She's speaking to me now, but she motions to Daniel, tapping him on the chest. Planning this whole thing? You wouldn't believe the time it took him to get everyone together in one place. Yeah, I know, I say. I don't deserve him. Good thing you didn't quit a week earlier, huh? She nudges me and I smile, the memory of our first meeting as sharp as ever. It was one of those chance encounters that could have easily meant nothing. Bumping into an exposed shoulder on the bus, muttering a simple excuse me before parting ways, borrowing a pen from the man at the bar when yours runs dry, or running a wallet left in the bottom of the shopping cart to the car outside before it drives away. Most of the time, these meetings lead to nothing more than a smile, a thank you. But sometimes they lead to something, or maybe even everything. Daniel and I had met at Baton Rouge General Hospital. He was walking in, I was walking out. More like staggering out, really, the weight of the contents of my office threatening to tear through the bottom of a cardboard box. I would have walked right past him, the box obscuring my vision, my eyes downcast as I followed my own footsteps to the front door. I would have walked right past him had I not heard his voice. Do you need a hand? No, no, I said, shifting the weight from one arm to the other, not even bothering to stop. The automatic door was a yard away, less. My car was idling outside. I got it. Here, let me help you. I heard footsteps running behind me, felt the weight lifted slightly as his arm snaked between mine. Good God, he grunted. What do you have in here? Books, mostly. I pushed a strand of sweaty hair from my forehead as he lifted the box from my grip. And that was the first glimpse I got of his face. Blonde hair and lashes to match, teeth that were the product of expensive adolescent orthodontia, and maybe a bleaching treatment or two. I could see his biceps bulging through his light blue button-up as he hoisted my life into the air and balanced it on his shoulder. You get fired? My neck snapped in his direction. I opened my mouth, ready to set him straight, until he glanced my way and I saw his expression. His tender eyes, the way they seemed to soften as he took in my face, scanning his way from top to bottom. He stared at me as though he were staring at an old friend, his pupils flickering over my skin, searching for a trace of familiarity in my features. 
his lips curled into a knowing grin. I'm just kidding, he said, turning his attention back to the box. You look too happy to have been fired. Besides, wouldn't there be some guards escorting you out by the armpits before throwing you down on the pavement? Isn't that how it works? I smiled, let out a laugh. We were in the parking lot then, and he placed the box on the roof of my car before crossing his arms and turning toward me. I quit, I said, the words settling over me with a finality that, for a second, almost made me burst into tears. Baton Rouge General had been my first job, my only job. My coworker, Shannon, had become my closest friend. Today was my last day. Well, congratulations, he said. Where to next? I'm starting my own practice. I'm a medical psychologist. He whistled, poking his head into the box on my car. Something caught his eye and he twisted his head distractedly, leaning in to pick up one of the books. Got a thing for murder? He asked, inspecting the cover. My chest constricted as my eyes darted to the box. I remembered, in that moment, that situated next to all of my psychology textbooks were piles of true crime titles. The Devil in the White City, In Cold Blood, The Monster of Florence. But unlike most people, I didn't read them for entertainment. I read them for study. I read them to try to understand, to dissect all the different people who take lives for a living, devouring their stories on the page almost as if they were my patients, leaning back in that leather recliner, whispering their secrets into my ear. I guess you could say that. No judgment, he added, twisting the book in his hands around so I could see the cover, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, before flipping it open and starting to thumb the pages. I love this book. I smiled politely, unsure of how to respond. I really should be going, I said instead, motioning to my car and offering my hand. Thanks for your help. The pleasure was mine, Dr. Davis, I said. Chloe Davis. Well, Dr. Chloe Davis, if you ever need to move any more boxes. He dug into his back pocket, fishing out his wallet before pulling out a business card and pushing it into the open pages. He flipped the book closed and thrust it in my direction. You know where to find me. He smiled at me, winking in my direction before turning around and walking back into the building. When the automatic doors closed behind him, I looked down at the book in my hands, running my fingers against the glossy cover. There was a tiny gap in the pages where his business card lay wedged, and I stuck my nail into the crack, flipping it back open. I looked down, feeling a foreign twist in my chest as my eyes scanned his name. Somehow, I knew that wasn't the last time I would be seeing Daniel Briggs. Chapter 5 I excuse myself from Shannon and Daniel and slip outside through the sliding door. My mind is spinning by the time I make it to the back porch, my hand clutching my fourth variety of alcoholic beverage. The endless small talk is buzzing in my ears, the bottle of wine I've polished off buzzing in my brain. It's still muggy outside, but the breeze is refreshing. The house was getting stuffy with the drunken body heat of 40 people bouncing off the walls. I wander toward the picnic table, the heap of crawfish, corn, sausage, and potatoes somehow still steaming on the newspaper. I put down my wine glass, grab a crawfish, and twist it, letting the juice from the head drip down my wrist. Then I hear movement behind me, footsteps, and a voice. Don't worry, it's just me. I swing around, my eyes adjusting in the dark to the body before me, the cherry red tip of a cigarette glowing between his fingers. I know you don't like to be surprised. Coop! I drop the crawfish on the table and walk toward my brother, wrapping my arms around his neck and inhaling his familiar scent, nicotine and spearmint gum. I'm so shocked to see him, I let the jab about the surprise party slide. Hey, sis. I pull back, inspecting his face. He looks older than he did the last time I saw him, but that's normal for Cooper. He seems to age years within months, his hair turning grayer at the temples, the worry lines in his forehead creasing deeper by the day. But still, Coop is one of those guys who seems to get more attractive with age. In college, my roommate had referred to him as a silver fox once when his neck started to grow patchy with salt and pepper stubble. 
For some reason, that stuck with me. It was a pretty accurate description, really. He looks mature, sleek, thoughtful, quiet. Like he's seen more of the world in 35 years than most people have seen in their lives. I let go of his neck. I didn't see you in there, I say, louder than I intended. You got mobbed, he answers, laughing, taking a final drag before dropping his cigarette to the ground and stubbing it out with his foot. How does it feel to have 40 people swarm you all at once? I shrug. Practice for the wedding, I guess. His smile wavers a bit, but he recovers quickly. We both ignore it. Where's Laurel, I ask. He shoves his hands in his pockets and glances behind my shoulder, his eyes growing distant. I already know what's coming next. She's not in the picture anymore. I'm sorry to hear that, I say. I liked her. She seemed nice. Yeah, he says, nodding. She was. I liked her too. We're quiet for a while, listening to the murmur of voices inside. We both understand the complexities of forming relationships after going through what we've been through. We understand that more often than not, they just don't work out. So are you excited? He asks, jerking his head in the direction of the house. For the wedding and stuff? I laugh. And stuff? You've got such a way with words, Scoop. You know what I mean. Yeah, I know what you mean, I say. And yes, I'm excited. You should give him a chance. Cooper looks at me, his eyes narrowing. I sway a little. What are you talking about? He asks. Daniel, I say. I know you don't like him. What makes you say that? Now my eyes are the ones that narrow. Are we really going to do this again? I like him, he says, holding up his hands in surrender. Remind me what he does again. Farm sales. Farm sales, he scoffs. Really? Doesn't strike me as that kind of guy. Pharmaceuticals, I say, with a PH. Cooper laughs, digs the pack of cigarettes out of his pocket, and pops another one between his lips. He offers me the pack, and I shake my head. That makes more sense, he says. Those shoes are a little too shiny to be spending much time around farmers. Come on, Coop, I say, crossing my arms. This is what I'm talking about. I just think it's fast, he says, flicking open his lighter. He lifts the flame to the cigarette and inhales. You've known each other for, what, a couple months? A year, I say. We've been together for a year. You've known each other for a year. And? And how can you really know someone that well in a year? Have you even met his family? Well, no, I admit. They're not close, but come on, Coop. Are you really going to judge him by his family? You, of all people, should know better than that. Families suck. Cooper shrugs, takes another drag instead of answering. His hypocrisy is pissing me off. My brother has always had this nonchalant way of getting under my skin, burrowing deep like a scarab and eating me alive. Even worse, he acts like he's not even trying, like he doesn't even realize how cutting his words are, how badly they hurt. I have the sudden urge to hurt him back. Look, I'm sorry things didn't work out with Laurel or with anyone, for that matter, but that doesn't give you the right to be jealous, I say. If you'd just allow yourself to open up to people instead of being a dick all the time, you'd be surprised at what you can learn. Cooper is quiet, and I know I've gone too far. It's the wine, I think. It's making me unusually forward, unusually mean. He sucks on his cigarette hard and exhales. I sigh. I didn't mean it like that. No, you're right, he says, walking toward the edge of the porch. He leans against the railing and crosses one leg in front of the other. I can admit that. But the guy just threw you a surprise party, Chloe. You're afraid of the dark. Shit, you're afraid of everything. I tap my fingers against my wine glass. He turned off all the lights in your house and asked 40 people to scream when you walked in. He scared the living piss out of you. I saw your hand fly into your purse. I know what you were going for. I'm quiet, embarrassed that he picked up on that. If he actually knew how fucking paranoid you are, do you really think he would have done that? 
He meant well, I say. You know he did. I'm sure he did, but that's not the point. He doesn't know you, Chloe, and you don't know him. Yes, he does, I snap. He knows me, Cooper. He just won't let me be afraid of my own shadow all the time, and I'm grateful for that. That's healthy. He sighs, sucks down the rest of his cigarette, and flicks it over the railing. All I'm saying is we're different from them, Chloe. You and I are different. We've been through some shit. He gestures back to the house, and I turn around, eyeing all the people inside. All the friends that have turned into family, laughing and mingling without a care in the world. And suddenly, instead of feeling the love that I had felt just minutes before, I feel a hollowness inside. Because Cooper is right. We are different. Does he know? He asks gently, quietly. I turn around, glaring at him in the dark. I chew on the side of my cheek instead of answering. Chloe? Yes, I say at last. Yes, of course he knows, Cooper. Of course I told him. What have you told him? Everything, okay? He knows everything. I watch his eyes flicker back to the house, to the muffled sounds of the party going on without us, and I'm quiet again, the inside of my cheek raw from grinding between my teeth. I think I can taste blood. What is it with you two? I ask at last, the energy drained from my voice. What happened? Nothing happened, he says. It's just, I don't know. With you being who you are and all in our family, I just hope he's around for the right reasons. That's all I'm gonna say. The right reasons? I snap more loudly than I should. What the fuck does that mean? Chloe, calm down. No! I say, no, I won't, because what you're telling me right now is that it can't be possible for him to actually love me, Cooper, for him to have actually fallen for someone as fucked up as me, as damaged Chloe. Oh, come on, he says. Stop being dramatic. I'm not being dramatic, I snap. I'm just asking you to stop being selfish for once. I'm asking you to give him a chance. Chloe, I want you in this wedding, I interrupt. Really, I do but it's happening with or without you, Cooper. If you're going to make me choose, I hear the door glide open behind me and I swing around, my eyes landing on Daniel. He's smiling at me, though I can see his eyes darting back and forth between Cooper and me, an unspoken question lingering on his lips. I wonder how long he's been standing there, just behind the sliding glass door. I wonder what he's heard. Everything okay? He asks, walking over to us. He winds his arm around my waist, and I feel him pull me closer to him, away from Cooper. Yes, I say, trying to will myself to calm down. Yes, everything's fine. Cooper, Daniel says, extending his free hand. Good to see you, man. Cooper smiles, giving my fiancé a firm handshake in response. I haven't had a chance to thank you, by the way, for all your help. I look at Daniel, and I feel my forehead scrunch. Help with what? I ask. Help with this, Daniel smiles. The party, he didn't tell you? I look back at my brother, my white hot words to him flashing across my mind. I feel my heart sink. No, I say, still looking at Cooper. He didn't tell me. Oh yeah, Daniel says. This guy's a lifesaver. Couldn't have pulled it off without him. It was nothing, Cooper says, looking at his feet. Happy to help. No, it wasn't nothing, Daniel says. He got here early, steamed all the crawfish. He was toiling over that thing for hours, seasoning them just right. Why didn't you say anything, I ask. Cooper shrugs, embarrassed. It wasn't a big deal. Anyway, we should get back in there, Daniel says, pulling me toward the door. There are a few people here that I'd like Chloe to meet. Five minutes, I say, planting my feet beneath me. I can't leave my brother on these terms, and I can't apologize in front of Daniel without revealing the conversation we were having just before he walked outside. I'll meet you in there. Daniel looks at me, then back at Cooper. It seems like he's going to object for a minute, his lips parting gently, but instead he just smiles again, squeezing my shoulder. Sounds good, he says, giving my brother one last salute. Five minutes. The door slides shut, and I wait until Daniel is out of sight before turning back around, facing my brother. 
Cooper, I say at last, my shoulders sinking. I'm sorry. I didn't know. It's fine, he says. Honestly. No, it's not fine, I say. You should have said something. Here I am being such a bitch, calling you selfish. It's fine, he says again, pushing himself up from the railing and walking toward me, closing the distance between us, enveloping me in a hug. I'd do anything for you, Chloe. You know that. You're my baby sister. I sigh and snake my arms around him, too, letting my guilt and my anger melt away. This is our dance, Cooper's and mine. We disagree, we shout, we argue. We don't speak to each other for months on end, but when we finally do, it's like we're kids again, running through the sprinklers barefoot in the backyard, building forts out of moving boxes in the basement, talking for hours on end without even noticing the people around us evaporating into thin air. Sometimes I think I blame Cooper for making me remember myself, who I am, who our parents are. His mere existence is a reminder that the image I project out into the world isn't actually real, but carefully crafted. That I'm one small stumble away from shattering into a million pieces, revealing who I really am. It's a complicated relationship, but we're family. We're the only family we've got. I love you, I say, squeezing harder. I can tell you're trying. I am trying, Cooper says. I'm just protective. I know. I want the best for you. I know. I guess I'm just used to being the man in your life, you know. The one that looks after you. And now that's going to be someone else. It's hard to let go. I smile, squeezing my eyes shut before a tear can escape. Oh, so you do have a heart. Come on, Chloe, he whispers. I'm being serious. I know, I say again. I know you are. I'll be okay. We stand there for a while in silence, hugging. The party that came to see me seemingly oblivious to the fact that I have vanished for God knows how long. Holding my brother in my arms, I think back again to the phone call I received earlier. Aaron Jansen, the New York Times. But you've changed, the reporter had said. You and your brother. The public would love to know how you're doing. How you're coping. Hey, Coop, I ask, lifting my head. Can I ask you something? Sure. Did you get a phone call today? He looks at me, confused. What kind of phone call? I hesitate. Chloe, he says, sensing me backing away. He grips my arms harder. What kind of phone call? I start to open my mouth before he interrupts me. Oh, you know what? I did he says, from mom's place. They left me a message and I completely forgot. Did they call you too? I exhale, nodding quickly. Yeah, I lie. I missed it too. We're due for a visit, he says. It's my turn. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have put it off. It's fine, I say. Really, I can go if you're too busy. No, he says, shaking his head. No, you've got enough going on. I'll go this weekend, I promise. Are you sure that's all? My mind flashes back to Aaron Jansen, to our conversation on my office line. Not that you could really call what we had a conversation. Twenty years. It seems like something I should tell my brother. That the New York Times is snooping around in our past. That this Aaron Jansen guy is writing a story about dad. About us. But then I realize, if Aaron had Cooper's information, he would have called him by now. He said so himself. He'd been trying to reach me all day. If he couldn't reach me, wouldn't he have tried to move on to my brother? To the other Davis kid? If he hasn't called Coop yet, that means he hasn't been able to dig up his number, his address, his anything. Yeah, I say. That's all. I decide not to burden him with this. At best, the news of a Times reporter calling me at work to get dirt on our family will piss him off enough to chain smoke the rest of the pack of cigarettes stuffed in his back pocket. At worst, he'd call him up himself and tell him to fuck off. And then Jansen would have his number and we'd both be screwed. Well, hey, your groom is waiting, Cooper says, patting me twice on the back. 
He sidesteps me and starts walking down the porch stairs toward the backyard. You should get back inside. You're not gonna come in? I ask, although I already know the answer. That's enough socializing for me for one night, he says. See you later, alligator. I smile, picking up my wine glass again and raising it to my chin. It never gets old hearing that childhood phrase escape the lips of my nearly middle-aged brother. Jarring, almost, hearing the words in his adolescent voice, taking me back to decades ago when life was simple and fun and free. But at the same time, it fits, because our world stopped spinning 20 years ago. We were left stranded in time, forever young, just like those girls. I down the rest of my wine and wave in his direction. The darkness has enveloped him now, but I know he's still there, waiting. In a while, crocodile, I whisper, staring into the shadows. The silence is broken then by the crunching of leaves beneath his feet, and within seconds, I know he's gone. June 2019 Chapter 6 My eyes snap open. My head is pounding, a rhythmic beating like a tribal drum making the room vibrate. I roll over in bed and glance at my alarm clock. 10.45. How the hell did I sleep this late? I sit up in bed and rub my temples, squinting at the brightness of our bedroom. When I had moved in here, back when it was my bedroom, not our bedroom, a house, not a home, I had wanted everything to be white, Walls, carpet, bedspread, curtains. White is clean, pure, safe. But now, white is bright. Way, way too bright. The linen curtains hanging in front of the floor-to-ceiling windows are pointless, I realize, because they do nothing to mask the blinding sun that's now beating down on my pillow. I groan. Daniel, I yell, leaning over to my bedside table and pulling out a bottle of Advil. There's a cup of water sitting on a marble coaster. It's new. The ice is still frozen, the cubes bobbing on the surface like buoys on a calm day. I can see the cold sweat dripping down the side of the glass and pooling at the base. Daniel, why am I dying? I hear my fiancé chuckle as he walks into our bedroom. He's carrying a tray of pancakes and turkey bacon, and I immediately wonder what I did to deserve someone who actually brings me breakfast in bed. All that's missing is a hand-picked wildflower propped inside a tiny vase, and this scene could be torn from a Hallmark movie, minus my raging hangover. Maybe this is karma, I wonder. I got a shitty family, so now I get a perfect husband. Two bottles of wine will do that he says, kissing my forehead, especially when you don't stick to the same bottles. People just kept handing me things, I say, picking up a piece of bacon and biting down. I don't even know what I drank. Suddenly, I remember the Xanax, popping that little white pill seconds before being shoved drink after drink. No wonder I feel so terrible. No wonder the edges of the night are so fuzzy, as if I'm re-watching the events of the evening through the bottom of a frosted glass. My cheeks burn red, but Daniel doesn't notice. Instead, he laughs, running his fingers through my tangled hair. His, in comparison, is perfect. I realize now that he's completely showered, his face clean-shaven, and his sandy blonde hair combed and gelled, his part a razor-thin line. He smells like aftershave and cologne. Are you going somewhere? New Orleans, he frowns. Remember I told you last week? The conference? Oh, right, I say, shaking my head, although I don't actually remember. Sorry, my brain's still foggy. But it's Saturday. Is it over the weekend? You just got home. I never knew much about pharmaceutical sales before I met Daniel. Really, the only thing I knew about it was the money. Specifically, that the position made a lot of it. Or at least it could, if you did it well. But now I know more, like the constant travel the job requires. Daniel's territory stretches halfway across Louisiana and into Mississippi, so during the week, he's almost always in the car. 
early mornings, late nights, hours on end driving from one hospital to another. There are also a lot of conferences, sales and training development, digital marketing for medical devices, seminars about the future of pharmaceuticals. I know he misses me while he's away, but I also know that he likes it. The whining and dining, the fancy hotels, the schmoozing with doctors. He's good at it, too. There's a networking event at the hotel tonight, he says slowly. And a golf tournament tomorrow before the conference begins on Monday. You don't remember any of this? My heart lurches in my chest. No, I think. I don't remember any of this. But instead, I smile, pushing the plate of breakfast aside and throwing my arms around his neck. I'm sorry, I say. I remember. I think I'm still drunk. Daniel laughs like I knew he would and tousles his hand through my hair like I'm a toddler up to bat during a game of peewee t-ball. Last night was fun, I say, diverting the conversation. I rest my head on his lap and close my eyes. Thank you. Of course, he says, the tip of his finger now drawing shapes in my hair. A circle, a square, a heart. He's quiet for a second, the kind of quiet that hangs heavy in the air, until finally he speaks. What was that conversation with your brother about? The one outside? What do you mean? You know what I mean, he says, the one I walked in on. Oh, you know, I say, my eyelids feeling heavy again. Just Cooper being Cooper, nothing to worry about. Whatever you guys were talking about, it looked a little tense. He's worried you're not marrying me for the right reasons, I say, lifting my fingertips up to make air quotes. But like I said, it's just my brother. He's overprotective. He said that? I feel Daniel's back stiffen as he pulls his hand from my hair. I wish I could swallow the words back down as soon as I say them. Again, it's the wine still buzzing through my bloodstream, making my thoughts spill over like an overpoured glass staining the carpet. Forget I mentioned it, I say, opening my eyes. I'm expecting him to be looking down at me, but instead he's staring straight ahead, straight at nothing. He'll learn to love you like I do. I know he will. He's trying. Did he say why he thinks that? Daniel, seriously, I say, sitting up in bed. It's not even worth talking about. Cooper is protective. He's always been, ever since I was a kid. Our past, you know. He kind of assumes the worst in people. We're similar that way. Yeah, Daniel says. He's still staring ahead, his eyes glassy. Yeah, I guess so. I know you're marrying me for the right reasons, I say, placing my palm on his cheek. He flinches, the touch of my skin seeming to wake him from his trance. Like, for example, for my tight Pilates ass and orgasmic coca vin. He turns to me, unable to keep his lips from cracking into a smile, then a laugh. He covers my hand with his own and squeezes my fingers before standing. Don't work all weekend, he says, patting down the creases in his ironed pants. Get outside, do something fun. I roll my eyes and snatch another piece of bacon, folding it in half before sticking it in my mouth whole. Or get some wedding planning done, he continues. It's the final countdown. Next month, I say, grinning. The fact that we booked our wedding in July... 20 years to the month from when the girls first went missing, is not lost on me. The thought flashed into my mind the moment we walked into cypress stables, the oak trees dripping over a gorgeous cobblestone aisle, white painted chairs perfectly aligned with four massive farmhouse columns. Acres and acres of untouched land spanning as far as the eye could see. I still remember setting my sights on the restored barn at the edge of the property that could be used for a reception space, Giant wooden pillars decorated with string lights and greenery and milky magnolia flowers. A white picket fence corralling horses as they grazed across the pasture, the plain of green broken only by a bayou in the distance, winding gently across the horizon like a thick blue vein. It's perfect, Daniel had said, his hand squeezing mine. Chloe, isn't it perfect? I nodded, smiling. It was perfect, but the vastness of the place reminded me of home. 
of my father, covered in mud, emerging from the trees with a shovel slouched over one shoulder. Of the swamp that surrounded our land like a moat, keeping people out, but also confining us in. I glanced over to the farmhouse, tried to imagine myself walking across the giant wraparound porch in my wedding gown before descending the stairs toward Daniel. A flutter of movement caught my eye, and I did a double take. There was a girl on the porch, a teenager slouched in a rocking chair, her leg outstretched as brown leather riding boots pushed gently against the porch columns, moving the chair in a lazy rhythm. She perked up when she noticed me staring at her, pulled her dress down, and crossed her legs. That's my granddaughter, the woman before us said. I peeled my eyes from the girl and looked in her direction. This land has been in our family for generations. She likes to come here sometimes after school, do her homework on the porch. Beats the hell out of a library, Daniel said, smiling. He lifted his arm and waved at the girl. She dipped her head slightly, embarrassed, before waving back. Daniel directed his attention back to the woman. We'll take it. What's your availability? Let's see, she said, glancing down at the iPad in her hands. She rotated it a few times until she could get the screen upright. So far, for this year, we're almost completely booked. You guys are behind schedule. We just got engaged, I said, twirling the fresh diamond around my finger, a new habit. The ring Daniel had given me was a family heirloom, a Victorian-era jewel handed down by his great-great-grandmother. It was visibly worn, but a true antique, old in a way that couldn't be replicated, Years of familial stories scratched into the oval-cut center stone, surrounded by a halo of rose-cut diamonds, the band a buttery yet slightly cloudy 14-carat yellow gold. We don't want to become one of those couples that waits around for years and just delays the inevitable. Yeah, we're old, Daniel said. Clock's a chicken. He patted my stomach and the woman smirked, swiping her finger across the screen as if flipping pages. I tried not to blush. Like I said, for this year, all my weekends are booked. We can do 2020 if you'd like. Daniel shook his head. Every single weekend? I can't believe that. What about Fridays? Most of our Fridays are booked as well, for rehearsals, she said. But it looks like we do have one. July 26th. Daniel glanced at me, raised his eyebrows. Think you can pencil it in? He was joking, I knew, but the mention of July sent my heart into a flurry. July in Louisiana, I said, twisting my expression. Think the guests can handle the heat, especially outside. We can bring in outdoor air conditioning, the woman said. Tents, fans, you name it. I don't know, I said. It gets pretty buggy, too. We spray the grounds every year, she said. I can guarantee you bugs will not be a problem. We have summer weddings all the time. I noticed Daniel staring at me then, quizzically, his eyes burrowing into the side of my head as if, if he stared at it hard enough, he could untangle the thoughts tumbling around inside. But I refused to turn, refused to face him, refused to admit the completely irrational reason why the month of July morphed my anxiety into something debilitating, a progressive disease that worsened as summer stretched on. Refused to acknowledge the rising sense of nausea in my throat, or the way the sour smell of manure in the distance seemed to mix with the sweet magnolias or the suddenly deafening sound of flies I could hear buzzing around somewhere, circling something dead. Okay. I said, nodding. I glanced at the porch again, but the girl was gone, her empty chair rocking slowly in the wind. July it is. Chapter 7 I watched Daniel's car back out of the driveway, his headlights flashing a goodbye as he waves at me through the windshield. I wave back, my silk robe clutched tightly around my chest, a steaming mug of coffee warm in my hands. I shut the door behind me and take in the empty house. There are still cups resting on various tabletops from last night, empty wine bottles filling up recycling bins in the kitchen, and flies that were apparently born overnight circling over their sticky openings. 
I start to tidy up, clearing dishes and placing them in the empty farmhouse sink, trying to ignore the drug and wine-fueled headache nagging at my brain. I think back to the prescription in my car, the Xanax I filled for Daniel that he doesn't know about or need. I think about the drawer in my office housing the various painkillers that would almost certainly numb the throbbing in my skull. It's tempting, knowing they're there. Part of me wants to get in the car and drive to them, outstretch my fingers and take my pick. Curl up in the recliner meant for patience and fall back asleep. Instead, I drink my coffee. Access to drugs is not why I got into this line of work. Besides, Louisiana is one of only three states where psychologists can actually prescribe drugs to their patients. Other than here, Illinois, and New Mexico, we typically have to rely on a referring physician or a psychiatrist to fill a script. But not here. Here, we can write them ourselves. Here, nobody else has to know. Whether that's a happy coincidence or a stroke of dangerously bad luck, I haven't quite decided. But again, that's not why I do what I do. I didn't become a psychologist to take advantage of this loophole, to sidestep the drug dealers downtown for the safety of the drive through window, trading in a plastic baggie for a logoed paper bag complete with a receipt and coupons for half-off toothpaste and a gallon of 2% milk. I became a psychologist to help people, again with the cliches, but it's true. I became a psychologist because I understand trauma. I understand it in a way that no amount of schooling could ever teach. I understand the way the brain can fundamentally fuck with every other aspect of your body, the way your emotions can distort things, emotions you didn't even know you had, the way those emotions can make it impossible to see clearly, think clearly, do anything clearly, the way they can make you hurt from your head down to your fingertips, a dull, throbbing, constant pain that never goes away. I saw plenty of doctors as a teenager. It was an endless cycle of therapists, psychiatrists, and psychologists, all of whom asked the same series of scripted questions, trying to fix the endless slideshow of anxiety disorders flipping through my psyche. Cooper and I were the stuff of textbooks back then, me with my panic attacks, hypochondria, insomnia, and nyctophobia, every year a new malady added to the list. Cooper, on the other hand, recoiled into himself. I was feeling too much while he was feeling too little. His loud personality shrunk into a whisper. He practically disappeared. The two of us together were childhood trauma wrapped in a bow and placed delicately on the doorsteps of every doctor in Louisiana. Everybody knew who we were. Everybody knew what was wrong with us. Everybody knew, but nobody could fix it. So I decided to fix it myself. I shuffle through the living room and plop down on the sofa, my coffee sloshing over the side of the mug. I lift it to my mouth and lick the liquid from the side. The morning news is already droning in the background, Daniel's channel of choice, and I reach for my MacBook, repeatedly tapping return as I wake it from a long, groggy sleep. I open my Gmail and scroll through the personal messages in my inbox, almost all of them wedding-related. Two more months, Chloe. Let's get that cake finalized, shall we? Have you decided between your two options, caramel drizzle or lemon curd? Chloe, hi. The florist needs to finalize the table arrangements. Can I tell her to invoice you for 20 tables, or did you want to cut it back to 10? A few months ago, I would have consulted Daniel on everything. Every little detail was a decision meant for the two of us, together, but as time goes by, the small, intimate wedding I had been envisioning, an outdoor ceremony followed by a private celebration for close friends, one long, slender table with Daniel and I seated at the head, picking at our favorite foods between sips of rosé and bursts of open-mouthed laughter, has turned into something else entirely. An exotic pet that neither of us knows how to tame. There's the constant decision-making, the endless emails about details that seem so trivial. Daniel has been looking to me to make the ruling on almost everything, a gesture that he probably thinks is the right one, given brides and their reputation for wanting control. But the responsibility has left me feeling more stressed out than ever, 
the weight of it all placed solely on my shoulders. His only firm opinions revolve around the fact that he hates fondant cake and that he refuses to send an invitation to his parents, two demands with which I am eager to comply. I would never admit it to Daniel, but I'm ready for it to be over. The whole thing. I say a silent thank you for a quick engagement and tap out my replies. Caramel is good, thanks. Can we meet in the middle and do 15? I scroll through a few more emails before I click on the one from my wedding planner and freeze. Hi, Chloe, I'm sorry to keep asking about this, but we do need to get the ceremony details nailed down so I can finalize a seating chart. Have you decided who you'd like to walk you down the aisle? Let me know when you get a chance. My mouse hovers over delete, but that pesky psychologist voice, my voice, echoes around me. Classic avoidance coping, Chloe. You know that never eliminates the problem. It only postpones it. I roll my eyes at my own internal advice and drum my fingers on the keyboard. The whole idea of a father walking his daughter down the aisle is so outdated anyway. The thought of somebody giving me away makes my stomach lurch, like I'm a piece of property being sold to the highest bidder. We might as well bring back the dowry. My mind flashes to Cooper, the closest thing to a father figure I've had since age 12. I imagine his hand clutched around mine, his body guiding me down the aisle. But then I think of his words last night, the disapproval in his eyes, his tone. He doesn't know you, Chloe, and you don't know him. I shut my computer and push it across the couch, my eyes flickering back to the television playing in the background. There's a bright red bar stretched across the bottom of the screen. Breaking news. I grab the remote and turn the volume up. Authorities are still looking for tips in connection to the disappearance of Aubrey Gravino, a 15-year-old high school student from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Aubrey was reported missing by her parents three days ago. She was last seen walking alone near a cemetery on her way home from school Wednesday afternoon. A picture of Aubrey flashes across the screen, and I flinch at the image. When I was a girl, 15 seemed so old, so mature, grown up. I dreamed about the things I would do when I was 15, but in the years that have followed, I've been forced to realize how painfully young it is, how young she is. They all were. Aubrey looks vaguely familiar, though I assume it's because she looks like every other high school girl I see slumped over in the chair in my office. Skinny in a way only adolescent metabolism can achieve, eyes smudged with black pencil, hair untouched by color or heat or any of the other destructive things women do to themselves as they age in an effort to look young again. I force myself not to think about how she probably looks now. Pale, stiff cold. Death ages a body, turns the skin gray, the eyes dull. Humans aren't supposed to die that young. It's unnatural. Aubrey disappears from the TV, and a new image appears, an aerial view map of Baton Rouge. My eyes are immediately drawn toward where my home and office are located, downtown near the Mississippi. A red dot appears at Cypress Cemetery, Aubrey's last known location. Search parties are combing through the cemetery today, although Aubrey's parents remain hopeful that their daughter can still be found alive. The map disappears and a video starts playing. A man and a woman, both middle-aged and severely sleep-deprived, stand at a podium, the caption identifying them as Aubrey's parents. The man stands quietly to the side while the woman, the mother, pleads into the camera. Aubrey? She says. Wherever you are, we are looking for you, baby. We are looking for you, and we are going to find you. The man sniffles, wipes his eye with his shirt sleeve, smears the snot under his nose on the back of his hand. She pats his arm and continues. To whoever has her, or has any information about her whereabouts, we are begging you to come forward. We just want our daughter back. The man starts crying now, heaving sobs. The woman presses forward, never peeling her eyes from the lens. That's a tactic the police teach you, I've learned. Look into the camera. Talk to the camera. Talk to him. 
We want our baby back. Chapter 8 Lena Rhodes was the first girl. The original. The one that started it all. I remember Lena well, and not in the way most people remember dead girls. Not in the way distant classmates make up stories to seem relevant. The way former friends post old pictures to Facebook, rehashing inside jokes and shared memories, omitting the fact that they haven't actually spoken in years. Bro Bridge remembers Lena solely by the picture chosen for the missing poster, as if that one moment frozen in time was the only moment she ever had, the only moment that mattered. How a family chooses one picture to encapsulate an entire life, an entire personality, I will never understand. It seems too daunting a task, too important and simultaneously too impossible. In choosing that picture, you are choosing her legacy. You are choosing the solitary moment that the world will remember. That moment and nothing else. But I remember Lena. Not superficially. I really remember her. I remember all her moments, the good and the bad. Her force and her flaws. I remember who she really was. She was loud, vulgar, cussed in a way I had only ever witnessed when my father accidentally hacked the tip of his thumb off with a hatchet in his workshop. The filth that spewed out of her mouth was at odds with her appearance, which made her all the more mesmerizing. She was tall, slim, breasts disproportionately large compared with her otherwise boyish 15-year-old figure. She was outgoing, bubbly, her hair a sunflower yellow that she kept pulled back into two French braids. People watched her when she walked and she knew it. Attention inflated her the way it had always deflated me, the eyes gazing in her direction making her glow even brighter, walk even taller. Boys liked her, I liked her. I envied her, really. Every girl in Bro Bridge envied her until her face appeared on the television screen that awful Tuesday morning. One moment sticks out in particular, though. One moment with Lena. A moment that I will never forget no matter how hard I try. After all, that was the moment that sent my father to prison. I turn the TV off and stare at my reflection in the dead screen. Every one of those press conferences is the same. I've seen enough to know. The mother always takes control. The mother always keeps her emotions in check. The mother always speaks evenly, steadily, while the father grovels in the background, unable to lift his head long enough for the man who took his daughter to look him in the eyes. Society would have us think it's the other way around, that the man in the family takes control, the woman cries silently, but it's not, and I know why. It's because the fathers think in the past. Bro Bridge taught me that. The fathers of the six missing girls taught me that. They're ashamed of themselves. They think, what if? They were supposed to be the protectors, the men. They were supposed to keep their daughters safe, and they failed. But the mothers think in the present. They formulate a plan. They can't afford to think in the past because the past doesn't matter anymore. It's a distraction, a waste of time. They can't afford to think in the future because the future is too terrifying, too painful. If they let their minds wander there, they may never return. They may break. So instead, they think only of today and what they can do today to bring their babies back tomorrow. Bert Rhodes had been an absolute wreck. I had never seen a man cry like that before, his entire body convulsing with each tormented moan. He used to be a relatively attractive man in that rugged, working-class way. Toned arms that made his shirt seams bulge, clean-cut jawline, amber skin. I barely recognized him on that first televised interview, the way his eyes sunk into his skull, drowning into two pools of purple the way his body slumped forward, like his own weight was physically too much to carry. My father was arrested at the end of September, 
almost three full months after his reign of terror began. And on the night of his arrest, I thought of Burt Rhodes almost immediately, before I thought of Lena or Robin or Margaret or Carrie or any of the other girls who had vanished over the course of that summer. I remember the red and blue lights illuminating our living room, Cooper and I running to the window, peering outside as the armed men barged through the front door and yelled, freeze. I remember my father in his recliner, that old leather lazy boy that was so worn in the center it was soft like felt, not even bothering to lift his head and glance in their direction, completely ignoring my mother in the corner, sobbing uncontrollably. I remember the shells of sunflower seeds, his snack of choice stuck to his teeth, his lower lip, his fingernails. I remember how they dragged him, his walnut pipe tumbling from his lips and staining the floor black with ash as that slender sleeve of seeds cascaded across the carpet. I remember how his eyes locked intently on mine, unflinching and focused. Mine, then Cooper's. Be good he said. Then they dragged him through the door and out into the damp evening air, slamming his head against the cruiser, his thick glasses cracking in protest, the flashing lights turning his skin a sickening shade of crimson. They ducked him inside and shut the door. I watched him sit there, quietly, staring ahead at the mesh metal divider, his body completely still, the only decipherable movement the trickle of blood creeping down the bridge of his nose that he didn't bother to wipe away. I watched him, and I thought of Bert Rhodes. I wondered if knowing the identity of the man who took his daughter would make things better or worse for him, easier or harder. It's an impossible choice to be faced with, but if he had to choose, would he rather his child be murdered by a complete stranger an intruder in his town, in his life, or a familiar face, one he had welcomed into his home, his neighbor, his friend. In the following months, the only time I got to see my dad was on television. His framed glasses, now fractured, always cast down to the ground below him, his hands cuffed tightly behind his back, the skin on his wrists pinched and pink. I pressed my nose to the screen and watched as people would line the street that led to the courthouse with homemade signs scribbled with horrible, nasty words, hissing as he walked past. Murderer. Pervert. Monster. Some of the signs featured the faces of the girls. The girls who had been on the news in a sad, steady stream over the course of that summer. Girls who weren't much older than me. I recognized all of them. I had memorized their features. I had seen their smiles, looked into their eyes, once promising and alive. Lena, Robin, Margaret, Carrie, Susan, Jill. Those faces were the reason I had a curfew at night. They were the reason I was never allowed to walk alone in the dark. My father had been the one to enact that rule, spanking me until my skin was raw when I stumbled home past dusk or forgot to close my window at night. He had injected pure fear into my heart, a debilitating dread of that unseen person who was the cause of their disappearances. That person who was the reason why those girls had been reduced to black and white pictures glued to old cardboard. That person who knew where they were when they took their last breaths what their eyes looked like when death finally took them. I knew it when he was arrested, of course. I knew it from the moment the police barged into our home, the moment my father looked into our eyes and whispered, Be good. I had known it before then, really, when I finally allowed the pieces to fall into place, when I forced myself to turn around and face the figure I could feel lurking behind me. But it was in that moment, alone in my living room, my face pressed against the television screen, my mother unraveling slowly in her bedroom, and Cooper shriveling into nothing out back. It was that moment, 
listening to my father's ankle chains rattle, watching his blank expression as he was moved from cop cars to prisons to courtrooms and back. It was that moment when the weight of it all came crashing down, bearing me alive in the debris. That person was him. Chapter 9 all at once, my house seems both too big and too small. It's claustrophobic, sitting here, these four walls confining me inside, trapping me with this recycled, stale air. But it's also impossibly lonely, too large to be filled with only the silent thoughts of a single soul. I have the sudden urge to move. I get up from the couch and walk into my bedroom, exchanging my oversized robe for a pair of jeans and a gray t-shirt, pulling my hair into a top knot and forgoing all makeup that takes more effort than swiping my lips with a stick of Blistex. I'm out the door within five minutes, my hammering heart slowing considerably once my flats hit the pavement. I get in the car and crank the engine, driving mechanically through my neighborhood and into town. I reach for the radio, but my hand pauses in midair, instead recoiling back to the steering wheel. It's okay, Chloe. I say out loud, my voice painfully shrill in the otherwise silence of my car. What's bothering you? Verbalize it. I drum my fingers against the steering wheel, push my turn signal, and decide to take a left. I'm talking to myself the way I talk to my clients. A girl is missing, I say. A local girl has gone missing, and it's upsetting me. If this were an appointment, next I would ask, why? Why is this upsetting you? The reasons are obvious, I know. A young girl is missing, 15 years old, last seen within jogging distance from my house, my office, my life. You don't know her, I say out loud. You don't know her, Chloe. She isn't Lena. She isn't any of those girls. She has nothing to do with you. I exhale, slowing down at an impending red light as I glance across the road. I watch another mother escort her daughter across the street, hand in hand, a group of teenagers are rollerblading to my left, a man and his dog jogging straight ahead. The light turns green. This has nothing to do with you, I repeat, pushing through the intersection and taking a right. I've been driving without direction, but I realize I'm close to my office, mere blocks from the safe haven of pills tucked inside my desk drawer. I'm a swallowed capsule away from a decreased heart rate and steady breathing a giant leather recliner with a locked door and blackout curtains. I shake the thought from my head. I don't have a problem. I'm not addicted or anything. I don't go out to bars and drink myself into a coma or break into clammy night sweats when I deny myself that nightly glass of Merlot. I could go days, weeks, months without a pill or a glass of wine or any kind of chemical substance to numb the constant fear vibrating through my veins. It's like a plucked guitar string reverberating through my bones, making them rattle. But I have it handled. All of my disorders, all of those big words that I've been fighting for so long, insomnia, nyctophobia, hypochondria, they have one common trait, one significant quality that binds them all together, and that's control. I fear all situations where I'm not in control. I imagine the things that can happen to me in my sleep, defenseless, I imagine the things that can happen to me in the dark, unaware. I imagine all the invisible killers that can strangle the life from my cells before I even know they're being suffocated. I imagine surviving what I survived, living through what I lived through, only to die from a case of unwashed hands, a tickle in my throat. I imagine Lena, the total lack of control she must have felt as those hands latched around her neck, tightening. As her windpipe squeezed shut, her eyes started to throb, her vision began to brighten before taking a sudden turn in the opposite direction, getting dimmer and dimmer until, at last, she saw nothing. My pharmacy is my lifeline. I know it's wrong to write prescriptions that don't need to be written. More than wrong, it's illegal. I could lose my license, maybe even go to jail. But everybody needs a lifeline a raft in the distance when you feel yourself starting to sink. When I find myself losing control, I know they're there, ready to fix whatever is inside me that needs fixing. More often than not, it's just the thought of them that calms my nerves. I once told a claustrophobic patient to carry a single Xanax in her purse every time she boards a plane. 
its mere presence strong enough to elicit a mental reaction, a physical response. She probably wouldn't even need to take it, I told her. Just knowing there was an escape within reach would be enough to ease the suffocating weight from her chest. And it was. Of course it was. I knew from experience. I see my office in the distance now, that old brick building peeking out from behind moss-lined oaks. The cemetery is only a few blocks west. I make a decision and turn toward it, driving in the direction of the wrought iron gate, a yawning mouth inviting me inside. I ease my car into a spot on the street and kill the ignition. Cypress Cemetery, the last place Aubrey Gravino was seen alive. I hear a noise and glance out the window. There's a search party in the distance, scouring the place like ants ambushing a sliver of forgotten meat. They're pushing through the overgrown crabgrass, sidestepping the crumbling headstones, rubbing their sneakers against the dirt pathways that snake their way through the graves. This cemetery spans over 20 acres. It's an impossibly large piece of land. The prospect of finding whatever it is they're hoping to find seems bleak at best. I get out of the car and walk through the gates, edging closer to the party. The property is dotted with bald cypress trees, the Louisiana state tree, and therefore the cemetery's namesake, their trunks thick and red and ropey like tendons. Veils of Spanish moss dangle from their branches like cobwebs festering in a forgotten corner. I duck under a ribbon of police tape and do my best to blend in, trying to skirt away from the police officers and journalists with cameras hung from their necks, wandering aimlessly among the dozens of volunteers in their hunt to find Aubrey. Or to not find Aubrey. Because the last thing you want to find in a search party is a body. Or worse, pieces of one. They hadn't found any bodies in the search parties of Bro Bridge. No pieces, either. I had begged my mother to let me tag along. I saw the hordes of people gathering in town, distributing their flashlights and walkie-talkies and cartons of bottled water, hollering out instructions before dissipating like gnats being swat at with a rolled-up newspaper. She hadn't let me, of course. I was forced to stay home, watching the flicker of lanterns in the distance as they swept their way across the seemingly endless abyss of tall, grassy pastures. It was the most helpless feeling, watching, waiting, not knowing what they'd find. It was even worse when the search party was in my own backyard, my eyes glued to the window as police scoured every inch of our ten acres after my father had been taken into custody. But that didn't yield anything either. No, those girls are still out there somewhere, the layers of dirt concealing their bones growing thicker every year. The thought of them never being found is mind-numbing to me, even though I know, by this point, they probably never will be. It isn't the injustice of it, or the lack of closure for the families, or even the concept of those girls decaying in the same way as the dead field rat I once discovered under our back porch, their humanity being stripped away along with their skin and their hair and their tattered clothing. An entire life whittled down to a pile of bones that are no different from yours or mine or even that field rats, really. No, it isn't any of those things that keep me up at night, that keep me from ever giving up hope that they might someday be found. It's the realization of how many hidden bodies could be buried beneath my feet at any point in time, the world above them completely oblivious to their existence. Of course, there are bodies buried beneath my feet at this very moment. Lots of bodies. But cemeteries are different. These bodies were placed here, not dropped. They're here to be remembered, not forgotten. I think I found something! I glance to my left at a middle-aged woman dressed in white sneakers, khaki cargo pants, and an oversized polo shirt, the unofficial uniform of a search party concerned citizen. She's kneeling in the dirt, her eyes squinting at something beneath her. Her left arm is waving madly in the direction of the other searchers, her right clutching the kind of walkie-talkie you'd buy in the toy section at Walmart. I look around. I'm the closest one by several yards. The rest are coming, running in our direction, but I'm here now. I take a step closer and she looks up at me, her eyes excited yet pleading, like she wants this item to hold some kind of significance, some kind of meaning. 
But at the same time, she doesn't. She desperately doesn't. Look, she says, waving me over. Look right there. I step closer again and crane my neck, an electric shock jolting through my body as my eyes focus on the object nestled in the dirt. I reach for it without thinking, a kind of knee-jerk reflex as if someone had smacked my shin with a mallet, and pluck it from the ground. A police officer runs up behind me, panting. What is it? He asks, hovering over me. His voice has a strangled quality to it, like his breath is trying to cut through a forest of phlegm, a mouth breather. His eyes bulge as he sees the item cradled in my hand. Jesus, don't touch it. Sorry, I mutter, handing it to him. Sorry, I, I wasn't thinking. It's an earring. The woman looks at me as the officer kneels down, chest rattling, one arm jutting out to the side to stop the others from getting too close. He plucks the earring from my palm with his gloved hand and inspects it. It's small, silver, a cluster of three diamonds at the top forming an inverted triangle, the tip of the triangle attached to a single pearl dangling at the bottom. It looks nice, something that would have caught my eye in the window of a local jeweler. Too nice for a 15-year-old. Okay, the cop says, pushing wisps of hair across his sweat-soaked forehead. He deflates just slightly. Okay, this is good. We'll bag it, but remember, we're in a public place. There are thousands of graves in here, which means hundreds of visitors daily. This earring could belong to anybody. No, the woman shakes her head. No, it doesn't. It belongs to Aubrey. She reaches into her cargo pocket and pulls out a piece of paper creased into quarters. She unfolds it. Aubrey's missing poster. I recognize the image from the one I saw this morning plastered across my TV screen. The single image that will define her existence. She's smiling wide, that black eyeliner smeared across her lids, pink lip gloss reflecting the flash of the camera. The picture cuts off just above her chest, but I can see that she's wearing a necklace. A necklace I didn't notice before, nestled in the puddle of skin between her collarbones. Three small diamonds attached to a single pearl. And there, fastened to the lobes peeking out from behind the thick brown hair tucked behind her ears, is a pair of matching earrings. Chapter 10 Lena wasn't a nice girl, but she was nice to me. I won't make excuses for her. I won't sugarcoat the facts. She was a troublemaker, a perpetual pain in the ass who seemed to get off on making other people uncomfortable, watching them squirm. Why else would a 15-year-old wear a push-up bra to school, twirling her French braid around a bitten-down fingernail as she chewed on the side of her pillowy lip? She was a woman in a girl's body, or a girl in a woman's body. Both seemed to make sense. Simultaneously too old and too young, a figure and mind beyond her years. But there were parts of her, somewhere, hidden beneath the depths of her slathered-on makeup and the cloud of cigarette smoke that seemed to envelop her each day after the ring of the high school bell, that reminded you that she was just a girl. Just a lost, lonely girl. Of course, I didn't see that side of her when I was 12. She always seemed like an adult to me, despite the fact that she was the same age as my brother. Cooper never seemed like an adult with his burping and his Game Boy and his stash of dirty magazines he kept hidden under the loose floorboard beneath his bed. I'll never forget the day I found those, snooping through his room in search of a stash of cash. I had wanted to buy myself an eyeshadow palette, a nice pale pink I had seen Lena wear. My mother refused to buy me makeup before high school, but I had wanted it. I wanted it badly enough to steal for it. So I crept into Cooper's room, lifted up that creaky plank, and was slapped in the face with a pair of cartoon tits that sent me reeling back so fast, I whacked the back of my head on his box spring. Then I immediately told my dad. The crawfish festival had been in early May that year, the prologue of summer. It was hot, but not too hot. Hot by the majority of the United States' fragile standards, but not Louisiana hot. That wouldn't come until August, when the damp breath of the bogs wafted through the city streets each morning like a rain cloud searching for drought. Also in August, three of the six girls would be gone. I joke about Brobridge, the crawfish capital of the world, 
but the Crawfish Festival really is something to brag about. My last festival had been in 1999, but it had also been my favorite. I remember wandering by myself through the fairgrounds, the sounds and smells of Louisiana permeating my skin. Swamp pop leaking from the speakers on the main stage, the scent of crawfish being prepared in every possible way, fried, boiled, bisque, boudin. I had drifted over to the crawfish race, my head snapping to the right when I noticed Cooper's moppy brown hair peeking out from inside a crowd of other kids leaning against my father's car. He always seemed to be surrounded by people back then. We were opposites in that way. They swarmed to him, trailing him around like a cloud of gnats on a muggy day. He never seemed to mind, though. Eventually, they just became a part of him, the crowd. Occasionally, he would swat at them, annoyed, and they would obey, scatter, find somebody else to stick to. But they never left for long. They always found their way back. My brother seemed to sense me looking, because before long, I saw his eyes peek above the heads of the others, zeroing in on mine. I waved, smiled meekly. I didn't mind being alone, really, I didn't. But I hated the way it made others see me. Cooper, especially. I watched him push his way through his friends, dismissing some scrawny kid with a wrist flick when he tried to follow. Then he made his way over to me and slung his arm around my shoulder. Bet you a bag of popcorn on number seven? I smiled, grateful for the company, and for the way he never acknowledged that I spent the majority of my life alone. Deal. I looked over at the race, about to begin. I remember the commissioner's scream. Ils sont bâtis! The cheering crowds, those little red mud bugs clicking their way across the target, spray painted on a ten foot wooden board. Within seconds, I had lost, and Cooper had won, so we made our way to the concession stand so he could collect his bounty. Standing in line, I had never been happier. Those early days of summer brought so much promise. It was like the red carpet of freedom was being rolled out beneath my feet, stretching so far into the distance it felt like it couldn't possibly end. Cooper grabbed the bag of popcorn and pushed a kernel into his mouth, sucking off the salt as I handed over the cash. Then we turned around and Delina was there. Hey, Coop. She smiled at him before fixing her gaze on me. She was holding a bottle of Sprite, twisting the cap on and off between her fingers. Hey, Chloe. Hey, Lena. My brother was a popular kid, a jock, wrestling for Bro Bridge High School. People knew his name, and it always confused me, watching him make friends as naturally as I kept to myself. He didn't discriminate when it came to company. He'd hang out with his wrestling buddies one day, make small talk with some stoners the next. Mostly, his attention just seemed to make you feel important, like you were somehow worthy of something valuable and rare. Lena was popular, too, but for the wrong reasons. Y'all wanna sip? I eyed her carefully, her flat stomach sticking out from beneath a skin-tight Henley that looked two sizes too small, pushing her cleavage up through the buttons. I caught a glint of something sparkly on her stomach, a belly button ring, and I immediately snapped my head back up, trying not to stare. She smiled at me, lifting the bottle to her lips. I watched a bead of liquid dribble down her chin before she wiped it with her middle finger. Do you like it? She pulled her shirt up, rolled the diamond between her fingers. There was a charm dangling beneath it, some kind of bug. It's a firefly, she said, reading my mind. They're my favorite. It glows in the dark. She cupped her hands around her stomach and motioned for me to peek through. I did, my forehead pressed against the edges of her hands. Inside, the bug had turned a bright neon green. I like to catch them, she said, looking down at her stomach. Put them in a jar. I do too, I said, still peeking through the hole in her hands. It reminded me of the fireflies that emerged in our trees at night, the way I would run through the darkness, swatting at them like I was swimming through stars. And then I'd take them out and squish them between my fingers. Did you know you can write your name on the sidewalk with their glow? I winced. I couldn't imagine squishing a bug with my bare hands, listening to it pop. But that did seem kind of cool, getting to rub its liquid between my fingers, watching it radiate up close. Somebody's staring she said, dropping her hands. 
I snapped my head up and looked in the direction of her gaze, directly at my father. He was across the crowd, staring at us, staring at Lena with her shirt pulled up to her bra. She smiled at him, waved with her free hand. He ducked his head down and kept walking. So, she said, pushing the Sprite bottle in Cooper's direction and wiggling it in the air. Do you want a sip? He glanced over to where my dad once stood, finding a gap instead of his watchful eye, then back at the bottle, snatching it from her hand and taking a fast swig. I'll take some, I said, grabbing it from him. I'm so thirsty. No, Chloe. But my brother's warning came too late. The bottle was on my lips then, the liquid pouring into my mouth and down my throat. I didn't just take a sip. I took a gulp. A gulp of what tasted like battery acid burning my esophagus the whole way down. I yanked the bottle from my mouth and heaved, the feeling of vomit rising up my throat. My cheeks inflated and I started to gag, but instead of puking, I forced the liquid down so I could finally breathe. Ugh! I choked, wiping my mouth on the back of my hand. My throat was on fire. My tongue was on fire. For a second, I started to panic that maybe I had been poisoned. What was that? Lena giggled, taking the bottle from my hand and finishing it off. She drank it like water. It amazed me. It's vodka, Sally. You've never had vodka before? Cooper looked around, his hands shoved deep in his pockets. I couldn't talk, so he talked for me. No, she's never had vodka before. She's 12. Lena shrugged, unfazed. Gotta start somewhere. Cooper thrust the popcorn in my direction, and I shoved a handful deep into my mouth, trying to chew away that awful taste. I felt the fire traveling from my throat down to my stomach, blazing in the pit of my belly. My head was starting to spin just slightly. It was weird, but kind of funny. I smiled. See, she likes it, Lena said, looking at me, smiling back. That was an impressive swig, and not just for a 12-year-old. She pulled her shirt down then, covering her skin, her firefly. She tossed her braids behind her shoulders and turned on her heel, a ballerina-type twirl that sent her whole body into motion. When she started to walk away, I couldn't stop watching her, the way her hips swayed in unison with her hair, the way her legs were skinny but toned in all the right places. You should pick me up in that car of yours sometime, she yelled back, raising the bottle into the air. I was drunk for the rest of the day. Cooper seemed annoyed at first, annoyed at me, at my stupidity, at my naivety, at my slurring words and random giggles and running into light poles. He had left his friends for me, and now he was stuck babysitting me, drunk me. But how was I supposed to know that was alcohol? I didn't know alcohol came in Sprite bottles. You need to loosen up, I had said, tripping over myself. I looked up at him, registered the shocked expression on his face as he stared down at me. At first, I thought he was mad. I started to regret it. But then his shoulders loosened, his hard expression melted into a smile, then a laugh. He rubbed his hand through my hair and shook his head, and my chest swelled with something that felt like pride. He bought me a crawdog after that and watched in amusement as I gobbled it down in two bites. This was fun. I said as we walked back to the car together, hand in hand. I didn't feel drunk anymore. I felt droopy. It was getting darker then. Our parents had left hours before, leaving us with a $20 bill for dinner, a kiss on my forehead, and instructions to be home by eight. Cooper had just gotten his driver's license and had ordered me not to talk when he saw them walking toward us, cautious of my heavy tongue and slurring words. So I didn't. Instead, I watched. I watched the way my mother chatted incessantly about another successful year and, goodness, my feet are aching, and, come on, Richard, let's leave these kids to it. I watched the way her cheeks flushed with red and the edges of her dress rippled when the wind blew. I felt my chest swelling again, but it wasn't pride that time. It was contentment. Love. Love for my mother, my brother. Then I glanced over to my dad, and almost immediately, the swelling died down. He seemed off, preoccupied, distracted somehow, but not by anything going on around us. 
distracted in his mind. I tried to get a whiff of my breath, worried that he could smell the vodka on me. I wondered if he saw Lena hand us that bottle. After all, I saw him watching, watching her. I bet it was, Cooper said, smiling down at me. But don't get in the habit of that, okay? Habit of what? You know what. I furrowed my eyebrows. But you did it? Yeah, I'm older. It's different. Lena said you gotta start somewhere. Cooper shook his head. Don't listen to her. You don't want to be like Lena. But I did. I did want to be like Lena. I wanted her confidence, her radiance, her spirit. She was like that Sprite bottle. From the outside, she seemed one way, but on the inside, she was something completely different. Dangerous, like poison, but also addicting, freeing. I had had my taste, and she left me wanting more. I remember getting home that night and seeing the lightning bugs in our driveway, twinkling like constellations in the sky, the way they always did. But that night, it felt different. They felt different. I remember catching one in my palm, feeling it flutter between my fingers as I brought it in, placing it delicately inside a water glass, covering the lip in plastic, poking little air holes and watching it flicker in the dark for hours, trapped as I lay beneath the sheets in my bedroom, breathing slowly, thinking of her. I memorized everything about Lena that day. The way her hair got frizzy around the edges, leaving her with a kind of blonde halo when the air turned moist. The way she teased people with her wiggling bottle and wiggling hips and wiggling fingers as she waved in the direction of my dad. The way she wore her hair and her clothes and especially that little firefly dangling from her belly button. The way it glowed in the dark when she cupped her hands around her stomach and pulled me in. And that's why I remembered it so vividly when I saw it again, four months later, hidden in the back of my father's closet. Chapter 11 The discovery of Aubrey's earring is not a good one. The sight of it pushed into the graveyard dirt had made my blood run cold. The implications of it draping over the entire search party like a fire blanket, extinguishing the flame that had been pulsing through the cemetery minutes before. Everyone's shoulders sagged a little more after that. Their heads hung a little lower. And I was left thinking of Lena. I drove straight to my office after I left Cypress Cemetery. I couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't take the noises, the screaming cicadas and the crunching of shoes against dead grass, the occasional snorts and spits of the search party, the buzz of a mosquito followed by a rogue slap of the skin in the distance. Khaki cargo pants seemed to be under the impression that we were now a team after the police officer walked away with her discovery safely sealed inside an evidence bag. She stood up from her frog-legged squat, hands on hips, and looked at me, expectantly, as if I was supposed to tell her where we should go to find the next clue. I felt like an intruder in that moment, like I shouldn't have been there. Like I was playing some kind of role in a movie, pretending to be something that I'm just not. So I turned around and walked away without uttering another word. I could feel eyes on my back until the moment I got into my car and drove away, and even then, I still felt like I was being watched. I park outside my office building and walk frantically up the steps, inserting my key into the lock, twisting, pushing. I flip on the lights to my empty waiting room and walk into my office, my hands shaking a little bit less with each step that takes me closer to my desk. Now, I settle into my chair and exhale, leaning to the side and pulling open my bottom drawer, the mountain of bottles stare back at me, each one pleading to be chosen. I eye them all, chew on the side of my cheek. I pick up one, then another, comparing them side by side before settling on one milligram of Ativan. I study the little five-sided pill in my palm, the powdery white, the raised A. It's a low dose, I reason, just enough to cloak my body in a sense of calm. I pop it into my mouth and swallow it dry before pushing the drawer closed with my foot. I twist in my office chair, thinking, before glancing over to my phone and noticing a blinking red light. One voicemail. 
I turn on speakerphone and listen to the familiar voice radiate through the room. Dr. Davis, this is Aaron Jansen with the New York Times. We just spoke on the phone earlier, and uh, I would really appreciate just an hour of your time to talk. We'll be running this article no matter what, and I'd like to give you the opportunity to say your part. You can call me back directly on this number. There's silence next, but I can hear him breathing, thinking. I'll be reaching out to your father, too. I just thought you'd want to know. Click. I sink lower into my chair. I've been actively avoiding my father for the last 20 years in every sense of the word. Speaking to him, thinking about him, talking about him. It was hard to do at first, right after his arrest. People harassed us, showed up at our house at night screaming obscenities and waving signs as if we too partook in the slaying of those innocent young girls. As if we somehow knew and turned a blind eye. They egged our house, slipped the tires of my father's truck still parked in the yard, spray-painted pervert on the side in dripping red paint. Someone broke through my mother's bedroom window one night with a rock, shattering the glass across her body as she slept. It was all over the news, the discovery of Dick Davis as the Bro Bridge serial killer. And then there were those words, serial killer. It seemed so official. For some reason, I never thought of my father as a serial killer until I saw it plastered across the newspapers, labeling him as such. It seemed too harsh for my father, a gentle man with a gentle voice. He was the one who taught me how to ride a bike, jogging alongside me with his hands clutching the handlebars. The first time he let go, I had crashed into a fence, smacking straight into the wooden beam and feeling a searing pain in my cheek. I remember him running up behind me, scooping me in his arms, followed by the warmth of a damp washcloth as he pressed it against the gash beneath my eye, drying my tears with his shirt sleeve, kissing my tangled hair. Then he fastened my helmet tighter and made me try again. My dad tucked me under the covers at night, wrote his own bedtime stories, shaved his facial hair into cartoon mustaches just to watch me laugh as he emerged from the bathroom, pretending like he didn't understand why I was wailing into the couch cushions, tears streaming from my cheeks. That man couldn't be a serial killer. Serial killers didn't do things like that, did they? But he was, and they did. He killed those girls. He killed Lena. I remember the way he watched her that day at the festival, his eyes tracing her 15-year-old body like a wolf eyeing a dying animal. I'll always credit that moment as the beginning of it all. Sometimes I blame myself. She was talking to me, after all. She was holding up her shirt for me, showing off her belly button ring for me. Had I not been there, would my father have seen her like that? Would he have thought of her like that? She came over a few times that summer, stopping by to give me some old hand-me-down clothes or used CDs. And every time my father walked into my bedroom and saw her there, lying belly side down on the hardwood floor, her legs kicking freely in the air and her ass busting out of her ripped up denim shorts, he stopped, stared, cleared his throat, then walked away. His trial was televised. I know because I watched. My mother wouldn't let us at first. Cooper and me, kicking us out of the room when we wandered in to find her crouched on the floor, her nose practically touching the screen. This isn't for children's eyes, she would say. Go outside and play, get some fresh air. She was acting like it was nothing more than an R-rated movie, like our father wasn't on TV being tried for murder. But then one day, even that changed. The doorbell had been jarring, I remember the way it had reverberated through our perpetually silent house, vibrating off the grandfather clock, creating a tinny buzzing that made my arm hair bristle. We had all stopped what we were doing and stared at the door. Nobody visited us anymore, and the ones who did had abandoned polite formalities like that long ago. They came by screaming, throwing things, or even worse, without making a single sound. 
For a while, we had been finding foreign footprints littered throughout our property, left behind by some stranger slinking across our yard at night, peeking through windows with a sick fascination. It made me feel like we were a collection of curiosities preserved behind a museum glass case, something haunted and strange. I remember the day I caught him, finally, walking up that dirt pathway and seeing the back of his head as he peered inside, thinking no one was home. I remember pushing up my sleeves, charging at him blind with nothing but adrenaline and anger forcing me forward. Who are you? I had screamed, my little fists balled up by my sides. I was so sick of our lives being put on display, of people treating us like we weren't human, weren't real. He had swung around then, stared at me with wide eyes and hands raised, like he hadn't even considered the fact that people still lived here. Turned out he was just a kid, too, barely even older than me. Nobody, he had stammered. I'm, I'm nobody. We had become so used to it, to intruders and prowlers and threatening phone calls, that when we heard the bell politely ring that morning— we were almost more afraid to know who was behind that thick slab of cedar, patiently waiting for us to invite them inside. Mom, I had said, my eyes drifting from the door to her. She was sitting at the kitchen table, her hands woven between her thinning hair. Are you gonna get that? She had looked at me, confused, as if my voice were something foreign, the words no longer intelligible. Every day, her appearance seemed to change. Wrinkles etching themselves deeper into her sagging skin. Dark shadows smeared beneath her eyes, bloodshot and worn. Finally, she stood up wordlessly and peered out the small, circular window. The creak of the hinges, her soft, startled voice. Oh, phew. Hi, come in. Theodore Gates, my father's defense attorney, I watched as he walked into our house with his slow, lumbering footsteps. I remember his shiny briefcase, the thick gold band stretched across his wedding finger. He had smiled at me, sympathetic, but I had grimaced back. I didn't understand how he could sleep at night, defending what my father had done. Can I get you some coffee? Sure, Mona, yeah, that would be great. My mother stumbled around the kitchen, clanking the ceramic mug against the tile counter. That coffee had been sitting in the pot for three straight days, and I watched as she poured it, absentmindedly spinning a spoon in circles, even though she hadn't poured in any creamer to mix. Then she handed it to Mr. Gates. He took a small sip, clearing his throat, before placing it back down on the table and sliding it away with his pinky. Listen, Mona, I have some news. I wanted you to hear it from me first. She was silent, staring out the small window situated above our kitchen sink, tinted green with mildew. I got your husband a plea deal, a good one. He's going to take it. She had snapped her head up then, as though his words had clipped a rubber band that had been stretched tight down the back of her neck. Louisiana has the death penalty, he said. We cannot risk that. Kids, upstairs. She looked at Cooper and me, still sitting on the living room rug, my finger picking at the burnt hole from where my father's pipe had landed. We obeyed, standing up and skulking silently past the kitchen and up the stairs. But when we reached our bedroom doors, we closed them, loudly, before tiptoeing back toward the banister, taking a seat on the top step. And then we listened. You can't possibly think they'd give him death, she had said, her voice a whisper. There's barely any evidence. No murder weapon, no bodies. There is evidence, he had said. You know that, you've seen it. She sighed, the kitchen chair screeching as she pulled it back and took a seat herself. But you think that's enough for death? I mean, we're talking the death penalty, Theo. That's irreversible. They can't be sure beyond a reasonable doubt. We're talking six murdered girls, Mona. Six. Physical evidence found inside your home, eyewitness testimony confirming that Dick had been in contact with at least half of them in the days prior to their disappearance. And there are stories now, Mona. I'm sure you've heard them, about Lena not being the first one. Those stories are total speculation, she said. There is no evidence to suggest that he was responsible for that other girl. That other girl has a name, he spat. You should say it out loud. 
Tara King. Tara King, I had whispered, curious as to how it would feel on my lips. I had never heard of a Tara King before. Cooper's hand shot out to the side, slapping my arm. Chloe. My name hissed through his teeth. Shut up. The kitchen was silent. My brother and I held our breath, waiting for my mother to appear at the base of the stairs. But instead, she kept talking. She must not have heard. Tara King was a runaway, she said at last. She told her parents she was leaving. She left a note almost a year before any of this started. It doesn't fit the pattern. That doesn't matter, Mona. She's still missing. Nobody has heard from her, and the jury is seething. They're thinking with their emotions on this one. She was silent, refusing to respond. I couldn't see into the room, but I could picture it. Her, sitting there, her arms crossed tightly, her gaze somewhere far away and getting farther. We were losing my mother, and we were losing her fast. It's tough, you know, with a case this sensationalized, Theo said. His face already plastered across the television. People have made up their minds no matter what we argue. So you want him to give up? No, I want him to live. Plead guilty and the death penalty is off the table. It's our only option. The house was quiet. So quiet, I started to worry that they would be able to hear our breath, low and slow, as we sat just out of sight. Unless you have anything else I can work with, he added. Anything at all you haven't told me. I held my breath again, straining to hear against the deafening silence, my heart pulsing in my forehead, my eyes. No, she said at last, defeat in her voice. No, I don't. You know everything. Right, Theo said, sighing. That's what I thought. And Mona? I pictured my mother staring up at him then, tears in her eyes, all her fight gone. As a part of the deal, he's agreed to take the police to the bodies. The silence returned again, but this time we were all left speechless. Because when Theodore Gates walked out of our house that day, in an instant, everything changed. My father was no longer presumed guilty, he was guilty. He was admitting it, not only to the jury, but also to us. And slowly, my mother stopped trying, stopped caring. The days went by, and her eyes turned dull, like they had morphed into glass. She stopped leaving the house, then her room, then her bed, and Cooper and I were left pressing our own noses to the screen. He pled guilty, and when his sentencing finally aired, we watched the entire thing. Why did you do it, Mr. Davis? Why did you kill those girls? I watched my father look down at his lap, away from the judge. The room was silent, a collective held breath hanging heavy in the air. He seemed to be considering the question, really thinking about it, chewing it over in his mind as if it were the first time he had ever really stopped to consider the word why. I have a darkness inside of me, he said at last. A darkness that comes out at night. I looked at Coop, searching his face for some kind of explanation, but he just kept staring at the TV, mesmerized. I turned back. What kind of darkness? The judge asked. My father shook his head, letting a single tear erupt from his eye and drip down his cheek. The room was so quiet, I could have sworn I heard the flick as it landed on the table. I don't know. He said quietly. I don't know. It's so strong, I couldn't fight it. I tried for a long time. A long, long time. But I couldn't fight it anymore. And you're telling me that this darkness is what forced you to kill those girls? Yes. He nodded. Tears were streaming down his face then, snot dripping from his nostrils. Yes, it did. It's like a shadow, a giant shadow always hovering in the corner of the room, every room. I tried to stay out of it. I tried to stay in the light, but I couldn't do it anymore. It drew me in. It swallowed me whole. 
Sometimes I think it might be the devil himself. I realized in that moment that I had never seen my father cry before. In my twelve years spent living under his roof, never once had he shed a tear in my presence. Watching your parents cry should be a painful experience, uncomfortable even. One time after my aunt had passed away, I had barged into my parents' bedroom and caught my mother crying in bed. When she lifted her head, there was the imprint of a face on her pillow, her tears, snot, and spit marking the very spots where her features had been, like some kind of funhouse smiley face stained into the fabric. It was a jarring scene, otherworldly almost. Her splotchy skin and her reddened nose and the self-conscious way she tried to push back the wet hair stuck to the side of her cheek and smile at me, pretending that everything was okay. I remember standing in the doorframe, stunned, before slowly backing up and shutting it closed without uttering a single word. But watching my father sob on national television, watching his tears pool in the crease above his lip before staining the notepad positioned on the table below him, I felt nothing but disgust. His emotion seemed authentic, I thought, but his explanation felt forced, scripted like he was reading from a screenplay, acting out the role of the serial killer confessing to his sins. He was looking for sympathy, I realized. He was casting the fault in every direction but his own. He wasn't sorry for what he had done. He was sorry he got caught. And the fact that he was blaming this fictional thing for his actions, this devil that lurked in the corners, forcing his hands to squeeze their necks, sent a shot of inexplicable anger through my body. I remember bawling my hands into fists, my fingernails drawing blood from my palms. Fucking coward, I spit. Cooper looked at me, shocked at my language, my rage. And that was the last time I saw my father. His face on my television screen, describing the invisible monster that made him strangle those girls and bury their bodies in the woods behind our ten-acre lot. He made good on his promise to take the police there. I remember hearing the slam of the cruiser doors, refusing to even glance out the window as he led a team of detectives into the trees. They found some remnants of the girls, hairs, clothing fibers, but no bodies. An animal must have gotten to them first, a gator or a coyote or some other hidden creature of the swamp desperate for a meal. But I knew it was the truth because I had seen him one night a dark figure emerging from the trees, covered in dirt. A shovel slung across his shoulder as he slumped back to our house, oblivious to me watching from behind my bedroom window. The idea of him burying a body before returning home and kissing me goodnight had made me want to crawl out of my skin and live somewhere else, somewhere far away. I sigh, the Ativan making my limbs tingle. The day I turned off that television screen was the day I decided that my father was dead. He isn't, of course. The plea deal made sure of that. Instead, he's serving six consecutive life sentences in Louisiana State Penitentiary without the possibility of parole. But to me, he is dead. And I like it that way. But suddenly, it's getting harder and harder to believe my lie. Harder and harder to forget. Maybe it's the wedding, the thought of him not walking me down the aisle. Maybe it's the anniversary, 20 years, and Aaron Jansen forcing me to acknowledge this horrible milestone I never wanted to be a part of. Or maybe it's Aubrey Gravino, another 15-year-old girl gone too soon. I look back at my desk and my eyes land on my laptop. I open the lid, the screen glowing to life, and launch a new browser window, my fingers hovering over the keys. Then I start to type. First, I Google Aaron Jansen, New York Times. Pages of articles fill the screen. I jump to one, then another, then another. It's becoming clear now that this man makes his living writing about the murder and misfortune of others. A headless body found in the bushes of Central Park. A string of missing women across the Highway of Tears. I click over to his bio. His headshot is small, circular, black and white. He's one of those people whose face and voice don't match up, like it was stitched on as an afterthought, two sizes too big. His voice is deep, masculine, but his image is far from it. 
He looks skinny, maybe mid-thirties, wears brown tortoiseshell glasses that don't actually look prescription. They look like blue blockers, glasses made for people who wish they had glasses. Strike one. He's wearing a fitted, checkerboard, button-up shirt with the sleeves rolled to his elbows, a thin-knit tie hanging limp against his scrawny chest. Strike two. I scan the article, looking for a strike three, for another reason to dismiss this Aaron Jansen as just another journalist prick looking to exploit my family. I've had these interview requests before, lots of them. I've heard the whole, I want to hear your side of the story, and I'd believed them. I'd let them in. I'd told them my side of the story, only to read the article in horror days later as they painted my family as some kind of accomplice to my father's crimes, as they blamed my mother for the affairs that were discovered in the wake of the investigation, for cheating on my father and leaving him emotionally vulnerable and angry at women. They blamed her for allowing the girls into our home, too distracted by her suitors to notice my father eyeing them, sneaking out at night, and coming home with dirt on his clothes. Some of the articles even suggested she knew about it. She knew about the darkness in my dad and simply turned a blind eye. Maybe that's what drove her to cheat, his pedophilia, his rage. And it was the guilt that drove her mad. The guilt about her role in it all that made her recoil into herself and abandon her children when they needed her most. And the children. Let's not even get started on the children. Cooper, the golden boy who my father supposedly envied. He saw the way girls looked at him, with his boyish good looks and wrestler biceps and charmingly lopsided grin. Cooper kept porn in the house, like any normal teenaged boy, but my father had found it, thanks to me. Maybe that's what caused the darkness to creep in from the corners. Maybe flipping through those magazines unleashed something in him he had been suppressing for years. A latent violence. And then there was me, Chloe, the pubescent daughter who had started wearing makeup and shaving her legs and hiking up her shirt to show her belly button the way Lena had done that day at the festival. And I walked around like that, around my house, around my dad. It had been classic victim-blaming. My father, another middle-aged white man with a meanness he couldn't explain. He offered no concrete explanations, no valid reason why. He offered only the darkness. And surely that couldn't be possible. People refused to believe that otherwise average white men murder without a reason why. And so we became the reason. The neglect of his wife, the taunting of his son, the budding promiscuity of his daughter. It was all too much for his fragile ego, and eventually, he snapped. I still remember those questions, those questions I had been asked years ago. My answers that were twisted and printed and archived on the internet to be summoned across computer screens for the rest of time. Why do you think your father did this? I remember tapping my pen against my nameplate, still shiny and scratchless. That interview had taken place during my first year at Baton Rouge General. It was supposed to be one of those feel-good stories they run on Sunday mornings. The daughter of Richard Davis had turned into a psychologist, channeling her childhood trauma to help other young, troubled souls. I don't know, I had said finally. Sometimes these things don't have a clear answer. He obviously had a need for dominance, for control that I didn't see when I was a child. Should your mother have seen it? I stopped, stared. It wasn't my mother's job to notice every red flag that my father exhibited, I said. Oftentimes, there are no blatant warning signs until it's too late. Just look at Ted Bundy, Dennis Rader. They had girlfriends and wives, families at home completely oblivious to what they were doing at night. My mother wasn't responsible for him, for his actions. She had her own life. It certainly sounds like she had her own life. It came out during the sentencing that your mother had been involved in several extramarital affairs. Yeah, I said. Clearly she wasn't perfect, but nobody is. One specifically with Burt Rhodes, Lena's father. I was silent, that mental image of Burt Rhodes's unraveling still fresh in my mind. Did she neglect your father emotionally? Was she planning on leaving him? No, I said, shaking my head. No, she didn't neglect him. They were happy, or I thought they were happy. They seemed happy. Did she neglect you, too? After the sentencing, she tried to kill herself. 
with two young children still under the age of 18, still dependent on her. I knew in that moment that the story had already been written. Nothing I could have said would have swayed the narrative. Worse, they were using my words, my words as a psychologist, my words as his daughter, to reinforce their blind notion, to prove their point. I click out of the Times website and open up a new window, but before I can start typing, a breaking news alert chirps across the screen. Aubrey Gravino's body found. Chapter 12 I don't even bother to click into the news alert. Instead, I get up from my desk and close my laptop, the Ativan fog lifting me across my office and into my car. I float weightlessly down the road, through town, through my neighborhood, through my front door, and eventually find myself on the couch, my head sinking deep into the cushions as my eyes bore into the ceiling above. And that's where I remain for the rest of the weekend. It's Monday morning now, and the house still smells like chemically produced lemon from the cleaner I used to wipe down the wine-soaked kitchen counters on Saturday morning. My surroundings feel clean, but I do not. I haven't showered since my return from Cypress Cemetery, and I can still see the dirt from Aubrey's earring wedged beneath my fingernails. My roots are damp with grease. When I run my fingers through my hair, the strands remain stuck in one spot instead of cascading across my forehead the way they usually do. I need to shower before work, but I can't find the motivation. What you're experiencing is akin to the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, Chloe. Feelings of anxiety persisting despite the absence of any immediate danger. Of course, it's easier to dole out advice than to actually take it. I feel like a hypocrite, an imposter, reciting the words I would say to a patient while willfully ignoring them when the recipient is myself. My phone vibrates beside me, sending it fluttering across the marble island. I glance at the display. One new text message from Daniel. I swipe at the screen and scan the paragraph before me. Good morning, sweetheart. I'm headed into the opening session now. We'll be unavailable most of the day. Make it a good one. I'll miss you. My fingers touch the screen, Daniel's words lifting the heaviness from my shoulders just slightly. This effect he has on me, I can't explain it. It's as if he knows what I'm doing at this very moment, the way I'm slipping underwater, too tired to even look for a branch to cling to, and he's the hand that juts out from the trees, grabbing my shirt and yanking me back to land, back to safety, just in time. I text him back and place my phone on the counter, turning on the coffee maker before walking into the bathroom and twisting the knob in the shower. I step into the hot water, the violent spray feeling like needles against my naked body. I let it burn me for a while pelting my skin raw. I try not to think about Aubrey, about her body found in the cemetery. I try not to think about her skin scratched and dirty and covered in maggots swarming eagerly around a meal. I try not to think about who might have found her. Maybe it was that cop, all nasally and winded as he walked her earring back to the safety of his locked cruiser. Or maybe it was khaki cargo pants leapfrogging into a ditch or a particularly dense patch of crabgrass, the scream getting caught in her throat instead of coming out like a deep, wet choke. Instead, I think about Daniel. I think about what he's doing right now, walking into a cold auditorium in New Orleans, probably clutching a styrofoam cup of complimentary coffee as he scans the crowd for an empty chair, a lanyard with his name dangling around his neck. He's having no problem meeting people, I imagine. Daniel can talk to anyone. After all, he managed to turn an emotionally guarded stranger he met in a hospital lobby into his fiancée within a matter of months. I had initiated our first date, though. I'll give myself that. After all, it was his business card that was pushed into the pages of my book that day. I had his number, but he didn't have mine. I vaguely remember slipping the book back into the box that was resting on top of my car before loading it into the back seat and driving away, watching him disappear into Baton Rouge General in my rear view. I remember thinking he was nice, handsome. His card said pharmaceutical sales, which explained why he was there. It also made me wonder if that's why he was flirting with me. I could be just another client to him, another paycheck. 
I never forgot about the card. I always knew it was there, calling to me quietly from the corner. I left it there for as long as I could, leaving that box of books still untouched until three weeks later it was the last one left. I remember pulling stacks out by their spines, dusty and cracking, and slipping them into their spots on the bookshelf until finally there was only one left. I peered down into the empty box, bird girl staring back at me with her cold bronze eyes. Midnight in the garden of good and evil. I bent over and picked it up, turned it to its side. I ran my fingers along the edge of the pages, fingering the gap where his business card still rested. I stuck my thumb inside and flipped it open, once again staring at his name, Daniel Briggs. I picked up the card and tapped it between my fingers, thinking. His number stared back at me, a silent dare. I understood my brother's aversion to dating, to getting too close to anyone. On one hand, my father had taught me that it's entirely possible to love someone without ever really knowing them, and that thought kept me up at night. Every time I found myself getting interested in a man, I couldn't help but wonder, what are they hiding? What aren't they telling me? Which closet are their skeletons lurking in, buried in the dark? Like that box in the back of my father's. I was terrified of finding them, of learning their true essence. But on the other hand, Lena had taught me that it's also possible to love someone and lose them for no reason at all to find a perfectly good person and wake up one morning to learn that they're gone without a trace, either by force or by will. What if I did find someone, someone good, and he was taken from me too? Wouldn't it just be easier to go through life alone? So that's what I had done for years. I had been alone. I went through high school in a kind of daze. After Cooper graduated and I was on my own, I started getting jumped in the gymnasium, tough boys trying to prove their disdain for violence against women by taking a switchblade to my forearm, carving zigzags in my skin. This is for your father, they'd spit, the irony lost. I remember walking home, the blood dripping from my fingers like melted wax from a candlestick, a little dotted line snaking through town like a treasure map. X marks the spot. I remember telling myself that as long as I got into college, I could get out of Brobridge. I could get away from it all. And that's what I did. I dated boys at LSU, but it was mostly superficial. Drunken hookups in the back of a crowded bar, sneaking into a frat house bedroom, leaving the door cracked to make sure I could still hear the muffled noise of the party going on outside. The shitty music vibrating through the walls, the laughter of girls in packs echoing down the hallway, their open-faced palms slapping the door, their whispers and their glares when we emerged from the bedroom, hair rumpled, zippers down, the slurring words of the boy I had zeroed in on hours earlier, the target of my meticulous checklist that minimized all risk of him getting too attached or killing me in the darkened corners of his bedroom. He was never too tall, never too muscular. If he got on top of me, I could easily push him off. He had friends, I couldn't risk an angry loner. But he also wasn't the life of the party. I couldn't risk an entitled blowhard either, a guy who views the body of a female as nothing more than his own plaything. He was always just the right amount of drunk. Not too drunk to get it up, but just drunk enough to be unsteady on his feet, his eyes glassed over. And I was just the right amount of drunk too, tingly and confident and numb, my inhibitions lowered just enough to let him kiss my neck without pulling away, but not enough to lose my alertness, my coordination, my sense of danger. Maybe he wouldn't remember my face in the morning. Certainly he wouldn't remember my name. And that's the way I liked it. Anonymity, the kind of thing I was never granted in childhood. The luxury of closeness, the beating of another heart against my chest, the trembling of fingers intertwined with mine, without the possibility of getting hurt. My only semi-serious relationship didn't end well. I wasn't ready to date. I wasn't ready to fully trust another person. But again, I did it to feel normal. I did it to drown out the solitude, the physical presence of another body tricking my own into feeling less alone. Somehow, it did the opposite. 
After graduation, the hospital had given me friends, co-workers, a community I could surround myself with during the daytime hours before retreating home at night and settling into my isolated routine. And it had worked, for a while. But ever since I'd launched my own business, I had found myself completely alone. All day and all night. On the day I held Daniel's card again, I hadn't spoken to another human being in weeks, outside of the occasional text message from Coop or Shannon or Mom's place calling to remind me to come visit. I knew that it would change once clients started trickling through the doors, but that wasn't the same. Besides, they were supposed to be talking to me for support, not the other way around. Daniel's business card was hot in my hands. I remember walking over to my desk and taking a seat, leaning back in the chair. I picked up my phone and dialed, the ringing on the other end dragging on for so long I almost hung up. Then suddenly, a voice. This is Daniel. I was quiet on the line, my breath caught in my throat. He waited a few seconds before trying again. Hello? Daniel, I said finally. This is Chloe Davis. The silence on the other end made my stomach lurch. We met a few weeks ago, I reminded him, cringing, in the hospital. Dr. Chloe Davis, he responded. I could hear the smile stretching across his lips. I was starting to think you weren't going to call. I've been unpacking, I said, my heart rate slowing. I lost your card, but I just found it at the bottom of my last box. So you're all moved in? Just about, I said, looking around the cluttered office. Well, that's cause for celebration. Do you want to grab a drink? I had never been one to agree to drinks with a stranger. Every real date I had ever been on had been set up by mutual friends, a well-intentioned favor I knew was mostly motivated by the awkwardness that ensued when I was the only one in a group that showed up alone. I hesitated, almost made up an excuse as to why I was busy. But instead, as if my lips were moving in opposition to the brain that controlled them, I heard myself agree. Had I not been so starved for conversation that day, for any kind of human interaction, that phone call probably would have been the end of it. But it wasn't. An hour later, I was sitting at the bar at the river room, swirling a glass of wine in my hand. Daniel was on the bar stool next to me, his eyes studying my silhouette. What? I had asked, self-consciously tucking a strand of hair behind my ear. Do I have food in my teeth or something? No, he laughed, shaking his head. No, it's just, I can't believe I'm sitting here with you. I had eyed him then, trying to judge his comment. Was he flirting with me, or was it something more sinister? I had googled Daniel Briggs before our date, of course I had, and this was the moment I was going to find out if he had done the same. Searching Daniel's name had yielded nothing more than a Facebook page with assorted pictures of him holding a whiskey at various rooftop bars, one hand clutching a golf club while the other clasped a sweating beer, sitting cross-legged on a couch while holding a baby the caption identified as his best friend's son. I had found his LinkedIn profile, confirming his profession in pharmaceutical sales. He was mentioned in a newspaper article from 2015, printing his finishing time for the Louisiana Marathon, four hours and 19 minutes. It was all very average, innocent, almost boring even. Exactly what I wanted. But if he had Googled me, he would have found more. So much more. So, he said, Dr. Chloe Davis, tell me about yourself. You know, you don't have to call me that all the time. Dr. Chloe Davis, so formal. He smiled, took a sip from his whiskey. What should I call you then? Chloe, I said, looking at him. Just Chloe. All right, just Chloe. I smacked his arm with the back of my hand, laughing. He smiled back. Really, though, tell me about yourself. I'm sitting here having drinks with a stranger. The least you could do was assure me that you're not dangerous. I felt the goosebumps prickle across my skin, lifting the hair on my arms. I'm from Louisiana, I said, testing the waters. He didn't flinch. Not Baton Rouge, a small town about an hour from here. Baton Rouge born and raised, he said, tilting his drink toward his chest. 
What made you move here? School, I said. I got my PhD from LSU. Impressive. Thank you. Any possessive older brothers I should know about? My chest lurched again. All of these comments could be innocent flirtation, but they could also be perceived as a man trying to coax a truth out of me that he had already learned for himself. All of my other bad first dates came flooding back to me, the moment I had realized that the person I was making small talk with already knew everything there was to know. Some of them had asked me outright, you're Dick Davis's daughter, aren't you? Their eyes hungry for information, while others waited impatiently, tapping their fingers against the table while I spoke about other things, as if admitting that I shared DNA with a serial killer was something I should be eager to reveal. How do you know? I asked, trying to keep the tone light. Is it that obvious? Daniel shrugged. No, he said, turning back toward the bar. It's just that I had a little sister once, and I know I was. I knew every guy who ever looked at her. Shit, if you were her, I'd probably be lurking in the corner of this bar right now. He hadn't Googled me, I would learn on a later date. My paranoia about his line of questioning was just that, paranoia. He had never even heard about Bro Bridge and Dick Davis and all those missing girls. He was only 17 when it happened. He didn't really watch the news. I imagine his mother tried to shield it from him the same way mine had tried to shield it from me. I had told him the story one night as we lay sprawled across my living room couch. I didn't know what made me choose that particular moment. I suppose I had realized that, at some point, I had to come clean. That my truth, my history, would be the make or break moment that determined our life together, our future, or lack thereof. So I just started talking, watching as his forehead wrinkled deeper with every passing minute, every gruesome detail. And I told him everything, about Lena and the festival and the way I had watched my father get arrested in our living room, those words he had uttered before being whisked away into the night. I had told him what I had seen through my bedroom window, my father, that shovel, and the fact that my childhood home was still sitting there, empty, abandoned in Bro Bridge, the memories of my youth twisted into a real-life haunted house, a ghost story the place kids ran past with their breath held tight for fear of summoning the spirits that surely haunted its walls. I had told him about my father in prison, his plea deal and consecutive life sentences, the fact that I hadn't seen or spoken to him in almost 20 years. I had gotten completely lost in that moment, letting the memories spill from me like the rancid innards of a gutted fish. I hadn't realized how badly I needed to get them out, how they were poisoning me from the inside. When I was done, Daniel was silent. I picked at a fraying thread on the couch, embarrassed. I just thought you needed to know, I had said, my head downcast. If we're gonna be, you know, dating or something. And I completely understand if this is too much. If it freaks you out, trust me, I get it. I felt his hands on my cheeks then, gently pushing my head higher, forcing me to meet his gaze. Chloe, he said softly, it's not too much. I love you. Daniel then went on to tell me that he understood my pain, not in the artificial way friends and family claim to know what you're going through, but really understood it. He had lost his sister when he was 17. She had gone missing too the same year as the Bro Bridge girls. For one horrifying second, my father's face flashed through my mind. Had he killed outside of town? Had he traveled an hour away into Baton Rouge and murdered here, too? I thought briefly of Tara King, the other missing girl who was not like the rest. The break in the pattern. The one that didn't fit. Still a mystery, decades later. And although Daniel shook his head, he provided little explanation other than her name. Sophie. She was 13. What happened? I finally asked, my voice a distant whisper. I had been praying for a resolution, for concrete evidence that my father couldn't have possibly been involved. But I never got it. We don't really know, he had said. That's the worst part. She was at a friend's house one night and was walking home in the dark. It was only a few blocks. She did it all the time. And nothing bad had ever happened until that night. 
I nodded, imagining Sophie walking alone down an old abandoned road. I had no idea what she looked like, so her face was blacked out. It was just a body, a girl's body, Lena's body. My skin is scalding now, an unnatural bright red as my toes find their way to the bath mat. I wrap myself in a towel and walk into my closet, my fingers flipping between a handful of button-up blouses before selecting a hanger at random and hooking it on the doorknob. I drop my towel and start to dress, remembering Daniel's words. I love you. I had no idea how starved I had been for those words, how glaringly absent they had been from my life up until that moment. When Daniel had said them only a month into our courtship, for a fleeting second I had racked my brain to try to remember the last time I had heard them, the last time they had been uttered to me and me alone. I couldn't remember. I walk into the kitchen and pour a cup of coffee into my to-go mug, scratching my fingers through my still damp hair, trying to dry the strands. You would think that strange coincidence between Daniel and me would have wedged distance between us. My father was a taker, and his sister had been taken. But it did the opposite. It brought us closer, gave us an unspoken bond. It made Daniel possessive of me almost, but in a good way, a caring way. The same way Cooper is possessive, I suppose, because they both understand the inherent danger of existing as a woman. Because they both understand death and how quickly it can take you how unfairly it can claim possession over its next victim. And they both understand me. They understand why I am the way I am. I walk toward the door with my coffee in one hand and purse in the other, stepping outside into the humid morning air. It's amazing what a single text message from Daniel can do to me, how thinking about him can alter my entire mood, my outlook on life, I feel invigorated as if the shower water had washed not only the dirt from my nails, but the memories that had come with it. For the first time since seeing Aubrey Gravino's picture on my TV screen, that sense of impending dread that has been hovering over me has all but evaporated. I'm starting to feel normal. I'm starting to feel safe. I get into my car and crank the engine. The drive to work is automatic. I keep the radio off, knowing I'll be too tempted to flip to the news and listen to the grisly details of Aubrey's recovered body. I don't need to know that. I don't want to know that. I imagine it's front page news. Avoiding it will be impossible. But for now, I want to stay clean. I pull into my office and swing open the front door, the light from inside indicating that my receptionist has already arrived. I walk into the lobby and turn toward the center of the room, expecting to see the regular venti Starbucks cup perched on top of her desk, hear her sing-song voice greeting me hello. But that's not the scene before me. Melissa, I say, stopping abruptly. She's standing in the middle of the office, her cheeks patchy and red. She's been crying. Is everything okay? She shakes her head no, buries her face into her hands. I hear a sniffle before she starts wailing into her palms, the tears dripping to the ground from between her fingers. It's so awful, she says, shaking her head over and over again. Did you see the news? I exhale, relax slightly. She's talking about Aubrey's body. For a second, I'm irritated. I don't want to talk about this right now. I want to move on. I want to forget. I keep walking, pushing toward my closed office door. I did, I say, inserting my keys into the lock. You're right, it's awful. But at least her parents have some closure now. She lifts her head from her hands and stares at me, her face confused. Her body, I clarify. At least they found it. That's not always the case. Melissa knows about my father, my history. She knows about the Brobridge girls and how those parents weren't lucky enough to get their bodies back. If murder was judged on a sliding scale, presumed dead would be the furthest to the end. There's nothing worse than a lack of answers, a lack of closure, a lack of certainty despite all the evidence pointing squarely in the face of the horrible reality you know in your heart to be true. But without a body, can't possibly prove. There's always that shred of doubt, that sliver of hope. 
but false hope is worse than no hope at all. Melissa sniffs again. What? What are you talking about? Aubrey Gravino, I say, my tone harsher than I intend it to be. They found her body on Saturday in Cypress Cemetery. I'm not talking about Aubrey, she says slowly. I turn toward her, my face the one twisted now. My key is still stuck in the lock, but I haven't turned it yet. Instead, my arm hangs limp in the air. She walks to the coffee table and grabs a black remote, pointing it to the television mounted on the wall. I usually keep the TV off during office hours, but now she turns it on, the black screen coming alive to reveal another bright red headline. Breaking. Second Baton Rouge girl goes missing. Above the marquee of scrolling information is the face of another teen girl. I take in her features, sandy blonde hair obscuring her blue eyes and white lashes, muted freckles cascading across her pale porcelain skin. I'm mesmerized by her perfectly clear complexion. Her skin looks like a doll's, untouchable. When the air exits my lungs and my arm falls to my side, I recognize her now. I know this girl. I'm talking about Lacey, she says, a tear gliding down her cheek as she stares into the eyes of the girl who sat in this very lobby three days ago. Lacey Deckler is missing. Chapter 13 Robin McGill was my father's second girl, his sequel. She was quiet, reserved, pale, and rail thin, with hair the color of a fiery sunset, something of a walking matchstick. She was not like Lena in any conceivable manner, but that didn't matter. It didn't save her. Because three weeks after Lena went missing, Robin did too. The fear that followed Robin's disappearance had doubled in size from the fear that followed Lena's. When a single girl goes missing, you can blame it on a lot of things. Maybe she was playing by the bog and slipped underwater, her body pulled down by the jaws of a creature lurking somewhere beneath the surface. A tragic accident, but not murder. Maybe it was a crime of passion. Maybe she pissed off one too many boys. Or maybe she got pregnant and ran, a theory that had floated through town as thick and foul as marsh fog, up until the day Robin's face started appearing on the TV screen. And everybody knew Robin didn't get pregnant and run. Robin was smart. She was bookish. Robin kept to herself and never wore a dress shorter than mid-calf. Until Robin's disappearance, I had actually believed those theories. A runaway teen didn't seem that unlikely, especially for Lena. Besides, it had happened before. It had happened with Tara. In a town like Bro Bridge, murder seemed far more outlandish. But when two girls go missing within the course of a month, it's not a coincidence. It's not an accident. It's not circumstance. It's calculated and cunning and far more terrifying than anything we had ever experienced before. Anything we thought possible. Lacey Deckler's disappearance is not a coincidence. I know it in my bones. I know it the way I knew it 20 years ago when I saw Robin's face on the news. Right now, standing in my office with my eyes glued to the television screen as Lacey's freckled face stares back, I might as well be 12 again, getting off the school bus from summer camp as dusk approaches, running down that old dusty road. I see my father crouching for me on the porch. I'm running toward him when I should have been running away. Fear grips me like a squeezing hand against my throat. Someone is out there. Again. Are you okay? Melissa's voice shakes me from my stupor. She's looking at me, a worried expression cloaking her features. You're looking kind of pale. I'm fine, I say, nodding my head. It's just memories, you know? She nods. She knows not to press it. Can you cancel my appointments today? I ask. Then you can head home. Get some rest. She nods again, looking relieved, before shuffling behind her desk and picking up her headset. I turn back toward the television and raise the remote to the air, turning up the volume. 
The anchor's voice fills the room like a gradient, soft to loud. For those of you just tuning in, we have gotten word that another girl from the Baton Rouge, Louisiana area has been reported missing, the second in just one week. Again, we have confirmed that two days after the body of 15-year-old Aubrey Gravino was found in Cypress Cemetery on Saturday, June 1st, another girl has been reported missing. This time, it's 15-year-old Lacey Deckler, also from Baton Rouge. Our very own Angela Baker is live now at Baton Rouge Magnet High School. Angela? The camera cuts away from the news desk, and Lacey's picture disappears from the screen. I'm now staring at a high school situated mere blocks from my office. The reporter on camera nods along, her finger pushed to her earpiece before she begins to speak. Thank you, Dean. I'm here at Baton Rouge Magnet High School, where Lacey Deckler is currently wrapping up her freshman year. Lacey's mother, Janine Deckler, told authorities that she picked her daughter up from this school on Friday afternoon after track practice before bringing her to an appointment just a few blocks away. My breath catches in my throat. I glance over to Melissa to see if she registered the comment, but she isn't listening. She's on the phone, tapping away on her laptop as she reschedules the day's appointments. I feel bad for canceling an entire day on her like this, but I can't imagine seeing clients right now. It wouldn't be fair charging them for my time when they wouldn't be getting it. Not really, because my mind would be elsewhere. It would be on Aubrey and Lacey and Lena. I glance back to the TV. After her appointment, Lacey was supposed to walk to a friend's house where she was to be spending the weekend, but she never arrived. The camera cuts now to a woman identified as Lacey's mother. She's crying into the lens, explaining how she just thought Lacey had turned off her phone, as she sometimes does. She's not like the other kids glued to their Instagram. Lacey needs to disconnect sometimes. She's sensitive. She's recounting how the discovery of Aubrey's body had been the catalyst she needed to officially report her daughter as missing, and in classic female fashion, she feels the need to be defensive, to prove to the world that she's a good mother, an attentive mother, that this isn't her fault. I'm listening to her sobs. Never in my wildest dreams would I have thought that something had happened to her, otherwise of course I would have reported it earlier. When the realization hits me, Lacey left her appointment on Friday afternoon, her appointment with me, and never made it to her next destination. She stepped out my front door and vanished, which means that this office, my office, is the last place she would have been seen alive. And I'm the last person who would have seen her. Dr. Davis? I turn around. The voice doesn't belong to Melissa, who's standing behind her desk, staring at me, clutching her headset around her neck. It's deeper, a male voice. My eyes dart to my doorframe, and I register the pair of police officers standing just outside my office. I swallow. Yes? They step inside in unison, and the one on the left, the smaller of the two, raises his arm to reveal a badge. My name is Detective Michael Thomas, and this is my colleague, Officer Colin Doyle, he says, jerking his head to the large man standing to his right. We'd like to have a few words with you about the disappearance of Lacey Deckler. Chapter 14 The police station was warm, uncomfortably warm. I remember the miniature fans positioned all around the sheriff's office, the stale, recycled air blowing in every conceivable direction, the post-it notes stuck to his desk flapping in the warm breeze, wisps of my baby hair dancing in the crossfire, tickling my cheek. I watched the beads of moisture drip down Sheriff Dooley's neck, soaking into his collar and leaving a dark, wet stain. The first day of fall had come and gone, but still the heat was oppressive. Chloe, honey? My mother said, squeezing my fingers in her sweaty palm. Why don't you show the sheriff what you showed me this morning? I looked down at the box in my lap, avoiding eye contact. I didn't want to show him. I didn't want him to know what I knew. I didn't want him to see the things that I had seen, the things in this box, because once he did, it would all be over. Everything would change. Chloe, 
I looked up at the sheriff, leaning toward me from across his desk. His voice was deep, stern, but somehow sweet at the same time, probably from the unmistakable southern drawl that made every word sound thick and slow like dripping molasses. He was eyeing the box in my lap, the old wooden jewelry box my mother used to keep her diamond earrings and grandma's old brooches in before my father had bought her a new one last Christmas. It had a ballerina inside that twirled when the lid opened, dancing to a rhythm of delicate chimes. It's okay, sweetheart, he said. You're doing the right thing. Just start from the beginning. Where did you find the box? I was bored this morning, I said, holding it close to my stomach, my fingernail chipping away at a splinter in the wood. It's still so hot, I didn't want to go outside, so I decided to play with some makeup, mess around with my hair, that kind of thing. My cheeks reddened and both my mother and the sheriff pretended not to notice. I had always been something of a tomboy, always preferring to rough house with Cooper in the yard over brushing my hair. But ever since that day with Lena, I had started to notice things about myself that I had never noticed before. Things like the way my collarbones popped when I pinned my bangs back, or how my lips seemed juicier when I slathered them in vanilla gloss. I released the box then and wiped my mouth against my forearm, suddenly self-conscious that I was still wearing some. I understand, Chloe. Go on. I went into mom and dad's room, started digging around in the closet. I didn't mean to snoop. I continued looking at my mom then. Honest, I didn't. I thought I'd grab a scarf or something to tie in my hair, but then I saw your jewelry box with all of grandma's nice pins. It's okay, honey, she whispered, a tear dripping down her cheek. I'm not mad. So I grabbed it, I said, looking back down at the box, and I opened it. And what did you find inside? The sheriff asked. My lips started trembling. I hugged the box closer. I don't want to be a tattle, I whispered. I don't want to get anyone in trouble. We just need to see what's in the box, Chloe. Nobody's getting in trouble just yet. Let's see what's in the box and we can go from there. I shook my head, the severity of the situation finally settling over me. I never should have showed mom this box. I never should have said anything. I should have slammed the lid shut and pushed it back into that dusty corner and forgotten all about it. But that's not what I did. Chloe, he said, sitting up straighter. This is serious now. Your mother has made a major allegation and we need to see what's in that box. I changed my mind, I said, panicking. I think I was just confused or something. I'm sure it's nothing. You were friends with Lena Rhodes, weren't you? I bit my tongue, nodded slowly. Word travels fast in a small town. Yes, sir, I said. She was always nice to me. Well, Chloe, someone murdered that girl. Sheriff, my mom said, leaning forward. He held his arm out and continued to stare in my direction. Someone murdered that girl and dumped her somewhere so terrible we haven't even been able to find her yet. We haven't been able to find her body and return her to her parents. What do you think about that? I think it's horrible, I whispered, a tear slipping down my cheek. I do too, he said. But that's not all. When this person was done with Lena, he didn't stop there. This same person murdered five more girls. And maybe he'll murder five more before the year is over. So if you know something about who this person may be, we need to know it, Chloe. We need to know it before he does it again. I don't want to show you anything that could get my dad in trouble, I said, tears streaming down my cheeks. I don't want you to take him away. The sheriff settled back into his chair, his eyes sympathetic. He was quiet for a minute before leaning forward and opening his mouth again. Even if it could save a life? I glance up at the two men sitting before me now, Detective Thomas and Officer Doyle. They're in my office, seated in the lounge chairs usually reserved for patients, staring at me, waiting waiting for me to say something, just like Sheriff Dooley had been waiting on me 20 years ago. I'm sorry, 
I say, sitting up a little straighter in my chair. I got lost in thought for a second there. Can you repeat the question? The men glance at each other before Detective Thomas pushes a photograph across my desk. Lacey Dickler, he says, tapping the image. Does the name or image ring a bell? Yes, I say. Yes, Lacey is a new patient. I saw her Friday afternoon. Judging by the news, I imagine that's probably why you're here. That would be correct, Officer Doyle says. This is the first time I've heard the officer speak and my neck snaps in his direction. I recognize his voice. I've heard it before, that raspy, strangled sound. I heard it just this weekend in the cemetery. It's the same officer who came running over when we found Aubrey's earring. The same officer who snatched it out of my hand. Lacey left your office around what time Friday afternoon? She, uh, she was my last appointment, I say, peeling my eyes from Officer Doyle and directing them back to the detective. So I imagine she left around 6.30. Did you see her leave? Yes, I say. Well, no, I saw her leave my office, but I didn't see her leave the building. The officer looks at me quizzically as if he recognizes me, too. So, for all you know, she never left the building? I think it's safe to assume she left the building, I say, swallowing my annoyance. Once you leave the lobby, there isn't really anywhere left to go but out. There's a janitor's closet that's always locked from the outside and a small bathroom by the front door. That's it. The men nod, seemingly satisfied. What did you talk about during your appointment? The detective asks. I can't tell you that, I say, shifting in my chair. The relationship between psychologist and patient is strictly confidential. I don't share anything my clients tell me within these walls. Even if it could save a life? I feel a punch in my chest like the wind has been knocked straight from my lungs. The missing girls, the police asking questions. It's too much, too similar. I blink hard trying to shake the bright light that's surging through my peripheral vision. For a second, I think I might faint. I'm, I'm sorry, I stutter. What did you just say? If Lacey told you anything during your session on Friday that could potentially save her life, would you tell it? Yes, I say, my voice shaking. I glance down at my desk drawer, at my sanctuary of pills just barely out of reach. I need one. I need one now. Yes, of course I would. If she had told me anything that raised even the slightest suspicion that she was in danger, I would tell you. So what did she come into a therapist's office then, if there wasn't anything wrong? I'm a psychologist, I say, my fingers quivering. It was our first appointment together. It was very introductory, just getting to know each other. She has some family issues that she needs help dealing with. Family issues, Officer Doyle repeats. He's still looking at me suspiciously, or at least I think he is. Yes, I say, and I'm sorry, but that's really all I can tell you. I stand up, a nonverbal cue that it's time for them to leave. I was at the crime scene where Aubrey's body was found. This very officer walked up on me holding a piece of evidence for Christ's sake, and now I'm the last person Lacey saw before her disappearance. These two coincidences, paired with my last name, would put me squarely in the center of this investigation, somewhere I desperately don't want to be. I glance around my office, looking for any clues that could give away my identity, my past, I keep no personal mementos here, no pictures of family, no allusions to Brobridge. They have my name and only my name. But if they wanted to know more, that would be enough. They look at each other again and stand in unison, the screech of their chairs making my arm hair bristle. Well, Dr. Davis, we appreciate your time, Detective Thomas says, nodding his head. And if you think of anything that may be pertinent to our investigation, anything at all that you think we should know. I'll tell you, I say, smiling politely. They walk toward the door, opening it wide before peering out into the now empty lobby. Officer Doyle turns around, hesitates. I'm sorry, Dr. Davis, one more thing, he says. You look so familiar and I can't seem to place it. Have we met before? No. I say, crossing my arms. No, I don't believe so. Are you sure? I'm pretty sure, I say. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a day full of appointments. My nine o'clock should be here any minute.
Chapter 15 I step into my lobby, the quiet stillness amplifying the sound of my own breath. Detective Thomas and Officer Doyle have left. Melissa's purse is gone, her computer black. The TV is still blaring, Lacey's face haunting the room with her invisible presence. I lied to Officer Doyle. We have met before, in Cypress Cemetery, as he lifted the earring of a dead girl out of my palm. I also lied about having appointments today. Melissa cleared them, I explicitly asked her to, and now it's 9.15 on a Monday morning and I have nothing to do but sit in an empty office and let the darkness of my own thoughts devour me whole before regurgitating my bones. But I know I can't do that. Not again. I hold my phone in my palm thinking about who I can talk to, who I can call. Cooper is out of the question. He would worry too much, ask me questions that I don't want to answer, jump to conclusions that I'm actively trying to avoid. He would look at me with concern, his eyes flickering to my desk drawer and back up again, silently wondering what kind of remedies I have in there, hidden in the dark, what kind of twisted thoughts they're creating swirling in my mind. No, I need calm, rational, reassuring. My next thought is Daniel, but he's at a conference. I can't bother him with this. It's not that he would be too busy to listen to me. That's the opposite of the problem. It's that he would drop everything and rush to my aid, and I can't let him do that. I can't drag him into this. Besides, what is this, anyway? It's nothing more than my own memories, my own unresolved demons bubbling to the surface. There's nothing he could do to fix the problem, nothing he could say to me that hasn't been said before. That's not what I need right now. I just need someone to listen. My head jerks up. Suddenly, I know where I need to go. I grab my purse and keys, locking my office door before jumping back in my car and heading south. Within minutes, I'm pulling past a sign that reads Riverside Assisted Living, a familiar collection of pollen-colored buildings looming in the distance. I always assumed the color choice was meant to mirror sunshine, happiness, feel good things like that. At one point, I actually believed it, convincing myself that a paint color could artificially lift the mood of the residents trapped inside. But the once bright yellow is faded now, the sighting perpetually discolored with the merciless effects of weather and age, missing blinds turning the windows into gap-toothed grins, weeds peeking through the sidewalk cracks like they too are struggling to escape. I approach the buildings now and I no longer see sunshine gleaming back in my direction, the color of warmth and energy and cheer. Instead, I see neglect, like a stained bedsheet or the yellowing of forgotten teeth. If I were a patient, I already know what I'd say to myself. You are projecting, Chloe. Is it possible that you sense neglect in these buildings because you feel as if you've neglected someone inside? Yes, yes, I know the answer is yes, but that doesn't make it any easier. I swerve into a parking spot near the entrance and slam my door a little too hard before walking through the automatic entryway and arriving in the lobby. Well, hello there, Chloe. I turn toward the front desk and smile at the woman waving in my direction. She's big, busty, her hair pulled back into a tight bun, her pattern scrubs faded and soft. I wave back before leaning my arms against the counter. Hey, Martha, how are you today? Oh, not bad, not bad. You here to see your mama? Yes, ma'am, I smile. It's been a while, she says as she pulls out the guest book and pushes it in my direction. There's judgment in her tone, but I try to ignore it. Instead, I look down at the book. The page is fresh, and I write my name in the top spot, noticing the date in the upper right-hand corner, Monday, June 3rd. I swallow hard, trying to ignore the pinch in my chest. I know, I say at last. I've been busy, but that's no excuse. I should have come sooner. The wedding's coming up now, isn't it? Next month, I say. Can you believe it? Good for you, honey, good for you. I know your mama's happy for you. I smile again, grateful for the lie. I'd like to think my mom is happy for me, but the truth is, it's impossible to tell. Go ahead, she says, pulling the book back into her lap. You know the way, 
A nurse should be in there with her. Thanks, Martha. I turn around and face the interior of the lobby. There are three hallways, all jutting out in different directions. The hallway to my left leads to the cafeteria and kitchen, where residents are served from vats of various mass-produced meals at the same time every day. Walks full of watery scrambled eggs, spaghetti with meat sauce, poppy seed chicken casseroles served with wilted lettuce drowning in salty salad dressing. The one in the middle leads to the living room, a wide open area with televisions and board games and surprisingly comfortable lounge chairs that I have fallen asleep in more than once. I take the hallway to the right, the hallway littered with bedrooms, hallway number three, and walk down the endless stretch of marbled linoleum until I reach room 424. Knock, knock, I say, tapping on the partially cracked open door. Mom? Come in, come in, we're just getting cleaned up in here. I peek into the bedroom and catch a glimpse of my mother for the first time in a month. As always, she looks the same, but different. The same as she has looked for the last 20 years, but different from the way my mind still chooses to remember her. Young, beautiful, full of life. Colorful sundresses that grazed her tanned knees, her long, wavy hair clipped back at the sides, her cheeks flushed from the summer heat. Now I see her pale, frail legs peeking out from behind the opening of a robe as she perches in her wheelchair, expressionless. The nurse is brushing her hair, now cut to her shoulders, as she stares out a window overlooking the parking lot. Hey, Mom, I say, moving closer. I sit on the side of the bed and smile. Good morning. Good morning, honey, the nurse says. This one is new. I don't recognize her. She seems to sense that and continues talking. My name's Cheryl. Your mama and I have been getting close over these last few weeks, haven't we, Mona? She taps my mother's shoulder and smiles, brushes a few more times before placing the comb on her bedside table and wheeling her around to face me. My mother's face still comes as a shock, even after all these years. She isn't disfigured or anything. She isn't maimed beyond recognition. But she is different. The little things that made her, her, have changed. Her once perfectly manicured eyebrows are overgrown, giving her face a more masculine appearance. Her skin is waxy and devoid of all makeup, her hair washed with cheap store-brand shampoo that leaves the ends wiry and wild. And her neck. That long, thick scar that still rests across her neck. I'll leave y'all to it, Cheryl says, walking toward the door. If you need anything, just holler. Thank you. I am alone with my mother now, her eyes boring into mine, and those feelings of neglect come raging back. Mom was placed in a home in Bro Bridge after her suicide attempt. We were still too young to care for her ourselves. At 12 and 15, we were sent to live with an aunt on the outskirts of town. But the plan was to take her out when we could, care for her when we could. Then Cooper turned 18, and it was clear that she couldn't go with him. He couldn't stay put for long enough, couldn't sit still. She needed routine, clean, simple routine. So we decided to move her to Baton Rouge when I got into LSU, and I would take over after I finished college. But then we came up with excuses for that, too. How would I get my PhD caring for a dependent and disabled mother? How would I ever meet someone, date someone, get married? Although I had been doing a pretty good job of sabotaging my chances of that without her help anyway. So we kept her here in Riverside, still telling ourselves it was temporary. After graduation, after we had enough savings, after I opened my own practice. The years stretched on and we quieted our guilt by visiting every weekend. Then we started taking turns, Cooper and I, going every other week, rushing through each visit, checking our phones because we crammed it between other obligations. Now we mostly visit when the nurses call and ask us to. They're good people, but I'm sure they talk about us when we're not around. Judge us for abandoning our mother, leaving her fate in the hands of strangers. But what they don't understand is that she abandoned us, too. Sorry I haven't come to visit in a while, I say, my eyes searching her face for any sign of movement, 
any sign of life. The wedding's in July, so we've got a lot of last-minute planning to do. The silence between us stretches out, lazy, though I'm used to it by now. Talking to myself, I know she won't respond. I promise I'll bring Daniel by to meet you soon, I say. You'd like him. He's a really good guy. She blinks a few times, taps her finger against her armrest. My eyes dart over to her hand. Staring, I ask again, would you like to meet him? She taps her finger again, gently, and I smile. I found our mother sprawled across the floor of her bedroom closet shortly after dad was sentenced. The closet where I found that box. That box that sealed his fate. The poetic symbolism was not lost on me, even at 12. She had tried to hang herself using one of his leather belts until the wooden beam snapped, sending her crashing to the ground. By the time I had found her, her face was purple, her eyes bulging, her legs twitching. I remember screaming for Cooper, screaming for him to say something, to do something. I remember him standing in the hallway, stunned, motionless, do something, I screamed again, and I had watched him blink, shake his head, then run into the closet and attempt to perform CPR. At some point, it dawned on me to call 911, so I did. And we were able to save some of her, just not all of her. She was in a coma for a month. Cooper and I weren't old enough to make any medical decisions, so that decision rested on our father from prison. He didn't want to pull the plug. He wasn't able to come visit her, but her condition was made clear. She would never be able to walk again, talk again, do anything on her own again. But still, he refused to give up on her. That poetic symbolism wasn't lost on me either. That he spent his days outside of a cell taking lives, but once he was incarcerated, he was apparently determined to save them. We watched for weeks on end as our mother lay motionless in a hospital bed, her chest rising and falling with the help of a machine, until one morning she made a movement on her own. Her eyes fluttered open. She never regained movement. She never regained speech. She had suffered from anoxia, a severe lack of oxygen to the brain, which left her in what the doctors call a minimally conscious state. They used words like extensive and irreversible. She's not all there, but she's not gone either. The depths of her understanding are still murky. Some days when I find myself rambling on about my life or Cooper's, about all the things we've seen and done in the years since she decided we were no longer important enough to stay alive for, I can see a flicker in her eyes that tells me that she hears me. She understands what I'm saying. She's sorry. Then other times when I look into her inky black pupils, nothing stares back but my own reflection. Today is a good day. She hears me. She understands. She can't communicate verbally, but she can move her fingers. I've learned through the years that a tap means something. Her version of a head nod, I think. A subtle indication that she's following along. Or maybe that's just my own wishful thinking. Maybe it means nothing at all. I look at my mother, a living, breathing embodiment of the pain my father has caused. If I'm being honest with myself, that's the real reason I've left her here for all these years. It's a big responsibility, yes, caring for a person with a disability as severe as hers. But I could do it if I really wanted to. I have the money to hire help, maybe even get a live-in nurse. The truth is... I don't want to. I can't imagine looking into her eyes every day and being forced to relive the moment we found her over and over and over again. I can't imagine allowing the memories to come flooding into my home, the one place I've tried so hard to maintain some semblance of normalcy. I abandoned my mother because it's easier this way. Just like I abandoned our childhood home, refusing to dig through our belongings and relive the horrors that took place there, instead just letting it sit and rot as if refusing to acknowledge its existence would somehow make it less real. I'll bring him by before the wedding, I say, actually meaning it this time. 
I want Daniel to meet my mother, and I want my mother to meet him. I rest my hand on her leg. It's so frail I almost recoil, twenty years of immobility deteriorating the muscles and leaving nothing but skin and bone. But I force myself to hold it there, squeezing her gently. But actually, Mom, that's not what I wanted to talk about. That's not why I'm here. I look down at my lap, knowing full well that once the words escape my lips, I can't reel them back in, swallow them back down. They'll be trapped inside the mind of my mother, a locked box with a missing key. And once they're in there, she won't be able to get them out. She won't be able to talk about it, verbalize it, get it off her chest the way that I can, the way that I am right here, right now. Suddenly, it feels incredibly selfish. But I can't help myself. I say it anyway. There are more missing girls. Dead girls. Here, in Baton Rouge. I think I see her eyes widen, but then again, I could be wishing. They found the body of a 15-year-old in Cypress Cemetery on Saturday. I was there, with the search party. They found her earring. Then this morning, another one was reported missing. Another 15-year-old. And this time... I know her. She's a patient of mine. Silence settles over the room, and for the first time since I was twelve, I yearn for my mother's voice. I desperately need her practical yet protective words to drape over my shoulders like a blanket in winter, keeping me safe, keeping me warm. This is serious, honey, but just be careful. Be vigilant. It feels familiar. I say, gazing out the window. Something about it all just feels, I don't know, the same. It's like I'm having deja vu. The police came to speak with me at my office, and it reminded me of... I stop, look at my mother, wonder if she too can still remember our conversation in Sheriff Dooley's office. The humid air, the post-it notes flicking in the breeze, the wooden box resting on my lap. Entire conversations are bubbling back to the surface, I say, like I'm having the exact same ones all over again. But then I think about the last time I felt this way. I stop again, remembering that this memory is one my mother certainly doesn't share. She doesn't know about the last time, the time in college when the memories came flooding back again, memories so realistic that I couldn't separate the past from the present, the then from the now the real from the imagined. With the anniversary coming up, I know I'm probably just being paranoid, I say. You know, more than usual, I mean. I laugh, lifting my arm from her leg to stifle the noise. My hand brushes up against my cheek, and I feel wetness, a tear running down my face. I hadn't realized I was crying. Anyway, I just needed to say it out loud, I guess. Say it to someone to help me hear how stupid it sounds. I wipe the tear from my cheek and rub my hand against my pants. God, I'm glad I came to you before I said it to anyone else. I don't know what I'm so worried about. Dad's in prison. It's not like he can be involved or anything. My mother stares at me, her eyes filled with questions I know she wants to ask. I glance down at her hand, at the imperceptible twitch of her fingers. I'm back! My body jumps as I twist around to face the voice behind me. It's Cheryl standing in the doorframe. I lift my hand to my chest and exhale. I didn't mean to scare you, baby, she laughs. Y'all having a good time? Yes, I say, nodding. I glance at my mother. Yes, it's nice catching up. You're just getting all kinds of visitors this week, aren't you, Mona? I smile, relieved to hear that Cooper made good on his promise to visit. When did my brother swing by? No, not your brother, Cheryl says. She walks behind my mother and puts her hands on the back of her wheelchair, her foot releasing the brake on her wheels. It was another man, a family friend, he said he was. I look at her, my eyebrows furrowed. What other man? Kind of trendy looking, not from around here. Said he was visiting from the city. Something in my chest squeezes. Brown hair? I ask. Tortoiseshell glasses? Cheryl snaps before pointing her finger at me. That's the one. I stand up, grabbing my purse from the bed. 
I have to go, I say, walking briskly over to my mom and hugging her around the neck. I'm sorry, mom, for everything. I run out her open door and down the long hallway, the anger in my chest building with every strike of the heel. How dare he? How dare he? I reach the front desk and slam into the counter, panting. I have an idea who this mystery visitor may be, but I need to know for sure. Martha, I need to see the guest book. You already said it, sweetie. Remember when you came in? No, I need to see past visitors from this weekend. I'm not sure I can let you do that, honey. Someone in this building let a man in to see my mother who is not authorized. He said he's a family friend, but he is not a friend. He's dangerous, and I need to know if he was here. Dangerous? Sweetheart, we don't let people in who aren't. Please, I say. Please, just let me look. She stares at me for a second before leaning over and grabbing the book from her desk. She slides it across the counter, and I whisper a thank you before flipping through old pages filled with signatures. I come across yesterday's section, the day I spent wasting away on my living room couch, and skim down the list of names, my heart stopping when I glimpse the one I was desperately hoping not to see. There, in messy script, is the proof I have been looking for. Aaron Jansen was here. Chapter 16 The phone rings twice before that familiar voice greets me. Aaron Jansen? You asshole, I say, not bothering with an introduction. I'm storming through the parking lot in the direction of my car. I had called into my office voicemail the second I handed over the guest book and replayed Aaron's last message to me from Friday night. You can call me back directly on this number. Chloe Davis, he responds, the hint of a smile in his voice. I thought I might hear from you today. You visited my mother? You had no right. I told you I'd be reaching out to your family in my voicemail. I gave you fair warning. No, I say, shaking my head. No, you said my father. I don't give a fuck about my father, but my mother is off limits. Let's meet. Obviously, I'm in town. I'll explain everything. Fuck you, I spit. I am not meeting with you. What you did was unethical. You really want to talk to me about ethics? I stop, inches from my parked car. What's that supposed to mean? Just meet me today. I'll make it quick. I'm busy, I lie, unlocking my car and easing inside. I have appointments. I'll come to your office then. I'll wait in the lobby until you have an opening. No, I exhale, closing my eyes. I lean my forehead against the steering wheel. This back and forth is pointless, I realize. He's not going to give up. He flew to Baton Rouge from New York City to meet with me, and if I want this man to stop digging around in my life, I'm going to have to speak with him, face to face. No, please don't do that. I'll meet you, okay? I'll meet you right now. Where do you want to go? It's still early, he says. How about coffee? My treat. There's a place on the river, I say, pinching the skin between my eyes. Brew house. Meet me there in 20 minutes. I hang up on him before slamming my car into reverse and driving in the direction of the Mississippi. I'm only 10 minutes from the cafe, but I want to make it there before him. I want to be sitting at the table of my choosing the moment he walks through the doors. I want to be in the driver's seat for this conversation, not riding along as a powerless passenger, not on the defensive, caught off guard the way I was just now. I pull into a nearby spot and duck into the little cafe, a hidden gem on River Road, partially cloaked by live oaks dripping in gray-green foliage. It's dim inside, and I order a latte, my eyes landing on a bulletin board of flyers by the cream and sugar stand. Wedged between violin lessons being advertised with those little paper flaps and an upcoming concert poster is Lacey Deckler's face, missing, scrawled across the top in Sharpie. It's stapled on top of another piece of the paper, the corners peeking out. I reach over and push the picture aside with my finger, revealing Aubrey's poster behind it. Already, she's been replaced, taped over like a broken vending machine. I slide into a table in the corner, choosing the seat that faces the front door. My fingers tap anxiously against the rim of my mug, and I force myself to hold them still, despite the nervous energy radiating from my every pore. Then, I wait. Fifteen minutes later, my latte is cold. I consider getting up to ask them to reheat it, 
But before I can move, I see Aaron walk in. I recognize him immediately from his picture online. He's wearing another checkered button-up shirt, the same stupid blue blocker glasses, though he's not as skinny as he was in his headshot. He fills out his clothes more than I had expected him to, his leather computer bag hanging heavy over one shoulder, pulling the fabric tight against a bicep I was not expecting to see. I wonder how long ago that picture was taken, immediately after college, I suppose, when he was still just a boy. I continue to stare, watching him amble through the cafe, browsing the pastry cooler and squinting at the menu bolted behind the coffee bar. He orders a cappuccino and pays with cash, lazily licking his fingers before counting out the bills and dropping his change in the tip jar. Then he eyes the artwork on the wall while he waits for his espresso to brew, the scream of the steamer making my skin crawl. For some reason, his calmness is bothering me. I was expecting him to run inside, eager to beat me the way I was eager to beat him. I wanted him panting, sweaty, playing catch-up, thrown off guard by my waiting. But instead, he shows up late. He's acting like he has all the time in the world. He's acting like he's the one calling the shots. And that's when I realize. He knows I'm here. He knows I'm watching. This calm demeanor, this careless attitude. It's a show put on just for me. He's trying to unnerve me, to get under my skin. The thought pisses me off more than it should. Aaron, I yell, waving my hand too animatedly. He jerks his head up and looks in my direction. I'm over here. Chloe, hi, he says, smiling. He walks over to the table and puts his bag on the chair. Thank you for meeting me. It's Dr. Davis, I say, and you didn't give me much of a choice. He grins. I'm just waiting on my cappuccino, he says. Can I buy you anything? No, I say, motioning to the mug in my hands. I'm good, thanks. You've been here long? He asks. Your drink looks cold. I eye him, wondering how he could possibly know that. I must look confused because I see him smirk just slightly before motioning to the condensation beating along the inner rim of my glass. No steam. Just a couple minutes, I say. Huh, he says, eyeing my drink. Well, if you want me to have that warmed up for you. No, let's just get started. He smiles, nods, then turns back toward the bar to grab his drink. Well, it's confirmed, I think, bringing my latte to my lips and wincing at the room temperature liquid, forcing myself to drink. He's an asshole. Aaron slides into the chair opposite me and pulls a notebook from his bag as I set my mug down. I steal a glance at his press card, clipped neatly to the lip of his shirt, the New York Times logo printed large at the top. Before you start taking any notes, I need to be clear, I say. This is not an interview. This is a very frank conversation of me telling you to stop harassing my family. I hardly think calling you twice would be considered harassing. You visited my mother's assisted living home. Yeah, about that, he says, pushing his sleeves to his elbows. I was in her room for two, three minute stops. I'm sure you got some really great information, I say, glaring at him. She's a real talker, isn't she? He's silent for a while, staring at me from across the table. Honestly, I didn't realize her disability was as severe as it is. I'm sorry. I nod, satisfied with this tiny win. But talking to her isn't why I went, he says. Not really. I thought I could maybe get a little bit of information, but mostly I went because I knew it would get your attention. I knew it would force you to meet with me. And why is it that you're so desperate to meet with me? I already told you, I don't speak with my father. We don't have a relationship. I can't give you anything of value. Honestly, you're wasting your time. The story has changed, he says. That's not the angle anymore. Okay, I say, unsure of where this conversation is now headed. What's the angle, then? Aubrey Gravino, he says. And now, Lacey Deckler. I feel my heartbeat start to rise in my chest. My eyes dart around the room, though the cafe is practically empty. I lower my voice to a whisper. Why would you think I have anything to say about those girls? Because their deaths? 
I don't think it's a coincidence. I think they have something to do with your father. And I think you can help me figure out what it is. I shake my head, squeezing my hands tightly around my mug to keep them from shaking. Look, you're reaching here. I know you think this makes for a good story, but as I'm sure you know, given your beat and everything, this kind of thing happens all the time. Aaron smiles, impressed. You've researched me, he says. Well, you know everything about me. That's fair, he says. But look, Chloe, there are similarities. Similarities you can't deny. I think back to the conversation with my mother just this morning. The creeping deja vu I had just admitted to. The unsettling familiarity of it all. But this isn't the first time I've felt this way. The first time I've recreated my father's crimes in my mind. This happened once before, and last time, I was wrong. Very, very wrong. You're right, there are similarities, I say. A teenage girl got murdered by some creep roaming the streets. It's unfortunate, but like I said, it happens all the time. The 20-year anniversary is coming up, Chloe. Abductions happen all the time, but serial killers do not. There's a reason this is happening right here, right now. You know there is. Whoa, who said anything about a serial killer? You are jumping so far into that conclusion. We have one body, one. For all we know, Lacey ran away. Aaron looks at me, a flicker of disappointment in his eyes. Now he's the one who lowers his voice. You and I both know that Lacey didn't run away. I sigh, glance over Aaron's shoulder and through the window outside. The breeze is picking up, the Spanish moss swaying in the wind. I notice the sky is quickly morphing from robin's egg blue to a bloated storm gray. Even inside, I can feel the heaviness of impending rain. Lacey is staring at me from her missing poster. Her eyes followed me here to this very table. I can't bring myself to meet them. So what is it that you think is going on, exactly? I ask, still staring outside at the trees in the distance. My father is in prison. He's a monster, I'm not denying that, but he's not the boogeyman. He can't hurt anyone anymore. I know that, he says. I know it's not him, obviously, but I think it's someone trying to be him. I glance back at Aaron, gnaw at the inside of my lip. I think we're dealing with a copycat here, and I'm willing to bet that before the week is over, someone else will be dead. Chapter 17 Every serial killer has their signature like a name scrawled in the corner of a painting or an Easter egg planted in the scenes of a film, artists want their work to be recognized, immortalized, remembered beyond their years. It's not always as grisly as they portray in the movies, encrypted monikers scratched across the skin, detached body parts showing up around town. Sometimes it's as simple as the cleanliness of the crime scene or the way in which the bodies are placed on the floor. Stalking patterns strung together by unsuspecting witnesses or ritualistic procedures that occur over and over and over again until eventually a pattern emerges. A pattern that isn't too dissimilar to the way ordinary people go through their routines in a methodical rhythm each morning as if there were no other way to make a bed, to clean a dish. Human beings are habitual creatures, I've learned, and the act of taking a life can reveal a lot about a person. Each kill is unique, like a fingerprint. But my father left behind no bodies upon which he could leave his mark, no crime scenes to preserve his autograph, no fingerprints to lift or analyze, which left the town wondering, how do you leave a signature without a canvas? The answer is, you can't. The Bro Bridge Police Department spent the summer of 99 scouring Louisiana for a single clue to his identity. They listened for whispers of evidence that pointed in the direction of one viable suspect, a hidden signature at a crime scene that seemed not to exist. But, of course, they found nothing. Six girls dead and not a single witness could pinpoint a man lurking near the county pool or a car inching down the street at night, stalking its prey. In the end, I was the one who'd found the answer. 
a 12-year-old girl playing dress-up with her mother's makeup, rummaging through the back of a closet in search of scarves to tie in her hair. And it was then, holding that little wooden box when I saw it, the thing nobody else had been able to see. Instead of leaving evidence, my father was taking it. Even if it could save a life, Chloe? I watched the sweat drip down Sheriff Dooley's neck. He was staring at me with an intensity I had never seen before. He was staring at me, and he was staring at the box clutched in my hands. If you hand over that box, you could save a life. Think about that. What if someone could have saved Lena's life, but chose not to because they were afraid of stirring up trouble? I looked down at my lap nodded slightly. Then I thrust my arms forward before I had time to change my mind. The sheriff wrapped his gloved hands around mine, the rubber slippery but warm, before pulling the box gently from my grip. He looked down at the lid before placing his fingers on the lip and opening it wide, the sound of chimes filling the room. I avoided his expression, instead choosing to stare at the ballerina, twirling in slow, perfect circles. It's jewelry, I said, my eyes still on the dancing girl. It was mesmerizing, watching her spin in that faded pink tutu, her arms raised high. She reminded me of Lena, the way she twirled at the festival. I see that. Do you know who it belongs to? I nodded. I knew he was looking for more of an answer, but I couldn't bring myself to say it. Not voluntarily, at least. Who does the jewelry belong to, Chloe? I heard a sob erupt from my mother beside me, and I glanced in her direction. Her hand was clamped over her mouth, her head shaking violently. She had already seen the contents of this box. I had shown it to her, back home. I had wanted her to give me an explanation other than the one that was forming in my own mind, the only explanation that made sense. But she couldn't. Chloe. I looked back at the sheriff. The belly button ring is Lena's, I said, right there in the middle. The sheriff reached into the jewelry box and plucked out the small silver firefly. It looked dead, having spent weeks in the dark. No sunshine to fuel its glow. How do you know that? I saw Lena wearing it at the crawfish festival. She showed it to me. He nodded, lowering it back into the box. And the others? I know that pearl necklace, my mother said, her voice wet. The sheriff glanced at her before reaching into the box again and lifting up a string of pearls. They were large, pink, and tied together in the back with a ribbon. That belongs to Robin McGill. I, I saw her wearing it. At church one Sunday, I commented on how much I liked it, how unique it was. Richard was with me. He saw it too. The sheriff exhaled, nodding again before placing it back inside. Over the next hour, the rest of the jewelry would come to be identified. Margaret Walker's diamond earrings, Carrie Hollis's sterling silver bracelet, Jill Stevenson's sapphire ring, Susan Hardy's white gold hoops. There was no DNA found on anything. They had been meticulously cleaned, the box wiped down. But their parents confirmed our suspicions. They had been presents for eighth grade graduations, confirmations, birthdays. Tokens meant to celebrate the milestones of their girls growing up, instead forever memorialized by their untimely deaths. This is helpful, Chloe. Thank you. I nodded, the rhythm from the chimes soothing me into a kind of stupor. Sheriff Dooley slapped the lid closed, and I jerked my head up, the trance broken. He was staring at me again, his hand placed on top of the closed box. Did you ever witness your father interacting with Lena Rhodes or any of the other missing girls? Yes, I said, my mind flashing back to the festival, the way he was staring at her and her long, smooth stomach the way he ducked his head when he realized he was caught. I saw him watching her once at the crawfish festival when she was showing me her belly button ring. What was he doing? Just 
staring, I said. She had her shirt pulled up. She caught him looking, and she waved. My mother scoffed beside me, shook her head. Thank you, Chloe, the sheriff said. I know this wasn't easy for you, but you did the right thing. I nodded. Before we let you go, is there anything else you'd like to tell us about your father? Anything that might be important for us to know? I exhaled, held myself tightly in my own arms. It was hot in there, but suddenly I felt myself shiver. I saw him with a shovel once, I said, avoiding my mother's stare. This was news to her. He was walking across our yard, coming from the swamp behind our house. It was dark, but he was there. Everyone was silent, this new revelation settling over the room like a heavy morning fog. Where were you when you saw him? In my room. I couldn't sleep, and I have this bench right below my window where I like to read. I'm sorry I didn't say anything sooner, I said. I, I didn't know. Of course you didn't, sweetheart, Sheriff Dooley said. Of course you didn't. You've done more than enough. A roll of thunder shudders through my house now, making the wine glasses hanging upside down from our liquor cabinet rattle like chattering teeth. Another summer storm is rolling through. I can feel the electric charge in the air, taste the impending rain. Chloe, did you hear me? I glance up from my wine glass, half full of Cabernet. The memory of Sheriff Dooley's office starts melting away slowly. Instead, I see Daniel, standing at our kitchen counter, sleeves rolled up to his elbows and a butcher knife in one hand. He got back from his conference earlier this afternoon. When I arrived home from the office, I found him dancing to Louis Armstrong through the kitchen in my gingham apron, the ingredients for tonight's dinner spread across the island. The image makes me smile. Sorry, no, I say. What was that? I said you've done more than enough. I squeeze my glass a little more tightly, the delicate stem threatening to snap from the pressure between my fingers. I rack my brain trying to remember what we were just talking about. I've been so lost in thought these last few days, so consumed in memories. Especially with Daniel being gone and the house being empty, it's almost felt as if I've been living in the past again. When the words escape Daniel's lips, I can't tell if they actually came from him or if I imagined them, conjured them up from the recesses of my mind and placed them into his mouth to regurgitate back to me. I open my lips to speak, but he cuts me off. Those cops had no right to show up at your office like that, he continues, his eyes focused on the cutting board beneath him. He chops some carrots, moving the blade in quick, fluid motions before scraping them to the side of the board and moving on to the tomatoes. Thank God you didn't have any clients in there yet. That could have really hurt your reputation, you know? Oh, yeah, I say. I remember now. We had been talking about Lacey Deckler, about Detective Thomas and Officer Doyle questioning me at work. It felt like something I should tell him in case her last known location ever became public knowledge. Well, I was the last person to see her alive, I guess. She might still be alive, he says. They haven't found her body yet. It's been a week now. That's true. And the other girl, she was missing for, what, three days before they found her? Yeah, I say, swirling the wine in my glass. Yeah, three days. So it sounds like you've been following all of this then. Yeah, you know, it's been on the news, kind of hard to avoid. Even in New Orleans? Daniel keeps chopping, the tomato juice running across the cutting board and pooling onto the counter. Another roll of thunder vibrates the house. He doesn't reply. Does it sound like it could have been the same person to you? I ask, trying to keep my tone light. Do you think they're, you know, related? Daniel shrugs. I don't know he says, wiping the tomato juice off the blade with his finger before popping it into his mouth. Too early to tell, I think. So what kinds of questions did those guys ask you? Not much, really. They were trying to get me to tell them what we talked about in our session. Obviously, I wouldn't, which kind of bothered them. Good for you. They asked if I saw her leaving the building. 
Daniel glances at me, his brows furrowed. Did you? No, I say. I saw her leave my office, but I didn't see her leave the building. I mean, I assume she did. There really isn't anywhere else to go, unless she was grabbed from inside, but... I stop, look down at the ruby-red liquid coloring the sides of my glass. That seems kind of unlikely. He nods and looks back down at the cutting board before scooping up the chopped vegetables and placing them in a searing pan. The scent of garlic fills the room. Other than that, it was pretty pointless, I say. Seems to me like they don't even know where to start. A steady sheet of rain erupts outside and the house is filled with the sounds of millions of fingers tapping on the roof, eager to get in. Daniel glances out the window before walking over and cracking it open, the earthy aroma of a summer storm gushing into the kitchen, mixing with the scent of a home-cooked meal. I stare at him for a while, the way he glides around the kitchen so naturally, cracking pepper into the skillet of sautéing vegetables, rubbing Moroccan spices across a slab of pink salmon. He flings a dish towel over one husky shoulder, and my heart surges with warmth at the perfection of it all. The perfection of him. I'll never understand why he chose me, damaged Chloe. He acts as though he's loved me since the moment he met me, the moment he knew my name. But there's still so much about me that he doesn't know. So much that he doesn't understand. I think about the small pharmacy hidden in my office, my lifeline, that collection of faked prescriptions that I used his name to obtain. I think about my childhood, my past, the things I've seen, the things I've done. He doesn't know you, Chloe. I try to shake Cooper's words out of my mind, but I know he's right. Excluding my family, Daniel knows me more than anyone else in the world, but that isn't saying much. It's still surface level. It's still staged. Because I know if I were to show him all of me, if I were to show him damaged, Chloe, expose my rancid, pulsing core, he would take one whiff and recoil. He couldn't possibly like what he'd see. Enough about all of that, he says, leaning over the counter as he fills up my diminishing glass. How was the rest of your week then? Did you get any wedding planning done? I think back to Saturday morning, the morning Daniel left for New Orleans. I had intended on getting some wedding planning done. I had opened my laptop and responded to some emails before the news of Aubrey Gravino filled my living room, the memories trapping me inside my own mind like a car submerged in water. I remember leaving the house and driving mindlessly through town, coming across the search party in Cypress Cemetery, finding Aubrey's earring, leaving minutes before her body was discovered. I think about Aaron Jansen visiting my mother, the theory he shared with me that I've been actively trying to deny all week. It's Friday now. Aaron predicted another body would turn up by Monday. So far, it hasn't, and every day that goes by, a small weight is lifted from my shoulders, a moment of relief that he might be wrong. I think for a second about what I should tell Daniel, and I decide that I'm not ready for him to know me yet. Not this side of me, at least the side that self-medicates to calm my nerves, the side that joins a cemetery search party in an attempt to find the answers to questions I've been asking myself for the last 20 years. Because Daniel doesn't let me hide. He doesn't let me be afraid. He throws me surprise parties and plans a wedding in July, spitting in the face of all my irrational fears. If he knew what I had spent my week doing while he was away— drugging myself into a stupor, entertaining a reporter's fictional scenario, dragging my mother into it all despite her inability to protest, to talk back, he would be ashamed. I'm ashamed. It was fine, I say at last, taking a sip from my glass. I decided on a caramel cake. Progress, Daniel shouts before leaning farther over the counter and kissing me on the lips. I return the kiss before pulling back slightly, taking in his features. He analyzes my face, his eyes searching every surface of my skin. What is it? He asks, dipping his hand into my hair. He cradles my skull and I lean into his outstretched palm. Chloe, what's wrong? Nothing's wrong, I say, smiling. 
A band of thunder rolls gently through the room, and I feel my skin prickle. I can't tell if it's reacting to the bolt of lightning that flashes outside, or the way Daniel's fingers are caressing my neck, making slow circles in the spot of delicate skin just beneath my ear. I close my eyes. I'm just happy you're home. Chapter 18 It's still raining when I wake up, the kind of slow, lazy rain that threatens to pull you back to sleep. I lie in the dark, feeling the warmth of Daniel beside me, his bare skin pressed against mine, his breath rhythmic and slow. I listen to the drizzle outside, to the low rumbles of thunder. I close my eyes and imagine Lacey her body half buried in the mud somewhere, the rain washing away any traces of evidence that might have been left behind. It's Saturday morning, one week from the discovery of Aubrey's body, five days since the news of Lacey's disappearance and my face-to-face -face meeting with Aaron Jansen. What makes you think this is the work of a copycat? I had asked, hunched over my cold coffee. We hardly know anything about these cases at this point. The location, the timing, two 15-year-old girls who fit the profile of your father's victims showing up missing and dead weeks before the 20th anniversary of Lena Rhodes' disappearance. Not only that, but they happen in Baton Rouge, the city where Dick Davis's family now lives. Okay, but there are differences too. They never found the bodies of my dad's victims. Right, Aaron said. But I think this copycat wants the bodies to be discovered. He wants credit for his work. He dumped Aubrey in a cemetery in her last known location. It was just a matter of time before she was found. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. That doesn't sound like he's copying my dad. It sounds like he selected Aubrey at random, killed her on the spot, and left her body there in a hurry. This wasn't a calculated crime. Or the spot where he dumped her has some sort of significance. It holds special meaning. Maybe there are clues on her body that he wanted to be found. Cypress Cemetery does not hold any special meaning to my dad, I said, getting agitated. The timing of her murder, it's just a coincidence. So it's also just a coincidence that Lacey was snatched next, minutes after walking out of your office? I hesitated. I wouldn't be surprised if you've seen this guy around before, Chloe. Copycats? They copy for a reason. Maybe they revere the guy they're trying to emulate, or maybe they revile him. But either way, they copy their style. They're victims. They try to become the killer that came before them. Maybe even beat them at their own game. I raised my eyebrows, took another sip of my coffee. Copycats murder because they're obsessed with another murderer, Aaron continued, placing his arms on the table and leaning in. They know everything about them which means that this person could very well know you. He could be watching you. He could have seen Lacey walking out of your office. I'm just asking you to trust your gut here. Pay attention to what's going on and listen to your instincts. I thought back to Cypress Cemetery, to the feeling of eyes on my back as I walked to my car and drove to my office. I shifted in my chair, growing more uncomfortable by the minute. Talk of my dad always left me feeling guilt-ridden, but I could never tell where the guilt was supposed to be aimed. Did I feel guilty for betraying him, for being the sole finger pointed in his direction and locking him in a cage for the rest of his days? Or did I feel guilty for sharing his blood, his DNA, his last name? So many times when talk of my father came up, I felt the overwhelming need to apologize, I wanted to apologize to Aaron, to Lena's parents, to the town of Bro Bridge. I wanted to apologize to everyone for simply existing. There would be so much less pain in the world if Richard Davis had never been born. But he was, and because of that, so was I. I feel a movement next to me and glance over toward Daniel, lying awake and staring in my direction. He's watching me, watching my eyes flicker across the ceiling as I replay that conversation with Aaron in my mind. Good morning, he sighs, his voice thick with sleep as he wraps his arms around me and pulls me closer. His skin is warm, safe. What are you thinking about? Nothing, I say, moving deeper into his arms. 
I brush against his hips and smile, the bulge in his boxers rubbing against my leg. I twist around so I'm facing him before gripping my legs tightly around his hips, and soon we begin to make love in mutual, somnolent silence. Our bodies are pressed together, slightly damp with early morning sweat, and he kisses me hard, his tongue down my throat, his teeth on my lip. His hands start to snake across my body, up my legs and across my stomach, before passing my chest and working their way toward my throat. I continue kissing him, trying to ignore the feeling of his hands around my neck, waiting for him to move them somewhere else, anywhere else. But he doesn't. He keeps going, his hands still resting there as he pumps harder and harder, faster and faster. He starts to squeeze and I let out a scream before shooting backward, moving as far away from him as I can. What? He asks, sitting up. He's staring at me with a startled look. Did I hurt you? No, I say, my heart pounding in my chest. No, you didn't. It's just that... I look at him, at the confused look on his face, at the concern in his eyes over causing me pain, the hurt he must feel at the prospect of me physically recoiling from his touch, his fingers like matches leaving burn marks on my skin. But then I think about the way he kissed me last night in the kitchen, the way he felt the pulse beneath my jaw with his fingers, the way he grabbed my neck gently yet firmly. I lean my head back onto my pillow and sigh. I'm sorry, I say, pinching my eyes shut. I need to get out of my head. I'm just wound kind of tight right now. I'm jumpy for some reason. It's okay, he says, folding his arm around my waist. I know I've ruined the moment. His arousal is gone and mine is too. But he holds me anyway. There's a lot going on right now. I know he knows I'm thinking about Aubrey and Lacey, but neither of us mentions it. We lie in silence for a while, listening to the rain. Just as I think he might have fallen back asleep, his voice breaks into a whisper. Chloe? He asks. Mm hmm? Is there anything you want to tell me? I'm quiet, my outstretched silence telling him all he needs to know. You can talk to me, he says. About anything. I'm your fiancé. That's what I'm here for. I know, I say, and I believe him. After all, I've told Daniel all about my father, my past. But it's one thing to recount memories with detachment, relaying them as simple facts that happened and nothing more. It's another thing completely to relive them in his presence, to see the face of my dad in every darkened corner, to hear the words of my mother echoed in the voices of others. And it's even worse because this has happened before, this feeling of deja vu. I'll never forget the look on Cooper's face as he stared at me that day, years ago, as I tried to explain myself, explain my reasoning. The look of concern intermixed with genuine fear. I'm fine, I say. Really, I am. It's just a lot all at once. Those girls disappearing, my dad's anniversary coming up. My phone vibrates violently across my bedside table, the light from the screen partially illuminating our still dark bedroom. I lean on my elbow and squint at the unknown number trying to reach me. Who's that? I'm not sure, I say. It shouldn't be for work this early on a Saturday morning. Go ahead and answer it, he says, rolling over. You never know. I pick up my phone and let it vibrate in my hand before swiping the screen and lifting it to my ear. I clear my throat before answering. This is Dr. Davis. Hi, Dr. Davis. This is Detective Michael Thomas. We met at your office on Monday regarding the disappearance of Lacey Deckler. Yes, I say, glancing in Daniel's direction. He's on his phone now, scrolling through emails. I remember. How can I help you? Lacey's body was found early this morning in the alleyway behind your office. I'm sorry to have to tell you this over the phone. I gasp, my hand instinctively moving to my mouth. Daniel looks at me, lowers his phone. I shake my head silently as tears begin to well in my eyes. We need you to come down to the morgue this morning. Take a look at the body. I, um, I hesitate, unsure if I heard him correctly. I'm sorry, detective. I've only met Lacey once, 
Surely you'll want her mother to come identify her instead? I barely know her. She's been identified, he says. But since she was found right outside your office, and the last place her mother saw her was dropping her off there, it's safe to assume at this point that you were the last person to see her alive. We'd like you to take a look at her and tell us if anything seems different than it did when you saw her for your appointment, if anything looks out of place. I exhale, moving my hand from my mouth to my forehead. The room seems to be getting hotter, the rain outside louder. I really don't know how much help I can be. We were together for one hour. I barely remember what she was wearing. Everything helps, he says. Maybe the sight of her will jog your memory. The earlier you can get here, the better. I nod, agreeing before hanging up the phone and sinking back into bed. Lacey's dead, I say, not as much to Daniel as admitting it to myself. They found her outside my office. She was killed right outside my office. I was probably still upstairs. I already know where you're going with this, he says, leaning against the headboard. His hand finds mine in the sheets, and our fingers intertwine. There's nothing you could have done, Chloe. Nothing. You would have had no way of knowing. I think back to my father, that shovel slouched over one arm, an inky outline making his way through our backyard, slowly, like he had all the time in the world. Me, upstairs, curled up on my bench with that little reading light peering through a window present for the entire thing, yet completely unaware of what I was witnessing. I'm sorry I didn't say anything sooner. I, I didn't know. Had Lacey told me something that could have saved her life? Had I seen someone that day that looked suspicious, someone lingering around the office but failed to notice, just like before? Aaron's words echo through my mind. This person could very well know you. He could be watching you. I should go, I say, releasing Daniel's hand before swinging my legs out of bed. I feel exposed, sliding out of the sheets, my nakedness no longer the powerful, intimate thing it was just minutes before. Now it reeks of vulnerability, of shame. I feel Daniel's eyes watching me as I walk across the bedroom and into the bathroom, moving quickly in the dark before closing the door behind me. Chapter 19 Cause of death was strangulation. I'm hovering over Lacey's body, the pallor of her face an icy blue. The coroner stands to my left, clutching a clipboard. To my right, Detective Thomas hovers too close. I don't know what to say, so I say nothing, my eyes flickering over the girl that I had just barely known the girl who had wandered into my office one week ago and told me about her problems, her problems that she had trusted me to solve. You can tell by the bruising just there, the coroner continues, pointing to her neck with a pen. You can see the finger marks, same size and spacing as the ones found on Aubrey, same ligature marks on the wrists and ankles too. I glance at the coroner and swallow. So you're thinking they're related then? It's the same guy? That's a conversation for another time. Detective Thomas interrupts. Right now, we're focusing on Lacey. Like I said, she was found in the alley behind your office. You ever go back there? No, I say, staring down at the body before me. Her blonde hair is wet from the rain, sticking to her face like a web of spider veins. Her pale skin is even paler now, somehow, making her collection of scars even more visible those thin red slits checkered across her arms and chest and legs. No, I rarely go back there. It's really just for the garbage trucks to empty the dumpster. Everyone parks out front. He nods, exhaling loudly. We stand in silence for a minute as he allows me to take it all in, to process the grisly sight before me. I realize in this moment that although I've been surrounded by death my entire life, this is the first time I've ever actually seen a dead body. The first time I've actually looked one in the eye. I imagine I'm supposed to be remembering right now, remembering Lacey's face, the way it looked in my office that afternoon, the way it looked before this. But my mind is a blank slate. 
I can't conjure up any images of Lacey with pink skin and twitchy fingers and tears welling in her eyes as she sits in my leather recliner talking about her dad. All I can see is this Lacey, dead Lacey, Lacey on a medical table being poked at by strangers. Does anything look different to you? He asks finally, nudging me along. Missing any clothes? I really can't say, I respond, scanning her body. She's wearing a black t-shirt and faded jean shorts, dirty Converse sneakers with doodles on the sides. I try to imagine her drawing on her shoes in school, bored, passing the time with a ballpoint pen. But I can't. Like I said, I wasn't really paying attention to what she was wearing. Okay, he says. It's okay, just keep trying. Take your time. I nod, wondering if this is what Lena looked like a week after her life was taken, as she lay in a field or in a shallow grave somewhere. Before her skin peeled off and her clothes disintegrated, I wonder if she looked like this, like Lacey, pale and bloated from the hot, humid air. She talked to you about that? Detective Thomas nudges his head toward her arms, toward the tiny cuts in her skin. I nod. A little bit. How about that? He glances at the larger scar on her wrist, that thick, fleshy purple lightning bolt I had spotted days before. No, I say, shaking my head. No, we didn't get to that. Fucking shame, he says quietly. She was too young to feel pain like that. Yeah, I nod. Yeah, she was. The room is quiet for a minute, all three of us taking a moment of silence to mourn not only the violence of this girl's death, but of her life, too. Did you check the alley before? I ask. I mean, back when she was first reported missing? Detective Thomas looks at me, and I see anger flash across his face. The fact that the body of this girl was found mere feet from the place she was last seen and it took almost a week to find her doesn't look good and he knows it. Yeah, he says at last, sighing loudly. Yeah, we did. Either she was somehow missed or she was placed there later, killed in another location and moved. It's a pretty small area, I say. Narrow. The dumpster takes up most of the space. If you checked back there, I can't imagine you would have missed her. There aren't many places to hide. How do you know all this if you rarely go back there? I can see it from my lobby, I say. My window points in that direction. He stares at me for a second, and I can tell he's trying to make an assessment, determine if he's just caught me in a lie. I obviously don't have the best view, I add, trying to smile. He nods, either satisfied with my answer or filing it away to revisit at another time. That's who found her, he says at last. The garbage man. She was wedged behind the dumpster. When they lifted it up to empty it, they saw her body fall out. Then she was definitely moved, the coroner interrupts, tapping the backs of her arms. That right there is liver mortis. The pooling indicates that she died on her back, not in a seated position, or wedged anywhere. A wave of nausea rolls through my stomach, and I try to stop my eyes from scanning her body again, evaluating her wounds, but I can't. She's bruised, mostly, her pale skin looking marbled in places where I now know gravity forced the blood to settle. The coroner has mentioned ligature marks, and my eyes trace the length of her limbs, from her shoulders down to her fingertips. What else do you know? I ask. She was drugged, the coroner says. We found heavy traces of diazepam in her hair. Diazepam, that's Sibelium, right? Detective Thomas asks. I nod. Was Lacey on medication for anxiety, depression? No, I shake my head. No, I had prescribed her some, but she wasn't taking anything yet. The growth level suggests the drugs were ingested about one week ago, the coroner adds. So, at the time of her murder. Detective Thomas glances at the coroner after this new revelation, and I feel a sudden impatience reverberate through the room. How soon can you have the full autopsy? The man looks at the detective, then at me. The sooner I can get started, the sooner I can have it for you. 
I feel both men glance over at me, a nonverbal cue that I've been less than helpful. But my eyes are still glued to Lacey's arm, to the tiny cuts littering her skin, to the ligature marks on her wrist and the jagged purple scars stretching across her veins. Well, no offense, Dr. Davis, but I really didn't bring you here for small talk, Detective Thomas says. If there's nothing else that you can remember, you're free to go. I shake my head, my eyes boring into her wrist. No, I remembered something, I say, tracing the path her razor must have taken to make such a crooked mark. It must have been messy. Something about Lacey that day, something that's different. Okay, he says, shifting his weight. He eyes me carefully. Let's hear it. Her scar, I say. I noticed her scar on Friday. I noticed she was trying to cover it up with a bracelet. Wooden beads with a little silver cross on it. The detective looks down at her arm now, her wrist bare. I remember that rosary dangling there in front of her veins, maybe a reminder for the next time she felt the urge to cut into her skin. It was definitely there, on her wrist, when she was sitting in my office that afternoon, fidgeting in my leather recliner. And it was there when she got up and left, when she was grabbed outside my front door, when she was drugged, when she was killed. But now it's not. Someone took it. Chapter 20 My breath is ragged when I finally reach my car, parked outside the morgue. I'm inhaling massive, unsteady gulps of air, trying to wrap my mind around the implications of what I just saw. Lacey's bracelet is gone. I try to tell myself that it could have just fallen off, just like Aubrey's earring was found mashed into the dirt in Cypress Cemetery, Lacey's bracelet could have been flung from her wrist in a struggle, snagged on the side of the dumpster when the police dragged her body out from behind it. It could be buried in the trash somewhere, lost forever. But I'm sure Aaron would disagree. I'm just asking you to trust your gut here. Listen to your instincts. I exhale, try to stop the shaking in my fingers. What are my instincts telling me? The coroner's statement about the bruises on Lacey's neck and ligature marks on her arms make it impossible to disagree with one fact. The same person is responsible for the deaths of both Aubrey Gravino and Lacey Deckler. Same method of killing, same finger marks on the neck. As much as I was trying to deny it before, convincing myself Lacey could have run away, maybe taken her own life, after all, she had tried to before, some part of me had known this all along. Abductions happen, especially abductions involving young, attractive girls. But two abductions over the course of one week? Two abductions within miles of each other? It was too coincidental. Still, proof that Aubrey and Lacey had lost their lives to the same person doesn't necessarily mean this person is a copycat. It doesn't mean these murders have anything to do with my father, with me. He dumped Aubrey in a cemetery in her last known location. I think about Lacey, dropped behind a dumpster in the alley behind my office, her last known location, hidden in plain sight. Not only that, but now I know that she was moved there. She wasn't grabbed at random and killed on the spot, the way I had assumed Aubrey had been. She was taken from my office, drugged, killed in another location, and then brought back. For a split second, my heart forgets to beat as a thought materializes in my mind, a thought too terrifying to entertain. I try to push it out, try to discount the idea as paranoia or deja vu or purely raw and unfiltered fear. Another irrational coping mechanism my mind simply generated to try to make sense out of something so senseless. I try, but I can't. What if the killer wanted the bodies to be found, but not by the police? What if he wanted them to be found by me? Aubrey's body turned up minutes after I had left the search party. I was there. Did this person somehow know I would be there? Even more terrifying, was he there too? I move on to Lacey, to the mental image of her body dumped feet from my office door, I was telling Detective Thomas the truth. I rarely go into that alleyway. But I can see it from a window in my office very clearly. 
I can see the dumpster, and it's entirely likely that had I not been in such a distracted daze this week, I could have noticed Lacey slumped behind it from the viewpoint of my lobby. Did this person somehow know that, too? Maybe there are clues on her body that he also wanted found. My mind is racing faster than I can keep up. Clues on the body. Clues on the body. Maybe the missing bracelet is the clue. Maybe the killer took it on purpose. Maybe he knew that if I found the body and if I noticed the missing bracelet, I would put the pieces together. I would understand. My car is hot at a stifling 85 degrees, but somehow I still have goosebumps. I crank the engine, letting the air conditioning blow through my hair. I glance over to my glove compartment and remember the bottle of Xanax I picked up last week. I imagine myself pushing the pill onto my tongue, that bitter pinch in the jaw before it dissolves into my bloodstream and loosens my muscles, cloaks my mind. I open the door and the bottle rattles to the front. I pick it up, turn it over in my hands, twist off the cap and dump a pill into my palm. My phone vibrates beside me and I turn toward the illuminated screen, Daniel's name and pictures staring back at me. I look down at the pill in my palm, then back to the phone. I exhale, reaching for the phone and swiping to answer. Hey, I say, still holding the Xanax, inspecting it between my fingers. Hey, he says, hesitant. So are you done? Yeah, I'm done. How was it? It was awful, Daniel. She looks... My mind wanders back to Lacey's body on the table, her skin the color of frostbite, her eyes made of wax. I think about the little cuts across her skin like wild cherry tic tacs, the giant cut across her wrist. She looks awful, I finish. I can't think of any other word to describe it. I'm sorry you had to do that, he says. Yeah, me too. Did you find anything helpful? I think back to the missing bracelet and start to open my mouth before realizing that, without context, this revelation means nothing. To explain the significance of the missing bracelet, I would have to explain my trip to Cypress Cemetery and finding Aubrey's earring minutes before her body was discovered. I would have to explain my meeting with Aaron Jansen and his theory about a copycat. I would have to revisit all the dark places my mind has been wandering to this past week, revisit them in front of Daniel with Daniel. I close my eyes, rub my fingers against my eyelids until I'm seeing stars. No, I say finally. Nothing. Like I said to the detective, I was only with her for an hour. Daniel exhales. I can see him running his hands through his hair as he sits up in bed, his bare back leaning against the headboard. I can see him resting the phone against his shoulder, rubbing his eyes with his fingers. Come home, he says at last. Come home and get back into bed. Let's relax today, okay? Okay, I nod. Okay, that sounds good. I fidget in my seat, pushing the pill and its bottle back into the glove compartment. I get ready to shift into drive when Aaron's voice echoes around me again. I hesitate, wonder if I should go back inside, tell Detective Thomas everything, tell him Aaron's theory. If I keep this to myself, how many other girls could go missing? But I can't do that. Not yet. I'm not ready to be thrust back into the middle of something like this. To explain his theory, I would need to explain who I am, my family, my past. I don't want to open that door again, because once I do, it would never be closed. I have to run a quick errand first, I say instead. It shouldn't take longer than an hour. Chloe. It'll be fine. I'm fine. I'll be home before lunch. I hang up before Daniel can convince me to change my mind. Then I dial another number, my fingers tapping impatiently against my steering wheel until that familiar voice picks up on the other end of the line. This is Aaron. Hi, Aaron. It's Chloe. Dr. Davis, he says, his voice light. This is certainly a more pleasant greeting than the last time you called. I glance out the window and crack a small smile for the first time since Detective Thomas's number appeared on my phone this morning. Listen, are you still in town? I want to talk. Chapter 21 
After my conversation with Sheriff Dooley, he had given us two options. Stay in the station until they obtained a warrant to arrest my father, or go home, tell no one, and wait. How long will it take to obtain the warrant? My mother had asked. Can't say for certain. Could be hours, could be days. But with this evidence, my guess is we'll have him before the night is up. My mother looked at me as if waiting for an answer, as if I were the one who should be making the decision. Me, age 12. The smart thing to do, the safe thing to do, would be to stay in the station. She knew it. I knew it. Sheriff Dooley knew it. We'll go home, she said instead. My son is at home. I can't leave Cooper alone with him. Sheriff Dooley shifted in his chair. We can always go get the boy, bring him here. No, my mother shook her head. No, that would look suspicious. If Richard starts to suspect something before you obtain the warrant. We'll have officers patrolling the neighborhood undercover. We won't let him run. He won't hurt us, my mother said. He won't. He won't hurt his family. With all due respect, ma'am, but this is a serial murderer we're talking about. A man suspected of killing six people. If anything happens that makes me think we're in danger, we'll leave immediately. I'll call the police and have one of the officers come to the house. And so her decision had been made. We were going home. I could tell from the look on Sheriff Dooley's face that he was wondering why. Why was she so adamant about going back to my father? We had just presented him evidence that all but proved that her husband was a serial killer, and still she wanted to go home. But I wasn't wondering. I knew. I knew she would go back because she had always gone back. Even after she brought those men into our home, into her room, she still went back to dad at the end of every night cooking him dinner and carrying it over to his chair before ducking silently into her bedroom and closing the door behind her. I glanced over to my mother, to the stubborn expression on her face. Maybe she was having doubts, I thought. Maybe she wanted to see him one last time. Maybe she wanted to say goodbye in her own subtle way. Or maybe it was simpler than that. Maybe she just didn't know how to leave. Sheriff Dooley sighed in obvious disapproval before getting up from his desk and opening his office door, allowing my mother and me to walk out of the police station in numb, mutual silence. We rode for 15 minutes without speaking a word, me strapped into the front seat of her used red Corolla, sputtering toward home. There was a hole in the cushion, and I stuck my finger in it, ripping it wider. They made me leave the box at the police station, the box with my father's trophies. I liked that box, with the chimes and the ballerina twirling to the music. I wondered if we'd ever get it back. You did the right thing, sweetie, my mother said at last. Her voice was comforting, but somehow the words felt hollow. But we need to act normal now, Chloe, as normal as possible. I know that's going to be hard, but it won't be for long. Okay. Maybe you can go into your room when we get home. Close the door. I'll tell Dad you're not feeling well. Okay. He's not going to hurt us, she said again, and I didn't answer. I got the feeling she was speaking to herself that time. We pulled into the long driveway toward home, that gravel road that I used to run down, my shoes kicking up dust, the shadows from the forest moving in the trees. I wouldn't have to run anymore, I realized. I wouldn't have to be scared. But as our house inched closer through the bug-splattered windshield, I had the overwhelming urge to open the door and fling myself out, scramble into the woods, and hide. It felt safer in there than out here. My breath started to quicken. I don't know if I can do this, I said. I started to suck in quick, hollow breaths, and soon I was hyperventilating, my surroundings growing spotty and bright. For a second, I thought I might die right there in the car. Can I at least tell Cooper? No, my mother said. She looked at me, the way my chest was rising and falling at an alarming speed. She released the wheel with one hand and turned my face toward hers, rubbing my cheek with her fingers. 
Chloe, breathe. Can you breathe for me? Breathe in through your nose. I closed my lips and inhaled deep through my nostrils, letting my chest fill with air. Now out through your mouth. I pursed my lips and pushed it out slowly, feeling my heartbeat slow just slightly. Now do it again. I did it again. In through the nose, out through the mouth. With each successful breath, my vision started to return, until finally, once our car pulled up to our porch and my mother killed the engine, I found myself breathing normally as I stared at our home looming before us. Chloe, we tell no one, my mother said again. Not until the police are here. Do you understand? I nodded, a tear dripping down my cheek. I turned toward my mother and saw the way she was staring too, staring at our house as if it were haunted. And it was then, looking at her hardened features, the feigned confidence masking the terror I could see in the depths of her eyes, that I realized her true intentions. I understood why we were here, why we had come back. It wasn't because she felt like she had to. We didn't come back because she was weak. We came back because she wanted to prove to herself that she could stand up to him. She wanted to prove that she could be the strong one, the fearless one, instead of running from her problems the way she had always done. Hiding from them, hiding from him, pretending they didn't exist. But now she was afraid. She was just as afraid as I was. Let's go, she said, opening her door. I did the same, slamming it shut before walking toward the front of the car and staring at our wraparound porch, at the rocking chairs creaking in the breeze, at my favorite magnolia tree casting shade across the hammock my dad had tied to its trunk years ago. We walked inside, the door groaning as we pushed it open. My mother nudged me toward the staircase, and I started toward my bedroom before a voice stopped me mid-step. Where have you two been? I froze in place, turning my neck to see my father sitting on the living room couch, staring in our direction. He was holding a beer, his fingers ripping at the damp label, a little pile of paper scraps collecting on the television tray. Sunflower seeds scattered across the wood. He was clean, showered, his hair combed back and his face freshly shaven. He seemed put together, dressed in khakis and a button-down, shirt tucked in but he also seemed tired, exhausted even. His skin seemed saggy and his eyes sunken in like he hadn't slept in days. We got lunch, my mother said. Girl's trip. That sounds nice. But Chloe isn't feeling well, she said, looking at me. I think she might be coming down with something. Sorry to hear that, honey. Come here. I glanced at my mom and she nodded slightly. I walked back down the steps and into the living room, my heart hammering in my chest as I approached my father. He looked at me, curiosity in his eyes as I stood before him. Suddenly, I wondered if he had realized his box was missing. I wondered if he was going to ask me about it. He reached his hand toward my forehead and pressed. You're hot, he said. Sweetheart, you're sweating. You're shaking. Yeah, I said, my eyes to the floor. I think I just need to lie down. Here. He grabbed his beer and pushed it against my neck, and I flinched, the cold glass numbing my skin, its sweat dripping down my chest and dampening my shirt. I felt my pulse, hard against the bottle, a cool beating. Does that help? I nodded, forcing myself to smile. I think you're right, he said. You should lie down. Take a nap. Where's Coop? I asked, suddenly aware of his absence. He's in his room. I nodded. His room was on the left side of the stairs, mine the right. I wondered if I could sneak in there without my parents noticing, curl into his bed and pull the covers over my eyes. I didn't want to be alone. Go ahead, he said. Go lie down. I'll come get you in a few hours. Take your temperature. I turned on my heel and started walking back toward the stairs, the bottle still pressed to my neck. My mother followed me, her closeness comforting, until we hit the hallway. Mona, my dad called out. Hang on a second. I felt her turn around, face his direction. 
She was silent, so my father spoke again. Is there something you need to tell me? Aaron's eyes are drilling into my skull as I gaze out toward the river. I turn to him, unsure if I heard him correctly, or if my memories are flooding my subconscious again, clouding my judgment, confusing my brain. Well, he asks again, is there? Yeah, I say slowly. That's why I called you here. This morning I got a call from Detective Thomas. No, before we get to that, something else. You lied to me. I look back toward the river and lift a coffee to my lips. We're sitting on a bench by the water, the bridge in the distance looking even more industrial and bleak with the settling fog. About what? About this. He holds his phone in front of me and I grab it with my free hand. I'm looking at a picture of myself, wandering amidst a crowd of people. Immediately, I know where this was taken. My gray t-shirt and top-knotted hair, the mangled trees dripping in Spanish moss, the yellow police tape blurry in the distance. This picture was taken one week ago in Cypress Cemetery. Where did you find this? There's an article online, he says. I was looking in the local paper, trying to identify some people to talk to, when I came across images from the search party. Imagine my surprise when I saw that you were there. I sigh, silently berating myself for not paying closer attention to those journalists I had seen walking around with cameras slung from their necks. I hope Daniel doesn't see this article. Or worse, Officer Doyle. I never told you I wasn't there. No, but you told me Cypress Cemetery held no special meaning to your family. That there would be no reason to think dumping Aubrey's body there would be suspicious. It doesn't, I say. There's not. I just stumbled across the search party, okay? I was driving around, trying to clear my head. I saw it in the distance and decided to look around. He stares at me, his eyes narrowing. In my line of work, trust is everything. Honesty is everything. If you lie to me, I can't work with you. I'm not lying, I say, holding up my hands. I swear. Why did you decide to look around? I don't really know, I say, taking another sip of my coffee. Curiosity, I guess. I was thinking about Aubrey and Lena. Aaron is quiet, his eyes trained on me. What was she like? He asks at last, curiosity creeping into his voice. He can't help it. I know he can't. Nobody ever can. Were you friends with her? Something like that. I thought we were when I was little, but now I see it for what it really was. And what is that? She was an older, cool kid looking out for a younger nerd, I say. She was nice to me. She gave me hand-me-downs, taught me how to put on makeup. That's a friend, Aaron says. The best kind, if you ask me. Yeah, I say, nodding. Yeah, I guess you're right. There was something about her that was just, I don't know, magnetic, you know? I glance at Aaron, and he nods knowingly. I wonder if he had Alina, too. I imagine everyone has Alina in their life at some point. A person who comes blazing in like a shooting star and fizzles out just as fast. She used me a little bit, and I knew it, but I didn't even care. I continue, tapping my fingers against my coffee cup. She didn't have the best home life, so our house was something of an escape for her. Besides, I think she had a crush on my brother. Aaron raises his eyebrows. Everyone had a crush on my brother, I say, my lips twitching into a gentle smile, reminiscing. He didn't like her like that, but I think that's the reason why she came around so much. I remember there was this one time. I stop, catching myself before I go too far. Sorry, I say. You probably don't care about that. No, I do, he says. Go on. I exhale, push my fingers into my hair. There was this one time that summer, back before everything happened. Lena was at our house. She was always making excuses about why she needed to come to our house. And she convinced me to break into Cooper's room. I didn't really do stuff like that, you know, break the rules. But Lena had a way about her. She made you want to push the boundaries, live your life without fear. I remember that afternoon so vividly, 
the warmth of the afternoon sun stinging my cheeks, the blades of grass pushing deep into my back, itching my neck, Lena and I lying in the backyard making shapes out of the clouds. You know what would make this even better? She had asked, her voice raspy. Some weed. I rolled my head on its side so I was facing her direction. She was still staring into the clouds, her eyes focused, her teeth digging into the side of her lip. She held a lighter in one hand, absentmindedly flicking it on and off between her bitten down fingernails, the other held above the flame, moving closer and closer until a little black circle appeared on her palm. I'm positive your brother has some. I watched an ant crawl slowly up her cheek toward her eyebrow. I got the feeling that she knew it was there, that she could feel it, crawling closer, that she was testing it, testing herself, waiting to see how long she could take it, just like that fire searing her skin, how close it could get before she was forced to reach her hand up and brush it away. Coop? I asked, tilting my head back. No way, he doesn't do drugs. Lena snorted, pushing herself up onto her elbow. Oh, Chloe, I love how naive you are. That's the beauty of being a kid. I'm not a kid, I said, sitting up too. Besides, his room is locked. Do you have a credit card? No, I said, embarrassed again. Did Lena have a credit card? I didn't know any 15-year-olds with credit cards. Cooper definitely didn't have one. But then again, Lena was different. I have a library card. Of course you do, she said, pushing herself up from the grass. She held her hand out, her palms rippled with the indents from the blades, specks of soil stuck to the skin. I took it, damp with sweat, and stood up too, watching as she picked the weeds from the backs of her thighs. Let's go. Honestly, I have to teach you everything. We walked inside, stopping by my room to grab the small purse that held my library card before crossing the hall to Cooper's. See, I said, jiggling the handle. Locked. Does he always lock his bedroom? Ever since I found those gross magazines under his bed. Cooper, she said, raising her eyebrows. She looked more impressed than disgusted. Naughty boy. Here, give me the card. I handed it over, watching as she stuck it through the crack. First, check the hinges, she said, jostling the card. If you can't see them, it's the right kind of lock. You need the slant of the latch to be facing towards you. Okay, I said, trying to fight down the panic that was rising in my throat. Next, insert the card at an angle. Once the corner is in, straighten it up, like this. I watched, mesmerized, as she pushed the card deeper and deeper into the opening, applying pressure to the door. The card started to bend, and I said a prayer that it wouldn't break. How do you know how to do this? I finally asked. Oh, you know, she said, wiggling the card. You get grounded so many times, and you learn to let yourself out. Your parents lock you inside your room? She ignored me, giving the card a few more good yanks until finally the door pushed open. Ta-da! She twirled around, a look of satisfaction on her face, until I saw her expression slowly change. Mouth open, eyes wide. Then, a smile. Oh, she said, placing her hand on a pop tip. Hey, Coop. Aaron laughs now, polishing off his latte before placing the to-go cup on the ground by his feet. So he caught you, he asks, before you even got inside? Oh yeah, I say. He was standing right behind me, watching the whole thing from the stairwell. I think he was just waiting to see if we could get in. No weed for you then? No, I say, smiling. That would have to wait a few years. I don't think that's what Lena was really after anyway. I think she wanted to get caught, to get his attention. Did it work? No, I say. That kind of thing never worked on Cooper. It kind of had the opposite effect, actually. He sat me down that night and talked to me about not doing drugs, the importance of good role models, blah, blah, blah. The sun is peeking out now, and almost instantly the temperature seems to rise a few degrees, the humidity getting thick like churning milk. I feel my cheeks start to burn. 
I can't tell if it's from the sun on my face or from sharing this intimate memory with a stranger. I don't really know what drove me to tell it. So why did you want to meet me? Aaron asks, sensing my desire to change the subject. Why the change of heart? I saw Lacey's body this morning, I say. And the last time we met, you were telling me to trust my instincts. Wait, back up. He interrupts. You saw Lacey's body? How? She was found in the alleyway behind my office, stashed behind a dumpster. Jesus. They asked me to look at her, try to identify if anything looked different from the last time I saw her, if anything was missing. Aaron is quiet, waiting for me to continue. I exhale, turn toward him. She was missing a bracelet, I say. And back when I was at the cemetery, I came across an earring, an earring that belonged to Aubrey. At first, I thought it probably just fell out of her ear when her body was being dragged or something. But then I realized that it was a part of a set. She had a matching necklace, too. I never saw Aubrey's body, but if she was found without that necklace... You think the killer is taking their jewelry? Aaron interrupts. As a kind of prize. That was my dad's thing, I say, the admission, even after all these years, still making me nauseated. They caught him because I found a box of his victim's jewelry hidden in the back of his closet. Aaron's eyes widen before he looks down at his lap, processing the information I just gave him. I wait a minute before continuing again. I know it's a stretch, but I think it's at least worth looking into. No, you're right, Aaron nods. It's a coincidence we can't ignore. Who would have known about that? Well, my family, obviously. The police, the victim's parents. Is that it? My dad took a plea deal, I say. Not all of the evidence was presented publicly, so yeah, I think so. Unless somehow the word got out. Can you think of anybody on that list that would have had a reason to do something like this? Any police officers who got too obsessed with the case, maybe? No, I shake my head. No, the cops were all... I stop, a realization settling over me. My family, the police, the victim's parents... There was one man, I start slowly. One of the victim's parents, Lena's dad, Bert Rhodes. Aaron looks at me, nods for me to continue. He didn't handle things well. His daughter was murdered. I don't think most people would. No, this wasn't normal grief, I say. This was something different. This was rage. And even before the murders, there was something about him that was just off. I think back to Lena jimmying my brother's locked door, her involuntary admission, that slip of the tongue, pretending not to hear when I pressed her for more. Your parents lock you inside your room? Aaron nods, blows a steady stream of air through his pursed lips. What did you say the other day about copycats? I ask. They can either revere or revile? Yeah, Aaron says. There are two different categories of copycats, generally speaking. There are people who admire a murderer and want to mimic their crimes as a form of respect. And then there are people who disagree with a murderer in some way. Maybe they have an opposing political belief or just think they're overhyped and want to do it better. So they mirror their crimes as a way to draw attention away from their predecessor and toward themselves. But either way, it's a game. Well, Bert Rhodes reviled my father. For good reason, but still. It seemed unhealthy, like an obsession. Okay. Aaron says at last. Okay. Thanks for telling me this. Are you going to bring it to the police? No, I say, probably too quickly. Not yet, at least. Why? Is there more? I shake my head, deciding not to mention the other part of my theory that the person taking these girls is talking to me specifically, taunting me, testing me, wanting me to put the pieces together. I don't want Aaron to start to doubt my sanity here, to discount everything I just said if I take it a step too far. I want to do some research of my own first. No, I'm just not ready for that yet. It's too soon. 
I stand up, pushing a wisp of hair from my forehead that the wind has loosened from my bun. I exhale, turning toward Aaron to say goodbye, when I notice him looking at me in a way I've never seen from him before. There's concern in his eyes. Chloe, he says. Hang on a second. Yeah? He hesitates as if trying to decide if he should continue. He makes up his mind and leans toward me, his voice low and steady. Just promise me you'll take care of yourself, okay? Chapter 22 I remember seeing Lena's parents once, Bert and Annabelle Rhodes, sitting in the audience of Bro Bridge High School's annual end-of-year play. That year, the year of the killings, they were putting on grease, and Lena was sandy, her tightest skin pleather pants shimmering every time the fabric caught the glare of the auditorium lights at just the right angle. Her usual French braids were replaced with a perm, a fake cigarette peeking out from behind one ear, although I very much doubted it was fake. She probably smoked it in the parking lot after the curtain had dropped. Cooper was in it too, which was why we were there. He was good at sports, but acting, not so much. The pamphlet identified him as some tertiary role like student number three. But not Lena. Lena was the star. I was with my parents, sliding through the rows of seats, looking for three empty chairs together, apologizing as we knocked into the knees of the other already seated parents. Mona, my dad called, waving his hand. This way. He motioned toward three chairs in the center of the room, situated right next to the roses. I watched my mother's eyes bulge for a fraction of a second before she plastered a smile on her face and put her hand on my back, pushing me forward with too much force. Hey, Bert, my father said, smiling. Annabelle, these seats taken? Bert Rhodes smiled at my father and gestured to the open seats, ignoring my mother completely. In the moment, it struck me as rude. He had met my mother. I had seen him at our house just weeks before. He installed security systems for a living. I remember his tanned, leathery arms as he knelt outside in the dirt of our backyard before she tapped him on the shoulder and invited him inside. I watched through my window as he looked up at her, his arm wiping the moisture from his forehead, the unnatural loudness of her laugh as she pulled him in. They went into the kitchen where I heard them talking in hushed voices. From the banister on the stairs, I saw her lean over the counter, her chest pushed together as she cradled a glass of sweet iced tea. We took our seats just before the lights dimmed, and Lena pranced across the stage, her twirling hips making her white hoop skirt fly around her waist. My father shifted in his chair, crossed his legs. Bert Rhodes cleared his throat. I remember looking over at him then, at the stiffness in his posture, at my mother's eyes glued to the stage, and at my father in between them, oblivious to it all. Bert Rhodes wasn't rude, I realized. He was uncomfortable. He was hiding something. And my mother was, too. The news of their affair came as a shock to me after my father's arrest. I suppose all children think of their parents as perfectly happy people, some kind of subhuman life form devoid of feelings and opinions and problems and needs. At age 12, I didn't understand the complexities of life, of marriage, of relationships. My father was at work all day while my mother was home alone. Cooper and I were at school or wrestling practice or camp most of the time, and I never really stopped to wonder what she did all day. Our languid nighttime routine of dinner served top TV trays, followed by my father nodding off in his lazy boy while my mother cleaned the kitchen and retreated to their bedroom with a book in her hand, seemed like just that to me, routine. I never thought about how lonely it must have been, how stale. Their lack of intimacy seemed normal. I never once saw them kiss, hold hands, because I had never witnessed anything else. I had never known anything else. So when she started inviting a steady stream of men into our house over the course of that summer, the gardener and the electrician and the man who installed our security system, the man whose daughter would later vanish— I didn't think of it as anything more than friendly Southern hospitality, helping them beat the heat with a glass of homemade sweet tea. 
some people speculated that my father killed Lena as payback, as a sick way of evening the scales after he found out about Bert and my mother. Maybe Lena, his first kill, was the onset of his darkness. Maybe it crept from the corners after that, became bigger and messier, harder to control. Bert Rhodes certainly believed that. I thought back to him standing next to Lena's mother during that first televised press conference before Lena's status shifted from missing to presumed dead. He was a man undone, barely 48 hours into his daughter's disappearance and already unable to string words together to form a coherent sentence. But when my father was identified as the man who killed her, he snapped completely. I remember Cooper pulling me into the house one morning because Bert Rhodes was outside, pacing like a rabid animal in our front yard. This wasn't like our other visitors, throwing things from a distance or scampering away when we chased them out. This time, it was different. Bert Rhodes was a full-grown man. He was angry, frantic. My mother had already left us at that point, mentally at least, And Cooper and I didn't know what to do, so we huddled in my bedroom and watched through my window. We watched as he kicked at the dirt and shouted curse words at our home. We watched as he screamed in our direction and ripped at his clothes, his hair. Eventually, Cooper went outside. I had begged him not to, pulling on his shirt sleeve, tears streaming down my cheeks. Then I had watched helplessly as he walked down our front steps, emerging into the yard. I watched as he shouted back, pushing his outstretched finger into Bert's beefy chest. Eventually, Bert left with promises of retaliation. This ain't over, I heard him scream, his gruff voice echoing through the vast nothingness that was our home. We later learned that the rock that came hurtling through my mother's bedroom window that night had come from his calloused hands, the slits in my father's truck tires the work of his blade. In his mind, it was his fault. He had slept with a married woman, after all, and within that same stretch of summer, her husband had murdered his daughter. Karma had been served, and the guilt was too much to bear. He was angry to his core. If Bert Rhodes had been able to get his hands on my father after he confessed to Lena's murder, I'm positive he would have killed him. And not quickly. Not mercifully. He would have killed him slowly painfully, and he would have enjoyed it. But, of course, he couldn't. He couldn't get his hands on my father. He was in police custody, safely locked behind bars. But his family wasn't, so he set his sights on us. I unlock the front door now and peek my head into the house, searching for Daniel. I'm home before lunch, as promised, and I can smell fresh coffee brewing in the kitchen. I eye my laptop in the living room, and I want to grab it, open it, start typing furiously. I want to learn more about Burt Rhodes. He knew about Lena's belly button ring. He knew about the way my father looked at his daughter at the fair and at the school play, and as she laid flat on my bedroom floor, those long legs in the air. All of the other girls, Robin, Margaret, Carrie, Susan, Jill, they were victims too, but they were random. They were taken out of necessity or convenience or some mixture of the two. They were at the wrong place at the wrong time, the exact time the darkness crept in and my father could no longer fight it off. When he found the first young, innocent, defenseless girl he could get his hands on and squeezed, hard until it retreated back into the corner like a beetle scuttling away from the light. But Lena seemed to be more than that. She always had. With Lena, it was personal. She was his first. She was taken because of who she was, because of the way she made my father feel, the way she teased him with her waving fingers before she disappeared into a crowd, The way Bert teased him by sleeping with his wife before turning around and smiling at him in public, pretending to be friends. I walk across the hall to the living room and sit on the couch, pulling my computer into my lap and powering it on. Bert Rhodes was violent, angry, unforgiving. Bert Rhodes had a grudge. Was he still stewing over this 20 years later? 
He hadn't forgotten my father's crimes, and maybe he didn't want us to forget them either. I can't shrug off the feeling that I'm on to something, so I tap my fingers across the keys, typing his name into the search engine and hitting enter. A series of articles come up, almost all of them related to the Brobridge killings. I scroll through the pages, skimming the headlines. They're all outdated, and I've read them all before. I decide to refine my search to Burt Rhodes, Baton Rouge, and try again. This time, a new result pops up. It's the website for Alarm Security Systems, a Baton Rouge-based security company. I click on the link and watch as the website loads, reading the homepage. Alarm Security Systems is a locally owned and operated on-demand security company. Our trained installation experts will personally install and monitor your home 24-7 to keep you and your family protected. I click on a tab titled Meet the Team and watch as Bert Rhodes' face loads onto the screen. My eyes drink in his picture, his once sharp jawline now padded with excess fat and saggy skin stretched like pizza dough and left to hang. He looks older, fatter, balder. He looks terrible, to be honest. But it's him. It's definitely him. Then the realization hits me. He lives here. Bert Rhodes lives here, in Baton Rouge. I'm engrossed in his image, in the way he stares at the camera, the way his face completely lacks an expression. He's neither happy, nor sad, nor angry, nor irritated. He just is, a shell of a human, empty inside. His lips droop into a gentle frown, his eyes emotionless and black. They seem to suck the light from the camera flash deep into their center instead of reflecting it back the way the other pictures do. I lean closer to the monitor, so absorbed in the image on my screen, in this face from my past, that I don't notice the sound of footsteps walking toward me. Chloe? I jump, my hand shooting to my chest. I look up to see Daniel hovering above me, and instinctively I shut my computer. He glances at it. What are you looking at? Sorry, I say, my eyes darting from my computer and back to him. He's fully dressed and holding a giant mug in his hands, staring at me. He pushes it in my direction, and I take it reluctantly, even though I just downed a venti with Aaron 30 minutes before, and the caffeine, or at least I think it's the caffeine, is already making me jittery. I don't answer, so he tries again. Where were you? Just running an errand. I say, pushing my laptop to the side. I was already in town, so I figured I might as well knock it out. Chloe, he interrupts. What were you really doing? Nothing, I snap. Daniel, I'm fine. Really, I just needed to drive around for a little bit, okay? Okay, he says, holding up his hands. Okay, I get it. He turns around, and a wave of guilt washes over me. I think of every other relationship I've had, all over before they even began, because of my inability to let people in, to trust them. Because of my paranoia and my fear silencing every other emotion in my body screaming to be acknowledged. Wait, I'm sorry, I say, reaching my arm toward him. I wiggle my fingers, and he turns around and walks back toward me, sitting next to me on the couch. I drape my arm over his back and lean my head against his shoulder. I know I'm not handling this very well. What can I do to help? Let's do something today, I say, sitting up straighter. My fingers are still itching to get back to my laptop, to dive back into Burt Rhodes. But right now, I need to be with Daniel. I can't keep blowing him off like this. I know you said we could spend the day in bed, but I don't think that's what I need right now. I think we need to go do something. Get out of the house. He sighs, running his fingers through my hair. He looks at me with a mixture of affection and sadness, and I can already tell that I'm not going to like what he's about to say next. Chloe, I'm sorry. I need to drive to Lafayette today. You know that one hospital I've been struggling to meet with? They called me while you were running your errand. They're giving me an hour this afternoon, and I might even be able to take a few of the doctors to dinner. I have to go. 
Oh, okay. I nod. For the first time since I walked in, his appearance really registers. He isn't just dressed, he's dressed well. He's dressed for work. Okay, that's, of course, that's fine. Do what you need to do. But you should get out of the house, he says, poking me in the chest. You should go do something. Get some fresh air. I'm sorry I can't be there with you, but I should be home first thing tomorrow morning. It's fine, I say. I have some wedding stuff I should be catching up on anyways. Emails to answer. I'll settle in here and knock it out, maybe grab a drink with Shannon later. That a girl, he says, pulling me in and kissing me on the forehead. He pauses for a minute, and I can feel his eyes drilling into the laptop behind me, still closed shut. He keeps me tight against his chest with one arm as his free hand snakes across the couch and reaches for the computer, pulling it closer. I try to reach for it too, but he grabs my wrist first, holding it tight while he slides the computer onto his lap, opening it wordlessly. Daniel, I say, but he ignores me, his grip on my wrist getting tighter. Daniel, come on. I swallow hard as the screen illuminates his face. Wait while his eyes scan the page I know is still pulled up. Alarm security systems and the picture of Bert Rhodes. He's quiet for a while, and I'm sure he recognizes the name. He knows what I'm up to. After all, he knows about Lena. I open my mouth, getting ready to explain, before he cuts me off. Is this what you've been so worked up about? Look, I can explain, I say, still trying to wriggle my wrist free. After Aubrey's body showed up, I started to get worried. You want a security system installed? He asks. You're worried whoever is doing this to those girls might come for you next? I'm quiet, trying to decide if I should let him go down this path or explain the truth. Again, I open my mouth, but he keeps going. Chloe, why didn't you say something to me? God, you must be so scared. He lets go of my wrist, and I feel the blood rush back into my hand, an icy tingle pulsing through my fingers. I hadn't realized how tightly he had been squeezing. Then he pulls me into his chest again, his fingers trailing against my neck and down my spine. The memories this must be bringing back for you. I mean, I knew you were thinking about it, about your dad, but I didn't realize it had gotten to this. I'm sorry, I say, my lips pressed into his shoulder. It just, it felt a little ridiculous, you know, being afraid. It's not the truth exactly, but but it isn't a lie, either. You'll be fine, Chloe. You don't have anything to worry about. My mind flashes to that one morning with my mom, with Cooper, 20 years ago. Crouched in the hallway with our backpacks on, me crying, my mom comforting. She does have something to worry about, Cooper. This is serious. This guy, whoever he is, he likes teenagers, remember? I swallow, nod and my mind formulates the words I already know he's going to say before he has the chance to say them. As if I'm standing in that hallway again, letting my mother wipe away my tears. Don't get into a car with strangers. Don't walk down dark alleys alone. Daniel pulls back and smiles at me, and I force a smile back. But if getting a security system installed will make you feel better, I think you should do it. He adds, call this guy and get him over here. At the very least, it'll give you peace of mind. Okay, I nod. I'll look into it. These things, though, they're expensive. Daniel shakes his head. Your peace of mind is more valuable, he says. Can't put a price on that. I smile, a genuine one this time, and wrap my arms around him one last time. I can't blame him for being angry with me, for being curious. I've been secretive these last few days, and he knows it. He still has no idea I'm not actually shopping for security systems, that I'm investigating the man on the screen and not the piece of equipment he installs, but still. I can tell that the emotion in his voice is authentic. He means it. Thank you, I say. You're amazing. As are you, he says, kissing my forehead before standing up. Now, I've got to go. Get some work done and I'll text you when I get there. Chapter 23 
As soon as I see Daniel's car pull out of the driveway, I run back to my computer and grab my phone, starting a new text to Aaron. Bert Rhodes lives here, in Baton Rouge. I don't know what to do with this piece of information. It's a lead, definitely. It has to be more than a coincidence. But still, it's not enough to approach the police with. For all I know, they haven't made the connection with the missing jewelry on their own, and I still don't want to be the one to bring that up. Seconds later, my phone vibrates with Aaron's response. Looking into it, give me ten minutes. I put the phone down and glance back at my computer, at Bert's image still glowing on my screen, his own face proof of the trauma he has experienced. When people get hurt physically, you can see it in the bruises and the scars. But when they're hurt emotionally, mentally, it runs deeper than that. You can see every sleepless night in the reflection of their eyes. You can see every tear stained into their cheeks, every bout of anger etched into the creases in their foreheads, the thirst for blood cracking the skin on their lips. I hesitate for a minute as my eyes drink in the face of this broken person. I start to empathize, and I start to wonder— how could a man who lost his daughter in such a tragic way turn around and take a life in the exact same manner? How could he subject another innocent family to the exact same pain? But then I remember my clients, the other tortured souls I see day in and day out. I remember myself. I remember that statistic I learned in school, the one that made my blood run cold, 40% of people who are abused as children will go on to become abusers themselves. It doesn't happen to everyone, but it happens. It's cyclical. It's about power, control, or rather the lack of control. It's about taking it back and claiming it as your own. I, of all people, should understand that. My phone starts to vibrate and I see Aaron's name on the screen. I pick it up after the first ring. What did you find? I ask, my eyes still glued to my computer. Assault resulting in bodily injury, public drunkenness, DUI, he says. He's been in and out of jail over the last 15 years, and it looks like his wife filed for a divorce a while ago after a domestic violence dispute. There's a restraining order. What did he do? Aaron is silent for a second, and I can't tell if he's reading his notes or if he just doesn't want to answer the question. Aaron? He strangled her. I let the words settle over my body, and instantly the room feels twenty degrees colder. He strangled her. It could be a coincidence, Aaron says. Or it couldn't. There's a big difference between an angry drunk and a serial killer. He could be escalating, I say. Fifteen years of violent misdemeanors seems to be a pretty good indication that he's capable of something more. He attacked his wife in the same way his daughter was attacked, Aaron. In the same way Aubrey and Lacey were murdered. Okay, Aaron says. Okay, we'll keep an eye on him. But if this is really concerning you, I think you should go to the police. Tell them the theory, you know, about the copycat. No, I shake my head. No, not yet. We need more. Why? Aaron asks, sounding agitated. Chloe, you said that last time. This is more. Why are you so afraid of the police? His question stuns me. I think about the way I've been lying to Detective Thomas and Officer Doyle, hiding evidence from the investigation. I've never thought of myself as being afraid of the police. But then I think back to college, to the last time I got involved in something like this, and how badly it had ended how wrong I had been. I'm not afraid of the police, I say. Aaron is silent, and I feel like I should continue, explain more. I feel like I should say, I'm afraid of myself. But instead, I sigh. I don't want to talk to them for the same reason I didn't want to talk to you, I say, my tone harsher than I intend it to be. I didn't ask to be involved in this, in any of it. Well, you are, Aaron snaps back. He sounds hurt, and in this moment, even more than the moment on the dock as he listened to me recount that memory with Lena, our relationship starts to feel like something more than journalist and subject. It starts to feel personal. Whether you like it or not, you're involved. 
I glanced toward the window just in time to see the outline of a car through the blinds pulling into my driveway. I'm not expecting anyone, so I glance at the clock. Daniel has been gone for about 30 minutes. I look around the house, wondering if he forgot something and had to turn around and drive back. Look, Aaron, I'm sorry, I say, pinching my nose between my fingers. I didn't mean it like that. I know you're trying to help. You're right, I'm involved in this, whether or not I want to be. My dad made sure of that. He's silent, but I can feel the tension evaporating on the other side of the line. All I'm saying is I'm not ready for the police to start digging around in my life just yet. I continue. If I bring this to them, if I tell them who I am, I can't turn back from that. I'll be picked apart and scrutinized all over again. This is my home, Aaron. My life. I'm normal here, or as normal as I can get anyway. I like it like that. Okay, he says at last. Okay, I understand. I'm sorry for pushing it. It's fine. If we find any more proof, I'll tell them everything. I swear. I hear the slam of a car door outside and turn to see the silhouette of a man walking up my driveway, approaching my home. But hey, I need to go. I think Daniel's home. I'll call you later. I hang up and toss my phone on the couch before walking toward the front door. I can hear the sound of footsteps on the stairs, and before Daniel can come inside, I swing open the door and place a hand on my hip. You just couldn't stay away, could you? My eyes register the man before me, and my smile fades, my playful expression replaced with one of horror. This man isn't Daniel. My hand drops to my side as I look him up and down his husky frame and dirty clothes, his wrinkled skin and dark, dead eyes. They're even darker than they were in his picture, still pulled up on my laptop screen. My heart starts to accelerate, and for one terrifying second, I grasp the door frame to stop myself from passing out. Bert Rhodes is standing on my doorstep. Chapter 24 we stare at each other for what seems like forever, each one silently daring the other to speak first. Even if I had something to say, I wouldn't be able to say it. My lips are frozen in place, the sheer terror of Burt Rhodes in the flesh rendering me immobile. I can't move. I can't speak. All I can do is stare. My gaze travels down from his eyes to his hands, calloused and dirty. They're large. I imagine them gripping my neck easily, squeezing gently at first before increasing the pressure with every gag. My nails clawing at his grasp, my eyes bulging as they stare into his, searching for a hint of life in the darkness. His cracked lips snaking into a smile. The finger-shaped bruises Detective Thomas would find on my skin. He clears his throat. Is this the residence of Daniel Briggs? I stare at him for another second, blinking a few times as if my mind is trying to shake itself from a stupor. I don't know if I heard him correctly. He's looking for Daniel? When I don't answer, he speaks again. We got a call from Daniel Briggs about 30 minutes ago asking to install the security system at this address. He looks down at his clipboard before glancing at the street sign behind him as if checking to make sure he's at the right place. Said it was urgent. I glance behind him at the car parked in my driveway, the alarm security system's logo printed across the side. Daniel must have called the company himself as soon as he got in the car. It was a sweet gesture, well-intentioned, but one that also lured Burt Rhodes directly to me. Daniel has no idea of the danger he's just put me in. I look back at this man from my past, lingering on my doorstep, waiting politely to be invited inside. The realization dawns on me slowly. He doesn't recognize me. He doesn't know who I am. I hadn't noticed it before, but I'm breathing rapidly, my chest rising and falling violently with each desperate inhale. Bert seems to notice at the same moment I do. He's eyeing me suspiciously, rightfully curious as to why his presence is making a stranger hyperventilate. I know I need to calm myself down. Chloe, breathe. Can you breathe for me? Breathe in through your nose. 
I imagine my mother and close my lips, inhaling deep through my nostrils and letting my chest fill with air. Now out through your mouth. I purse my lips and push out the stale air slowly, feeling my heartbeat slow. I clench my hands to stop them from shaking. Yes, I say, stepping to the side and gesturing for him to come in. I watch as his foot crosses the threshold of my home, my sanctuary, my safe haven and my escape, carefully crafted to exude normalcy and control, an illusion that instantly shatters the moment this presence from the past steps inside. There's an atmospheric shift in the air, a buzzing of particles that makes my arm hair bristle. Standing closer to me now, Inches from my face, he seems even larger than I remembered, despite the fact that the last time I was in a room with this man, I was 12 years old. But he doesn't seem to know that. He doesn't seem to have any idea that I am the 12-year-old girl who shares blood with the man who murdered his daughter. I am the girl who screamed when the rock he threw came crashing through my mother's window. I am the girl who hid beneath my bed when he showed up on our doorstep stinking of whiskey and sweat and tears. He doesn't seem to have any idea of the history we share. And now, with him standing in my home, I wonder if I can use this to my advantage. He steps farther into the house and looks around, his eyes scanning the hallway, the attached living room, the kitchen, and the staircase that leads to the second floor. He takes a few steps and peeks into each room, nodding to himself. Suddenly, a terrifying thought washes over me. What if he does recognize me? What if he's just checking to see if I'm alone? My husband is upstairs, I say, my eyes darting to the staircase. Daniel keeps a gun stashed in our bedroom closet in case of intruders. I rack my brain trying to remember where the box is exactly. I wonder if I can make an excuse to run upstairs and grab it, just in case. He's on a conference call, but if you need anything, I can just go ask him. He squints at me before licking his lips and smiling, shaking his head gently, and I get the distinct feeling that he's laughing at me, mocking me, that he knows I'm lying about Daniel and that I am here completely alone. He walks back in my direction, and I notice him rubbing his hands against his pants, as if wiping the sweat from his palms. I start to panic and consider bolting outside before he twists around and points to the door, tapping it twice with his index finger. No need, I'm just assessing your entry points. Two main doors, front and back. You got lots of windows in here, so I would suggest we install some glass break sensors. You want me to take a look upstairs? No. I say, no, downstairs is fine. That's all. That all sounds fine. Thank you. You want cameras? What? Cameras, he repeats. They're tiny little things we can place throughout the property. Then you can access the video from your phone. Oh, yeah, I say quickly, absentmindedly. Yeah, sure, that'll be good. All right, he says, nodding. He scribbles some notes on his clipboard before thrusting it in my direction. If you could just sign here, I'll get my tools. I take the clipboard and look down at the order form as he steps outside and walks toward his car. I can't sign my name, obviously. My real name. Surely he would recognize that. So instead, I sign Elizabeth Briggs, my middle name paired with Daniel's last, and hand him the clipboard as he walks back inside. I watch as he scans my signature before making my way back to the couch. I appreciate you showing up on such short notice, I say, shutting my laptop and stuffing my phone into my back pocket. That was extremely quick. On demand 24-7, he says, reciting the slogan from the website. He's walking around the house now, sticking sensors on each window. The thought of this man knowing exactly which areas to avoid to bypass the alarm is suddenly concerning. For all I know, he could be skipping a spot, keeping a mental note of which window to crawl through when he comes back later. I wonder if this is how he chooses his victims. Maybe he first saw Aubrey and Lacey when installing systems in their homes. Maybe he stood inside their bedrooms, took a peek inside their panty drawers, learned their routines. I'm quiet as he stalks through my house, poking his head into various corners, his fingers into every crack. He grabs a footstool and grunts as he climbs, sticking a small circular camera in the corner of the living room. 
I stare into it, a microscopic eye staring right back. Are you the owner? I ask at last. No, he says. I expect him to elaborate further, but he doesn't. I decide to keep pressing. How long have you been doing this? He climbs off the ladder and looks at me, his mouth opening as if he wants to say something. Instead, he reconsiders and closes it again before walking toward the front door, pulling out a drill from his tool bag and fastening the security panel to the wall. I watch the back of his head as the sound of the drill fills my hallway and try again. Are you local to Baton Rouge? The drilling stops and I see his shoulders tense. He doesn't turn around, but now the sound of his voice is what fills the empty room. Do you really think I don't know who you are, Chloe? I freeze, his response stunning me into silence. I keep watching the back of his head until, slowly, he turns around. I recognized you the second you answered the door. I'm sorry, I swallow. I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, you do, he says, taking a step closer, still clutching the drill. You're Chloe Davis. Your fiancé gave me your name when he called. He's on his way to Lafayette, and he said you'd let me in. My eyes grow wide as I register what he just admitted. He knows who I am. He has this whole time. And he knows I'm here alone. He takes another step closer. And the fact that you lied about your name on the order form tells me that you know who I am too. So I really don't know what you're playing at, asking me these questions. My phone is hot in my back pocket. I could pull it out, call 911. But he's right in front of me now, and I'm terrified that any movement on my part will send him hurtling in my direction. You want to know what brought me to Baton Rouge? He asks. He's getting angry now. I can see his skin reddening, his eyes getting darker. Little bubbles of spit multiplying on his tongue. I've been here for a while, Chloe. After Annabelle and I got divorced, I needed a change of scenery, a fresh start. I was in a dark place for a while there, so I picked up and moved. Got the fuck out of that town and all the memories that come with it. And I was doing okay, all things considered, until a few years ago I opened the Sunday paper and guess who I saw staring right back at me? He waits for a second, his lip curling into a smile. It was a picture of you, he says, pointing the drill in my direction. A picture of you beneath some cheeky little headline about you channeling your childhood trauma or some bullshit like that right here in Baton Rouge. I remember that article. That interview I had granted the paper when I started working at Baton Rouge General. I thought that article would be a redemption piece of sorts. A chance to redefine myself, to write my own narrative. But of course it wasn't. It was just another exploration of my father. Another gaudy glorification of violence masquerading under the facade of journalism. I read that article, he continues. Every fucking word. And you know what? It just pissed me off all over again. You making excuses about your dad, capitalizing on what he did for the good of your own career. And then I read about your mom, trying to take the cowardly way out after the role she played in all of this, so she didn't have to live with herself no more. I'm silent as his words settle over me, as I take in the way he's staring at me with pure hatred in his eyes, the way his hands are clutching the drill so hard I can see the whites of his knuckles threatening to tear straight through his skin. Your entire family makes me sick, he says. And no matter what I do, I can't seem to escape you. I never made excuses for my father, I say. I never tried to capitalize on anything. What he did, it's, it's inexcusable. It makes me sick. Oh, is that right? It makes you sick? he asks, tilting his head. Tell me, does owning your own practice make you sick too? That nice little office you got downtown? Does your six-figure paycheck make you sick? Your fucking Garden District two-story home and picture-perfect fiancé, do they make you sick? I swallow hard. I underestimated Bert Rhodes. Inviting him inside was a mistake. Trying to play detective and interrogate him was a mistake. Not only does he know me, he knows everything about me. He's been researching me the same way I've been researching him, but for much, much longer. He knows about my practice, my office. 
Maybe that means he knows that Lacey was a patient and he was there, waiting the day she stepped outside and disappeared. Now tell me, he growls, why is it fair that Dick Davis's daughter gets to grow up and live a perfect life while mine is rotting in the ground wherever that fucker dumped her body? I am not living a perfect life, I say. Suddenly I'm angry too. You have no idea what I've been through, how fucked up I am after what my father did. What you've been through? He yells, pointing the drill at me again. You want to talk about what you've been through? How fucked up you are? What about my daughter? What about what she went through? Lena was my friend. Mr. Rhodes, she was my friend. You are not the only one who lost someone that summer. His expression shifts slightly. A softening of the eyes, a loosening of the forehead. And suddenly he's looking at me like I'm 12 again. Maybe it was the way I said his name, Mr. Rhodes, the same way I said it when my mother introduced us in our kitchen one evening after I burst in from camp, sweating and dirty and confused as to who this man was, standing so close to my mother. Or maybe it was the mention of her name, Lena. I wonder how long it's been since he's heard it spoken out loud, a name so sweet it tastes like sap dripping down a piece of bark on the tongue. I try to take advantage of this momentary shift and keep talking. I am so sorry about what happened to your daughter, I say, taking a step back, putting some distance between us. Truly, I am. I think about her every day. He sighs, lowering the drill to his legs. He turns to the side, gazing at something outside through the blinds, a faraway look in his eyes. You ever think about what it feels like? He finally asks. I used to keep myself up at night, wondering, imagining, obsessing over it. All the time. I can't imagine what she went through. No, he says, shaking his head. I'm not talking about her, not Lena. I never wondered what it was like to lose my life. Honestly, if I did, I wouldn't care. He turns toward me now. His eyes have morphed back into two inky black voids, any trace of softness now gone completely. He's wearing that expression again, that same expression of flat, emotionless indifference. He almost looks inhuman, like an empty mask hanging against a pitch black wall. I'm talking about your father, he says. I'm talking about taking one. Chapter 25 I don't move until I hear the roar of the engine and the thud of his truck reversing over the curb and peeling out of my driveway. I stand completely still, listening to the sound of his retreating vehicle growing fainter in the distance, until finally I'm met with silence. You really think I don't know who you are, Chloe? His words had trapped me rendered me immobile the second he turned around and looked me in the eye. I was paralyzed the same way I was paralyzed as I watched my father slink through the backyard at night, shovel in hand. I knew I was witnessing something wrong, something terrible, something dangerous. I knew I should run, screaming. I knew I should sprint out the open door, flailing my arms. But just as my father's slow, lumbering steps had held me captive, Bert Rhodes's eyes had entranced me, bolted my feet to the floor. His voice had coiled around my body like a snake, refusing to let go. It was dense like salt water, trying to run from it, from him, felt like trying to run through the swamp, the mud heavy and thick and sticking to your ankles. The harder you try to push through, the more exhausted you feel, the weaker you become, the deeper you sink. I wait another minute until I'm sure he's gone and take a slow step forward, the weight of my heel forcing the wood beneath my feet to creak. I'm not talking about her, not Lena. I never wondered what it was like to lose my life. I take another step, slow, cautionary, as if he's lurking behind the still open front door, waiting to strike. I'm talking about your father. I'm talking about taking one. I take one last step to the front door and slam it shut, locking the deadbolt before pushing my back hard against the wood. I'm shaking violently as the room starts to get brighter. I'm fighting back that unearthly feeling that sweeps over your body after a shot of unexpected adrenaline wears off. Twitchy fingers, spotty vision, ragged breathing. 
I slide down the wall and sit on the floor, pushing my hands through my hair, trying not to cry. Eventually, I look up at the security panel installed on the wall above me, glowing bright. I stand up and set the code on the keypad before pushing enable, watching the little lock icon turn from red to green. I exhale, although I can't help but feel that it's pointless. For all I know, he didn't install it correctly. He skipped a few windows, set an override code. Daniel wanted to get a security system installed to help me feel safer. But right now, I've never felt more afraid. I need to go to the police with this. I can't put it off any longer. Bert Rhodes not only knows who I am, but he knows where I live. He knows I'm here alone. Maybe he knows that I'm on to him. As much as I don't want to thrust myself into another missing girl's investigation, that encounter was the extra evidence I had been looking for. Bert Rhodes's rambling, his anger over my life and how I turned out, his wondering what it felt like to take a life, was practically an admission of guilt and a threat of future violence all at once. I reach a shaky hand into my back pocket and yank out my phone, pulling up my previous calls and tapping on the number that appeared on my screen just this morning. The number that confirmed my biggest fear, that Lacey Deckler was dead. I listen to the ringing on the other end, bracing myself for the conversation I know we're about to have. The conversation I had been desperately hoping to avoid. It stops abruptly as a voice greets me on the other end. Detective Thomas. Hi, Detective. This is Chloe Davis. Dr. Davis, he says, sounding surprised. What can I do for you? Did you remember something else? Yes. I say, yes, I did. Could we meet as soon as possible? Of course. I hear shuffling on the other end like he's moving around papers. Can you come to the station? Yes, I say again. Yes, I can do that. I'll be there soon. I hang up, my mind swirling as I grab my keys and walk outside, double-checking that the door is locked behind me. I get in the car and crank the engine. He didn't have to give me directions. I already know where I'm going. I've been to the Baton Rouge Police Department before, although I hope that part of my past isn't dragged up too when I reveal to him who I am. It shouldn't be, but it could. And even if it is, there's nothing I can do about that but try to explain. I pull into the visitor's parking and kill the engine as I stare at the entrance looming before me. This building looks the same as it did ten years ago, only older, less maintained. The tan bricks are still tan, but the paint is cracking at the seams, large chips peeling off and landing in piles on the concrete. The landscaping is patchy and brown, the chain-link fence separating the station from the neighboring strip mall wobbly and bent. I step out of the car and slam the door behind me, pushing myself inside before I can change my mind. I walk to the front counter and stand behind the clear plastic divider, watching as the woman behind the desk taps her acrylic nails against a keyboard. Hi, I interrupt. I have an appointment with Detective Michael Thomas. She glances at me from behind the plastic and chews on the side of her cheek as if she's trying to decide if she believes me. My statement came out more like a question, undoubtedly because the certainty I felt back home about coming clean to the police all but evaporated the second I stepped inside. I can text him, I say, holding up my phone, trying to convince both her and myself that letting me in is a good idea. Tell him I'm here. She looks at me for another few seconds before picking up her phone and dialing an extension, propping it between her shoulder and chin while she continues typing. I hear the line ring before Detective Thomas's voice picks up. There's someone here to see you, she says. She looks at me, eyebrows raised. Chloe Davis. Uh, Chloe Davis, she repeats. Says she has an appointment. She hangs up the phone quickly and gestures to the door on my right, guarded by a metal detector and security personnel who looks agitated and tired. He said you can go in. Place all metal and electronics in the bin. Second door on the right. Inside the station, Detective Thomas's office door is cracked open. I peek my head through, knocking gently on the wood. Come in, he says, looking at me from above a desk cluttered with various papers, manila folders, and an open box of saltine crackers, half a sleeve sticking out and a trail of crumbs littered across the wood. He follows my gaze and ducks his head, shoving the sleeve back into the box and closing the flap. Sorry for the mess. It's fine, 
I say, walking inside and pushing the door shut behind me. I linger for a second before he points to the chair opposite him. I take a seat, my mind flashing back to earlier this week when the roles were reversed, when I was seated behind my desk in my office, gesturing for him to sit where I commanded. I exhale. So, he says, folding his hands on the table. What is it that you remembered? First, I have a question, I say. Aubrey Gravino, was she found wearing any jewelry? I don't really see how that's relevant. It is. I mean, depending on what the answer is, it could be. Why don't you tell me what you remember first, and then we can look into that? No, I shake my head. No, before I share this, I need to know for certain. I promise it matters. He looks at me for another few seconds, weighing his options. He sighs loudly, trying to convey his annoyance before shuffling through the folders on his desk. Then he grabs one, opens it, and flips through a few pages. No, she wasn't found with any jewelry, he says. One earring was found near the body in the cemetery, sterling silver with a pearl and three diamonds. He looks up at me, his eyebrows raised as if to question, are you happy now? So, no necklace? His eyes linger on mine for another few seconds before looking back down. No, no necklace, just the earring. I exhale, pushing my hands into my hair. He's looking at me carefully again, waiting for me to say something, to do something. I lean back into my chair and spit it out. That earring was part of a set, I say. There's a matching necklace she would have been wearing at the time of her abduction. She wears them together in all of her pictures. On the missing poster, her yearbook photos, tagged pictures on Facebook. If she was wearing the earrings, she was also wearing the necklace. He lowers the folder to his desk. How do you know this? I checked, I say. Before I came to you with this, I wanted to be sure. Okay, and why do you think this matters? Because Lacey was wearing a piece of jewelry too, remember? That's right, he says. You mentioned a bracelet. A beaded bracelet with a metal cross. I saw it on her wrist in my office. She wore it to cover her scar. But when I looked at her body this morning, it wasn't there. The room is uncomfortably quiet. Detective Thomas continues to stare, and I can't tell if he's actually considering what I'm telling him, or if he